Good morning, colleagues. Can we all stand up to observe a moment of silent prayer and meditation? Thank you. We may all be seated. Uh, good morning, colleagues. May I take this opportunity to welcome our Honorable Premier, members of the Executive Council, leaders of political parties, Chief Whip, MPLs, the people of Gauteng. We are all welcome this morning. <clears throat> a sad day for the people of Africa since we received the, un the death of our icon, our leader, our father, a leader who actually assisted us to actually ac acquire our democracy also in South Africa, Dr. K.K. Kaunda. In that regard, I will request that you all stand up and observe a moment of silence in his honor. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you, honorable members. Oh, and Zambia. Thank you, colleagues. We have received uh, the following apologies. Honorable Baden host who can join the meeting today. Honorable Miss, we know that we read the motion on, on was it yesterday? Uh, because she, she is still on leave. Honorable Shabalala, who's also still on paternity leave. Thank you very much. These are the only apologies that I have. <clears throat> Honorable uh, colleagues, with the announcement uh, of the passing on of our father, Dr. K.K. Kaunda, the Honorable President of the Republic of South Africa, has requested that all our flags must uh, fly high mast for a period of 20 days as we mourn the passing of this honorable icon. And as a result, the Gauteng legislature will also um, uh, do so starting this morning. I wish to check, is there a member who wants to place an announcement? No announcements from other members. Thank you. Let me call upon our Honorable Chief Whip to present a motion without notice in terms of Rule 120. Chief Whip. Good morning, uh, Madam Speaker and Honorable Members. I, Member M. Kumar, Lord Chief Whip, here by tables the following motion in terms of Rule 121 read together with Rule 117 as follows, noting that the Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee Focus Intervention Study a report on reindustrialization, transformation and modernization of the housing economy, the Tswane Automotive Special Economic Zone as an instrument for growth and development, and the Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee Focus Intervention Study Report on Alternative Energy Source for Long-Term Energy Security and Envisage Benefit to Poor Communities in the Houghton Province were not programmed for the House sitting of the 18th June 2021. Uh, therefore, request that the House resolve to add Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture, 
and Rural Development Portfolio Committee Focus Intervention Study Report on Reindustrialization, Transformation and Modernization of the Houghton Economy, the Twani Economic Special Economic Zone as an Instrument for Growth and Development, and the Economic Development Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee's Focus Intervention Study Report on Alternative Energy Source for Long-Term Energy Security and Envisage Benefit to Poor Communities in the Houghton province to the orders of the sittings of the 18 June 2021. I so move, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Chief Whip. Any seconder? I second. Honorable Moretti seconding. I now, I now put a, a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 All yes. those not in favor say no. The yes have it. The motion is adopted uh, by the House. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, we have not received uh, member statements uh, from MECs. However, we have received uh, MEC, we have received statements from honourable members uh, in terms of Rule 81, Subsection 1, starting with honourable pitch. And colleagues, I will request that those members that are speaking, please switch on your mic, uh, your, your video. But when we are not speaking, but, uh, switch off your mic as well as your video. Switch off your mic and your video. Honorable Peach. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is with shock and disbelief that the DA has become aware of the complete lack of any form of public consultation from either civil society, industry, or expert inputs when considering the drafting of the proposed amendments within the Firearms Control Amendment Bill of 2021. This is indicative of a government that is hell-bent on destroying personal liberties and the freedoms of the individual, who have the right to protection and safety as guaranteed in our Constitution. This draft legislation has been proposed by an uncaring government who spends billions on themselves in the form of armed VIP protection. The DA will oppose the ANC government's proposed legislation, and we have taken heed of over 300,000 submissions by law-abiding citizens and organizations condemning this short-sighted law. Public participation is not for show. It's not just a rubber stamping exercise or for lip service. It must be endorsed or it will be continuously challenged. The DA's vision of an open opportunity society for all is one that places the individual's best interests at the center of legislative drafting, unlike this ANC who wish to rule by command and control. In light of this, on Tuesday, the 22nd of June, 2021, the DA will host South Africa's largest virtual firearms summit on all social media platforms to discuss and to take heed of public uh, consultation in regards to the Firearms Control Amendment Act. The inane fetiches of this government will not come to pass while the DA stands up for the rights of their people. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You, you're crying for an firearm. You want to kill people. Honorable Nisaka. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Many Gauteng children have been denied foster care and SASA foster care grants because social workers simply do not have the know-how to prepare for court and to represent them in court. That is the biggest reason cited by the judiciary for why we have a backlog of children awaiting foster care. Last term, I suggested that Gauteng adopt the Western Cape model, which was to partner with the tertiary institution and ensure that social workers after completing their social work qualification be given the option to specialize in this field of foster care and court appearance. I was told in a committee meeting at the time that the department was busy with a partnership with WITS. Clearly, this was not true as nothing has happened since then. Last week, the Portfolio Committee of Social Development had a webinar 
on foster care. And what transpired is that the paperwork which social workers need to fill in is in most cases not compliant, leading the magistrates to simply reject it. Rejection means that the child is denied a loving foster home and the financial support for a, foster, a SASA foster care grant. Speaker, as the DA, we have shown that we love our vulnerable children. We capacitate social workers who are tasked with the precious job of ensuring that children move out of the system and into loving homes with financial assistance. After all, the, uh, the children are the future of this country, and we are in June 16th looking after the youth. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Khatebe. Uh, good morning, Speaker. Good morning, our colleagues. Leba Ahika Ufela, Bahauteng as a whole. A nation greatness is measured not by how it treats its most uh, respected members, but how it treats its own most vulnerable. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the EFF to bring to the attention of this house the inhuman state and total neglect of the Ekuruleni School for the Deaf in Katleho, whose learners have embarked on a protest disrupting learning and teaching as their cries to the district have fallen on deaf ears. The EFF has been to Ekuruleni School for the Deaf and we were horrified at the <clears throat> state of the school. There is a general lack of hygiene and dilapidated state of the school, especially during this time when the country is faced with COVID-19 pandemic. We rise to call to the department to intervene on the allegations made by the parents who accuse the principal of being insensitive to deaf learners and unable to communicate in sign language to the learners and generally ill treats the very vulnerable learners meant for his, his case. What is most concerning to us is the allegation abuse to the learners by the principal. The allegations that the principal husband security company is contracted to the school and learners are not care as they should. We shall own the department to investigate how principal that can not communicate in sign language was appointed to a school for the deaf, including the allegation made by the parent for financial inappropriate against the principal, whose husband company is alleged to be contracted for the security in the school. The EFF stand with the community and the parents in their demand for a full investigation in the financial of the school. The ill treatment of the learner by the principal and the security contract. What kind of a society have we become that treats the deaf minor to the point of pushing them to protest? We should be ashamed. I thank you, Speak. Honorable Kekana. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and good morning to yourself, uh, the Premier, members of the Executive, and all the members and the people of Houting. Uh, member, uh, Madam Speaker, in accordance with Rule 81, Subsection 1, I, Honorable Rufilo Kekana, hereby tables the following member statement on the passing of the former Zambian President. Madam Speaker, the stalwart of the African Liberation Movement, Dr. Kenneth David Kaunda, fondly known as KK, departed from this world yesterday. Kaunda was at the forefront of the struggle for independence from British colonial rule and was the founding president of independent Zambia. Not only was he a liberation hero to Zambia, but to Africa as a whole. He also played a significant role in the fight against HIV and AIDS, dedicating his time as an activist against the scourge. Our hearts are with his family and the people of the Republic of Zambia during this difficult time of mourning. He will be remembered as the man who loved peace 
and dedicated his life to peaceful African liberation. As the ANC, we are deeply saddened by his passing. The history of the ANC can never be told without telling the story of Zambia's contribution to our liberation. Zambia became a second home to the ANC when Kaunda opened the country to be ANC headquarters for over 30 years, Madam Speaker. Dr. Kaunda stood up against white minority rule and supported the anti-apartheid movement unashamedly because he understood the ideology of a united Africa. One of the uh, of growing how uh, how came together the GDT 2030 prioritizes priorities is building a better Africa and the world. We commit ourselves to continuing to implement the ideals of Kaunda and that his dedication to Africans will live on through our work. I'm sure that I'm joined by the people of South Africa in taking this opportunity to pass our heartfelt condolences to the family of Kaunda and the people of Zambia at large. May his revolutionary soul rest in eternal peace. I thank you. Thank you, honorable members. That concludes um, member statements in terms of rule 81 subsection one. I just want to check, is there a member who wants to give a notice of motion in terms of rule 121? There is none. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, can we therefore go to the first item? Starting with uh, the first order, can I request the secretary to read the first order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Dev Development Portfolio Committee's Oversight Report on the fourth quarterly performance report of the Department of Economic Development, including entities for the 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Lasindwa. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Good morning to all the members of the executive, members of the legislature and people of Gauteng. I, Lindy Wella Sindwa, on behalf of the Portfolio Committee of Economic Development and Rural Environment, present the fourth quarter performance of the department. Honorable Speaker, may I request that parts of the report that I'm not going to read be taken as read. On the achievement in terms of the APP by the department, Honorable Speaker, the department attained three of the pl nine planned targets. The committee is concerned that the targets within the department remain low, noting that agencies are reporting independently and entities have indicated that many, many of their targets are demand driven and have been removed from the APP and relegated to operational plans. On oversight agencies, the committee noted that the fourth quarter performance of the department agency and its subsidies is unsatisfactory. As 70 out of 90 planned targets were attained, and that translates to 73% achievement. Looking into performance of individual agencies, the, the, the JEP as an entity attained 11 out of 16 planned targets. This was followed by another poor performing entity, which is GGDA, attaining 12 out of 18 planned targets, amounting to 66% performance. On Corn Hill, it attained all its targets, constituting 100% performance. The Innovation Hub failed to attain all its planned targets, unlike the previous quarter, only managed to realize five out of its seven targets, which resulted into 71%. Honorable Speaker, the GTA continued to attain all planned targets, which is 100%. The committee is of the view that agencies should plan, agencies should play a crucial role in creating the necessary job, noting the increase in the number of unemployment in the province, in particular in the backlog of COVID-19 heavy lockdown. The committee will continue to monitor the implementation of projects and programs that are aimed at creating sustainable jobs and further evaluate the impact of the, of the lives of people in Gauteng. 
on the projects, the department have outlined above project as submitted in their report, Honorable Speaker. Here we are limited by the template that is provided to us. We can uh, put all the information that is given to us. The committee noted that the budget amount of 1.9 million in total, an amount of 7.6 was allocated for the quarter under review, which translates to 96 expenditure under the quarter under review. In the quarter under review, the committee did not analyze any resolution as per the department and its entities did not submit any resolution. In the quarter under review, Honorable Speaker, there were no petitions which were submitted to the committee. In relation to stakeholder engagement, the department engaged its stakeholders through various platforms as part of extending service delivery to the public in, form, in a form of liqua education and awareness activities across the province. Individual walk in into the department's building and media-based education awareness activities. On GOD, Honorable Speaker, the department reported that they had a project which they have partnered with Sang Sang on the creation of job opportunities for the township youth entrepreneurs. 18 youth in Egorulene have been enrolled in this project for three months, which is a boot camp, and they are receiving a stipend. With people with disability, Honorable Speaker, under this quota, nothing was done by the department. For city, senior citizens, nothing was done by the department under this quota. The committee has always been of the view that the department's vacancy should be filled in order to ensure that service delivery imperatives are attained. This should then mean that the department is not adequately capacitated to ensure that the service delivery is implemented. Honorable Speaker, let me move to Committee findings and committee recommendations. On committee concerns, Honorable Speaker. The committee has found that GLB is shifting goalposts in implementing in implementation of resolution adopted by the by the House in ensuring that GLB automation system is functional, that previous committee recommendations are not adhered to. With respect to the Houghton Growth Development Agency, the committee has found that there is delays in implementation of the Corn Hill Visitors Center project due to lack of accountability and project management. With respect to Houghton Enterprise, committee is concerned with the formation, with the formation of Houghton SMME fund in partnership with the previous private sector through the utilization of the 250 million allocated to the entity for the COVID-19 relief fund. On committee rec recommendation, Honorable Speaker, a committee recommends that the department should ensure that GLP adheres to previous committee recommendations and ensure that the automation system is fully operational by the end of second quarter for the 2021-22 financial year. Expectation by the committee is that there will be no longer any shifting of goalposts on this matter. A progress report in this should be submitted to the committee by the 31st of August. On GGDA, GGDA should ensure that all delays related to the Corn Hill Visitors Center project are averted going forward by developing and implementing a tangible project management plan, plan for this project. The project management plan should also outline any other outstanding issues hindering the site being handed over to the contractor for the construction to ensue by the end of the second quarter for the financial year. On JEP, JEP should report all processes related to the establishment of Gauteng 
SMME Partnership Fund. The report should be submitted and tabled before the committee for guidance and accountability purposes, as well as ensuring that funds are dis disembursed according to in all terms of, in terms of, in terms of in terms of rule in terms of the rule honorable speaker i hereby present the report for adoption by the house in this seconder to the recommendation member adams i second sir. honorable speaker Seconded, Honorable Adams. Thank you very much. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those not in favor say no. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can you get the next order? I simply tell them to why it's difficult. Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee's Oversight Report on the fourth quarter report of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development for the 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Lassindwa. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, may I request that parts of the report that I'm not going to read be regarded as read. On the executive summary, the committee notes with concerns that the financial performance of the department during the quarter under review paints a rather concerning picture with expenditure for one of the programs at the forefront of service delivery, which is agriculture and rural development, is below the levels required at this time of budget cycle. This as agriculture was deemed an essential service by the national government in the year 2021 financial year. The department spent 282 million of the quota appropriation, which is equivalent to 87.52% of the budget. For the quota the, on the administration program, the department spent 56 million, which is 100%. For agriculture, the department spent 47 million, which represents 66%. For environment affairs program, the department spent 132, which amounts to 105 million. The year-to-year -year effect of the budget utilization for all three programs means that it's, it is both administrative and environmental affairs that are at levels consumable, which with this time in the budget cycle. Whereas the agriculture and rural development program retain concerning expenditure levels of 88.9% of the year to date usage. The under expenditure translates to just over 40 million that remains unused and will have to be returned to the provincial treasury by the department. The committee noted with concerns that the department did not achieve the target on township spent and acknowledges the weaknesses in supporting the targeted business owned by this target group in the province. It is reported that measures will be put in place to pursue a more target and a deliberate approach towards business owned by designated group. The committee has continuously observed the lack of project management from the department in the previous year. The department has lacked in completing infrastructure capacity funded projects and spending in goods and services due to tender processes that are being implemented through the open tender system. The committee conducted an oversight on some of the outstanding projects and will continue to monitor as some of the some of them to date have not been uh, completed. Honorable Speaker, may I move to committee concerns and committee recommendations? The committee is concerned with respect to irregular expenditure. The committee is concerned with the ability by the department to implement recommendations by the Auditor General on irregular expenditure. Number two, the committee is concerned with respect to consequence management that is not implemented by the department. Number three, with respect to program three's performance, especially program two and three, the committee is concerned with the failure to align its budget with the planned targets under the expenditure is con continuously observed in agriculture and rural development environment affairs. Number four, with respect to project management, the committee is concerned with the lack of completing capital funded project and spending in goods and services due to tender processes that are being implemented through open tender system. On recommendation, Honorable Speaker, 
The committee recommends that the department should submit the responses to the committee by the 30th of September. Provide the committee with a detailed report on how irregular expenditure and non-compliance will be prevented, including measures in place. Provide the committee with a comprehensive report on consequential management for targets not met. Department should provide and the department to promote monitoring and evaluation on a quarterly basis, and this report should be submitted to the committee. The department should provide a feedback report or plan on how DBSA will be implementing the capital project and the completion date of this project. On acknowledgement, or an honorable speaker, the Portfolio Committee on Economic Development wishes to thank the MEC of Economic Development, Mr. Park Stau, the head of the department, Ms. Casella, head team of officials, the chairperson, Honorable Lacindo Feather, wishes to acknowledge his and express his hair gratitude to honorable members of the committee. That is member, member Hassan, member Makubela, member Mube, member Ghana, member Silias, member Chitangano, member Ufuman, member Adams. Further appreciation goes to alternative members of the committee, namely member Alberts, member Duplicis, member Bed and Host. It is an honor to lead such a hardworking team. Furthermore, the Portfolio Committee would like to express appreciation for the contribution of the following support staff. Mr. T Mr. Mudibe, Mr. Mabuza, Ms. Makubela, Dr. Malapane, Mr. Skosana, Ms. Mampe, Ms. Mkadi, Ms. Makubela, Mr. Baloi, Ms. Azwidini, Mr. Takalani, Usisi Wendlapo, and Mr. Lomo. After due consideration, the Economic Development, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee adopted the oversight report on the fourth quarter performance of the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development and Environment for the year 2020-2021 financial year. In terms of Rule 117, subsection 2C, read together with 164, the Economic Development, Agriculture, Rural Development Portfolio Committee presents the oversight report on the fourth quarter performance of the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development for the financial year and recommends its adoption by the House. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Konda, to the report. I second, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Mube seconding, I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those not yes. in favor say no. Yes. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Infrastructure Development Portfolio Committee's oversight report on the fourth quarterly performance report of the Department of Infrastructure Development for the 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Mudise. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, a request is made that parts of the report that are not going to be read be considered as read, and therefore will only concentrate on the following. In production, this report has been developed in accordance with the sector oversight model, the GPL committee's oversight and accountability framework as part of the GPL project and the standardization of oversight, accountability and reporting in the Gauteng. It, is further, it further outlines the macro assessment, which looks at the overall performance of the department, and the micro assessment, which focuses on program by program performance. This is done to determine if there's a balance between the department's input, output, and outcomes. The committee's approach this focused on whether the department plan outputs have been achieved and whether the allocated funds have been effectively and efficiently utilized to ensure value for money. This assessment forms part of the oversight work that is continuously carried out by the committee to evaluate the implementation of programs against sets target and expenditure for the period under review. Madam Speaker, although progress was acknowledged by the committee, the slow progress of issuing occupational certificates of the North Hesech Primary and Noctula Ellison schools was noted with concerns by the committee. In this regard, the committee will continue to engage the department on the matter. The department was invited by the committee during this period to present on the progress reports on the following. Devon Early Childhood Development Center, Restival 
Secondary School, Restival Library, Acacia Library, Progress and Payments to Service Providers at Fine Town Clinic, Kekani Start Clinic, Maibuye Clinic, Nordhesek Primary and Noctula Ellison Schools Occupational Certificates. Seboken DLTC Project, Bantu Bonke Early Childhood Development Center, Progress and Payments to Service Providers, and the COVID-19 projects. The committee findings and concerns are as follows. With regards to program one, the committee is concerned that the budget was spent at 100% and yet 70% of the targets were achieved. With respect to program one, also the committee is concerned that targets related to procurement channeled towards military veterans association companies were not achieved. With regards to program one, the committee is concerned that targets related to payment of invoices were not achieved. On program one, the, pro the committee is also concerned that targets related to township enterprise revitalization were not achieved. With respect to program two, the committee is concerned that there is a slow progress in Kopanung, uh, Kopanung Hospital. With, uh, with regards to program two, the committee is also concerned that there is a slow progress in the corner house project. And with program three, the committee is concerned that the targets related to EPWP were not achieved. Committee recommendation. Based on the information set out here above, as well as committee concerns, the committee therefore recommends as follows. That one, the, the committee recommends that the department to instigate thorough measures in ensuring the alignment between the output and the input. And therefore the written response must reach the committee by the 30th of July, 2021. The committee also recommends that the department to submit a progress report specifying measures put in place in ensuring that targets related to procurement channeled towards military veterans companies are achieved. This report must be written and must reach the committee by the 30th of July, 2021. The committee also re uh, recommends that the departments must implement adequate process in ensuring that payments of invoices target is achieved. This also must reach the committee by the 30th of July, 2021, in the form of written response. The committee must recommends that the department must to ensure that targets related to spending on the township enterprise revitalization are achieved. The response is must be written and must reach the committee by the 30th of July, 2021. The committee also further re recommend that the department to provide a progress report on intervention in ensuring that there's a progress in Kopanum project with the budget being clearly specified. This also has to be written and must reach the committee by the 30th of July, 2021. And the department to add more efforts in ensuring that the corner house targets are met. The, report, the response must be in writing and must reach the committee by the 30th of July. The last one, the department to submit a progress report in ensuring that expanded public works program targets are achieved. It must, the report must be in writing and it must reach the committee by the 30th of July, 2021. In acknowledgements, the chairperson of Portfolio Committee of Infrastructure Development and Property Management would like to thank MEC Motara, the head of the department and the entire department executives for their efforts in consideration of this report. The chairperson further appreciate the diligent deliberation of all honorable members who are part of the committee the committee chairperson also like to thank all committee staff for their dedication and assistance. In adoption, in, in terms of Rule 1172C, read together with Rule 164, the Portfolio Committee on Infrastructure Development and Property Management presents before the House the oversight report on the Department of Infrastructure Development fourth quarter report for the 2020-2021 financial year for consideration and adoption. I thank you, Speaker. Any seconder to the report? Chair, yeah, I rise to second. Seconded. Uh, okay, Honorable Fuchs. Uh, I now put your question. All those in favor say yes. 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 All yes. those yes. in favor yes. say no. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Roads and Transport for Portfolio Committee's Oversight Report on the fourth quarterly performance report of the Department of Roads and Transport, including entities for the 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Shiman. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I would want to start by requesting that the parts of the report that are not read are, are taken as read. 
In the quarter under review, the department managed to spend 25% uh, of its budget across all programs, whilst the G Fleet spent 22%. In terms of the expenditure per program, the Gaar train managed to spend 32%, whilst the four programs in roads and transport, namely administration, spent 27%, transport infrastructure, spent 20%, transport operations, spent 23%, and transport regulations spent 24%. As at the end of the quarter, the department underspent its uh, budget by 14%, whilst G Fleet underspent by 4%. The committee further noted that the budget allocation for G Fleet management was re revised down from 789 million to 653 million in the quarter under review. In terms of oversight on the annual performance uh, targets, of the 20 annual performance plan targets applicable for the period under review, the department achieved 10 targets, which equate to 50% achievement as at the end of the quarter. The committee noted that the Car Train Management Agency achieved 23 of its 26 planned targets, which equate to 88%, whilst the G Fleet managed to, to achieve 8 out of 13 planned targets, which equate to 62%. As in the previous quarter, the main areas of non-achievement non of targets was in relation to delays in the implementation and cancellation of advertised tenders for infrastructure projects. Whilst in the G Fleet, it was due to delays in the repairing of vehicles due to migration to the new, RT, to the new RT46 service provider, provider whilst in GMA, which is the Car Train Management Agency, it was due to lower train and bus passengers due to COVID-19 impact, which gave rise to the patronage guarantee costs to the province. I turn now to the various programs uh, of the department. Firstly, program one in terms of administration, the committee is concerned that the department is continuously failing to meet set targets for persons with disabilities and this has been the case in previous quarters of the current financial year, as well as in previous financial years. In terms of transport infrastructure, program two, um, the committee is concerned that the program has continued to experience a number of challenges within the implementation of planned infrastructure mm -hmm. projects under the construction and maintenance sub programs. Mm -hmm. the committee urges the department to fully capacitate the newly established Transport Infrastructure House for monitoring and implementation of all planned infrastructure projects within the department and its entities to curb the delays in infrastructure projects. In terms of transport operations, program three, the committee is still concerned over the continuous failure of the department uh, in, in terms of the advertising of, of bus contracts um, and the impact that it's having on commuters. Although I must say that uh, uh, subsequent to us dealing with this particular quarter, uh, we have been informed of progress that is taking place in terms of the time frame in which the bus contracts should be advertised. In terms of transport regulation, um, no, let me move on. In terms of the car train management agency, the committee noted that the ent entity was able to meet most of its planned targets but continued to underachieve on its target on the average number of quarterly rail and bus passengers. And this resulted in the need for additional funding for the agency to cater for the increased patronage guarantee costs. The committee is concerned over the continuous rise in the patronage guarantee costs and will encourage the agency to implement, me to implement measures that have been proposed and adopted to ensure that the costs are reduced over the MTF period. In terms of the G Fleet management, the committee noted that the entity was able to meet most of its planned targets, including debt collection, and this was attributed to an aggressive implementation of the debtors management policy, which yielded positive results in a decrease in debtors, and also reported that the Gauteng Department of Health settled an outstanding debt from the previous financial year. Furthermore, the committee noted that the ICT strategy has been developed and approved, but not yet implemented as planned in the quarter under review. The committee is concerned over the delays in implementation as the strategy has been delayed since the beginning of the financial year. I turn now to recommendations. Uh, the department 
The recommendations are as follows, and all of these recommendations should be responded to by the 30th of July. That the department and the Kautrain Management Agency should provide the committee with a detailed report on the implementation of intervention measures in place to achieve planned targets for persons with disabilities in line with the new supply chain management policy. That the department should provide the committee with a detailed report on the revised plans, intervention plans and budget for the implementation of delayed infrastructure projects on roads, construction and maintenance. That the department should provide the committee with a detailed report on the advertisement and appointment of the three subsidized bus contracts, as well as the six contracts that were planned to be operationalized in the quarter under review. That the car train management agency should provide the committee with a detailed report on the progress made on the implementation of measures in place to reduce the patronage guarantee costs in the next financial year and in the MTF period going forward. That the G Fleet Management should provide the committee with a detailed report on the implementation plan of the ICT strategy and progress thereof. Uh, as I conclude, appreciation is expressed to all members of the committee for their commitment to the oversight process, as well as to MEC Mamabolo, the HOD and officials from the department for their cooperation during the quarterly report process. Uh, we also extend our appreciation to the members of the committee support team for their work and their effort during this particular process. In terms of Rule 1172C, read together with Rule 164, the committee presents to this House and recommends the adoption of the committee's oversight report on the Gauteng, Gauteng, on the Gauteng, Gauteng Department of Roads and Transport, Gauteng Management Agency and G Fleet Management Fourth Quarterly Performance Report for 2020. Stroke 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable um, Chair. Uh, any second to the report? <coughs> I see Honorable Kagana. Your hand is up. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to second the report. Thank you. Seconded. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 Favor yes. say no. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Consideration of the Economic Development, Agriculture and Rural Develop Development Portfolio Committee's oversight report on the detail of the Department of Economic Development <laughs> budget vote of the Provincial Appropriation Bill G001. 2021 for the 2021-2022 financial year. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Lacindua. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. May I request that parts of the report that I'm not going to be to read be taken as read. I'm going to start on executive summary. 2020-20 financial year. A department 2020-2021 budget report is tabled in the third calendar year of the sixth administration. And the budget allocated for the Department of Economic Development herein is transferred to as to the department. In the current financial year, the department is allocated an amount of 1.5 billion for the 2022 financial year. The allocation compromises of mainly the equitable share with no conditional grant. In the current year, the committee noted that the allocation has decreased by an amount of 277 million, which amounts to 15.11%. This is a significant decrease from the previous financial year, where in 2020-2021 financial year was a great increase in the budget allocation. The budget is aimed at supporting the goals set in the National Development Plan, wherein job creation is deemed as a key achievement for this term of government. The committee noted that, similar to the previous financial year, the Houghton Growth Development Agency is allocated the largest share transfer with an amount of 632 million 
and followed by the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller with an amount of 219 million. Gauteng Tourism is allocated an amount of 126 million. And in the current financial year, the Gauteng Gambling Board was not allocated any funds, unlike in the previous year, wherein an entity was transferred an amount of 26.4 million for the ones off budget for the automation system project. The trade and sector development program is allocated a greater share for the budget with an amount of 811 million. The second largest share for the appropriation is allocated to administration program for 271 million. The committee entrusts that the department through its budget will be enabled to further the economic growth, skills development, job creation, and investment promotion in the Gauteng are amongst key initiatives that the department should attain in addressing the triple challenge of unemployment, poverty, and equality. The department will only be able to attain this through the alignment of its plan to radical trans transformation, modernization, and reindustrialization re program, which aims to contribute to the township economic a revitalization. As such, SMMEs and cooperatives should be at the forefront of creating decent jobs for the youth, women, and people with disability in the province. The finalization of the configuration process of Houten Enterprise Propeller should be expedited to allow the entity to support emerging entrepreneurs, particularly the youth and the marginalized in the province, with financial and non-financial support. In addition to this, the committee will continue to oversee the disembursement of the 250 million, which was allocated for COVID relief fund for the deserving businesses. <laughs> Linked to this, urgent attention that the departments need to give on the lack of commitment by the city of Tswane on the releasing of the funds for the further development of Tswane Automotive Special Economic Zone. Honorable Speaker, I'm going to move to the committee concerns. On the committee concerns, Honorable Speaker, As per the committee resolution from the previous financial year, focusing on job creation initiatives for the current financial year through the department and its entities, based on the allocated budget, the department did not report on the number of jobs it intends to be facilitating in the current financial year. A report in this is required by the committee. On program one, the committee is in is concerned on the increase on the allocation within the sub-program of the MEC's office, the inability by the department to complete and finalize its organizational structure since 2016-2017 financial year. On program two, the committee is concerned with the non-disbursement of the 250 million for the relief fund on the COVID-19. The expected period is, is the extended period it has taken for the SMMEs fund to, act, to be active, despite the commitment made by the entity that the fund will be operational by the third quarter of the current financial year. Number four, the lack of a detail plan on the finalization of reconfiguration process of Houteng Enterprise Propeller in the current financial year. On program three, honorable speaker, lack of clear defined strategies on, on, on the refurbishment of industrial hubs, the lack of recovery plan related to tourism as this one, as one of the sector is the crucial to employment for the province, in particular for the young women and people with disability in the province. On recommendation, honorable speaker, all responses to the recommendation 
should be submitted to the committee by the 31st of August. On program one, the committee recommends that the department should redirect the unutilized funds allocated to the sub-program on the office of the MEC during the adjustment period. These funds should be redirected to service delivery imperatives. A report on this funds that will be allocated to this initiative should be submitted to the committee. Number two, finalize the organizational structure by the end of second quarter. As committed by the department, failure to attain to keep to this commitment, the committee will require the MEC to act against the responsible officials. On program two, ensure that by the end of August 2021, a sign, sign an MOU with private partner and other relevant state entities in order to start disembarking the 250 50 million relief fund. In addition to this, for an accountability purposes, the department should give a comprehensive account on the number of SMMEs that will be supported, including regions, gender from which sectors they, of, of the economy they come from. Furthermore, the department should ensure that funds which will be disembursed should include SMMEs owned by women, youth, and people with disability. On number four, as previously recommended by the committee, department should submit a detailed plan on finalization of the reconfiguration of JEP. The plan should detail the management process until finalization. This should be submitted to the committee by end of August. 4.1, in every reporting quarter, the department should submit progress on the reconfiguration process and oversight scrutiny. On program three, provide the committee with a rollout plan strategy to refurbish, operationalize the industrial hubs in Gauteng. Submit before the committee a recovery plan related to tourism, noting that the impact of COVID-19 is this one of the sectors that was heavily impacted by the pandemic. Tourism is a crucial employment creation for the people of Gauteng. On acknowledgement, honorable speaker, appreciation is expressed to all members of the committee for their commitment for the oversight process, as well as the MEC, Park Stau, and officials from the department. I commend them for their diligent and commitment shown, shown during the deliberation of the budget vote three for the Gauteng Department of Economic Development for the year 2021-22. Gratitude goes to honorable members, member Makubela, member Hassan, member Mnube, member Ghana, member Silias, member Mukwebo, member Aldam, Adams, member Alberts. Further appreciations goes to members of the committee, alternative members of the committee, member Engelbrecht and member Tong. It is an honor to lead such a hardworking team. On behalf of the committee, appreciation, appreciation and gratitude goes to the following in persons. Of, in, terms of, in terms of role, after consideration of the committee, the committee adopted the, the, the committee oversight report in terms of Rule 117, subsection 2, subsection C, right together with Rule 164. The committee presents this to this house and recommends for the adoption of the committee oversight report for economic development budget vote three for the year 2021-2022 financial year. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Any second to the report? I second the uh, speaker. I second the uh, speaker. Dr. Adams, Honorable Adams, seconding. Thank you very much. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those not in favor say no. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Budget speech and debate on the detail of the Department of Economic Development Budget Vote 3 of the Gauteng Provincial Appropriation Bill, G001 2021, for the 2021 and 2022 financial year. Thank you, Sophia. Honorable Tau. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Premier of the Province of Gauteng, Chairperson and members of the Portfolio Committee for Economic Development fellow members of the House, members of the media, and the citizens and communities of our province. It is my singular honor to present the, this 2021-2022 budget vote on Youth Month and in a year dedicated to honor the living memory of the mother of black freedom, 
measure lot money matreke. Under the rallying theme of growing youth employment for an inclusive and transformed society. This budget vote is presented in perhaps the most difficult period for democratic South Africa, mainly due to the cumulative effects of COVID-19 as a global health and economic emergency. In fact, COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated the structural deficiencies of our economy reflected in South Africa's record high inequality, poverty, and unemployment. The impact of COVID-19 is, is even more dire in townships and rural areas. The SMME sector has suffered worst in our townships since research in Gauteng alone shows that 42% of SMMEs are likely to have closed their doors permanently. Nevertheless, the Gauteng Department of Economic Development, or GDD, has not resi resigned itself to this Jeremiah status quo. Honorable Speaker, we are turning the corner to ensure we implement pragmatic policies and actionable programs in townships and rural areas to become more diverse commercial and industrial zones where high growth sectors are widely represented and financial instruments are made available to open capital markets to township businesses. The DED is turning the corner to facilitate the creation of opportunities for young people to become employable and self-employed through new businesses that will grow as we combine an aggressive focus on high growth sectors with a disciplined enabling of township industrialization. There is hope in action in the implementation of the Growing Houten Together 2030 strategy, which encourages, amongst others, smart collaboration and partnerships between government, business, and social partners. There is hope in action in the GDD and its agencies leading on the APEX economic initiatives that underpin the GGT 2030. Fellow compatriots, allow me to explain how we are leveraging public resources allocated under this budget vote to bring to life the GGT 2030 across the Gauteng city region. Over the past few months, we've taken decisive steps to build the capacity of the GTT family by, for example, reconfiguring the GEP into a fit-for-purpose vehicle for blended financing, enterprise, and supplier development. We opened recruitment for all the senior management positions and are now shortlisting suitable candidates to assist as we turn GTT into an institution worthy of its task. At the same time, we are working closely with organized labor to solve internal challenges and institutionalize the best possible labor practices at all levels of the organization. But the enhancement of internal human capital is only the beginning. Through public-private partnerships, we are focusing on special programs for our high growth sectors. We are setting up a war room, for instance, with the Development Bank of Southern Africa to drive the GT 2030 APEX initiatives. This war room will focus for the current financial year on running the special programs covering, for example, the green economy, ICT and broadband connectivity, transportation, and logistics. For this financial year, the allocation to the department amounts to 1.5 billion rand and decreases to 1.4 billion rand over the medium term expenditure framework. In simple terms, this means we have to do more with less. This implies spending our resources efficiently in order to aggregate our collective efforts and to leverage from existing policy instruments and tools. We need to work with the private sector to build strong partnerships that move Houghton forward. While the department and its agencies remain poised to contribute to the realization of the strategy as championed by the Premier and President respectively, I hope I have made it clear that this allocation is best seen as GPG's contribution to a network of institutional and private sector partners partnerships that span across our region. Honorable Speaker, 
reindustrializing Gauteng in the 21st century is taking shape through the build phase of the Tswane Automotive Special Economic Zone, which at the first stage of now, which is at the first stage of, of a now confirmed 15.18 billion rand investment by the Ford Motor Company. This is matched by 3.7 billion rand allocated through public sector investment and to create a supplier park that will produce at least 200,000 cars by year 2022, the bulk of which is intended for the export market. As part of this SEZ, several work packages for SMMEs are processed and assigned to benefit local businesses. The project has set new, a new high watermark for community level contracting with 47% or 1.7 billion rand committed as contracting prioritized for companies at CITP levels one to seven from the area of Mamilodi and surrounds. Moreover, it is encouraging that 531 million in SMME packages will be allocated in the coming months as part of the build program to construct the first set of critical factories. The GEP has also partnered with, partnered with the AIDC to provide support, business development support to 30 automotive, automotive small enterprises in the AIDC supplier development program. This builds on AIDC's experience incubating companies in the value chain of the new Nissan Navara and a new partnership between Nissan Japan, Nissan SA, and the South African government, spearheaded by GPG. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the President of the Republic has announced the rollout of the Gauteng Eastern Cape High Capacity Freight Rail Corridor. It will be fully operational by 2025 in partnership with Transnet, the DTIC, and the Eastern Cape Provincial Government and also with the presidency. This freight rail corridor will upgrade the whole South Core line to enable movement of much higher volumes of vehicles in and out of the Tsoni SEZ. We're also partnering with the airports company of South, of South Africa and the city of Ekuruleni to fully realize the potential of the Oartambo SEZ as an anchor of the broader Aerotropolis vision. Part of our partnership is to work on air access initiative aimed at enhancing air service connectivity between the global gateway and Gauteng province via the OR Tambo International Airport. In addition, the Val SEZ management company has been established in partnership with the DTIC, and this will operate along the lines of working with the Val Regional Economic Development Agency. We are in advanced negotiations with the clusters of private sector investors that have formally put themselves forward as future anchor tenants in the, in the Western Corridor Special Economic Zone. This including Sibanya Stillwater and Pasmak. We'll be using this SEZ to build a green energy and agro-processing ecosystem along the N12 corridor. Throughout the life of these SEZ processes and projects, we're explicitly tying up tying in the upgrade of township industrial estates and using the SEZ leeway, as the leeway of legislation intended as amongst others, leave us for Thank state you, industrialization. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you I'm here, speaker. Uh, speaker, in the current financial year, the department is allocated amount of 110.512 billion for the 2021-2022 financial year. Similar to the previous financial year, the Houghton Growth Department Agency GGDA is allocated the large share with amount of 632 million and followed by the Gauteng Enterprise Propellers GEP with an amount of 200 and 
uh, 19.9 million. The Houghton Tourism also, Authority is allocated an amount of 126.4 million. And in the current financial year, the Houghton Gambling Board was never allocated in the current financial year. The Department of Economic Development is one department that receives enough in terms of budget allocation to, the develop, to develop programs and projects that will ensure that the province responds adequately to the triple three of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. This department has proven incapable of creating sustainable jobs and protecting industrial development through investing in emerging entrepreneurs and markets, especially women and people living with disability. All entities underspend their allocated budget, clearly indicating the failure of the department to hold entities' ac accountability and to ensure that the public funds are managed and spent correctly. The department receives an unqualified audit from the auditors general. The Houghton Liquor Board not only received an unqualified audit review in the previous financial year, but was found to be waiting on governance and co compliance issues resu resulting in irregular expenditure, sitting the incompetence of senior management of the GLB to take responsibility. All entities under the department have once again failed to meet their target, sitting the lack of filing of strategies, vacancies as a so sorry excuse in the age of rising unemployment. The department is still making excuses of not being able to hire suitable people to fill vacancy in entities. We therefore reject budget three as the EFF. The Houghton, uh, the Houghton Growth and Development Agency has failed to deliver in infrastructure projects, sitting uh, the pandemic as an excuse for projects being brought to standstill. But this level of fabrication should never be tolerated. The COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent national lockdown period was on 26 March 2020 five days before the financial year end, meaning the agency's project could have, no, could have in no way been obstructed by the pandemic or the national lockdown as been portrayed in the annual report. The entity further failed to meet the target of securing 7.5 billion worth of investment as part of the target. Under the Automotive Industry Center. The Shando Industrial Harbor in the West Rand continue to be non-operational since its in inception in 2019. And reason for its lack of operation seem to result in fi uh, flimsy excuses from the department and its agencies. This delay in operation has serious negative implication for service delivery, job creation, and accessibility for the community of Westland, and it's not acceptable that till today that hub is non-operational. The EFF believes that state-led industry policy should be championed by the protesting this infect industry with a view to creating millions of, of suitable jobs. There can never be meaningful economic development when the infect industry like SMMEs are not being supported and exposed to unfair competitive advantage by big corporations. Thank the you. department Thank decision you. to support fewer Thank number you. will reject the budget. You. Thank you. Okay. Honorable Albert, I know that you said you are not going to debate this morning. Can we take Honorable Adams? Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I think let me just focus in my one minute with regards to the township uh, spend and, 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 and the lack there of chairperson. I think with what is the groundswell as what is happening in, in our communities um, with Dubula and, 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 you know, the uh, 
the communities being affected in terms of the uh, foreign uh, shops in our communities. I think it's going to be very important uh, going forward, uh, Honourable Speaker, that that we need to find a way and a strategy how we're going to make sure that there can be a system that can actually work where we work together with with these um, shop owners that are already in the communities. There's no ways. Let me state it categorically that we can chase them away. There's no ways that we can wish them away. I would want to say that we must make sure that they are documented and that they are legal in the country. But if they are there, these are economic migrants. And they must find a way that there must be a coexistence working together with the shopkeepers and with the communities. Thank you, Thank you Chairperson. Uh, my case, uh, uh, speaker, honorable members, the people of Gauteng, fellow South Africans, Gauteng is not working. The poet Langston Hughes asked a pertinent question. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a saw? Yeah, you look very light today, Gun. Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe just sex like a heavy load. Or does it explode and cold? Houting is not waking. The people of this province are not waking. The latest figures from Statistics South Africa indicates that 3 million people in this province do not have jobs. What's even more disturbing is that over 400,000 people have, have given up hope of ever finding a job in this province. The promise of a better life for these 3 million people is just a dream deferred. What will happen to this deferred dream? Will it explode? Some will say that it is already exploding. Houting townships are burning. Every day there's a protest with burning tires, rocks blocking the roads, and the youth demanding services. The reasons for this protest is that Houting is not working. The people were sold dreams, and the dreams were literally stolen from them. We have in this province a generation of young people who are poorer than their parents. And with each passing day, they see their dreams of living their best lives being stolen from them. The other day, I was in Klaji Soweto, interacting with residents. I came across two young men in their early 30s. When I asked if they would be participating in the local government elections in October, they asked, why should they, when the system is not working for them, they are unemployed and still staying with their parents? Theirs is not an isolated story. It is a story of over 3 million people of this province who are not working. The Department of Economic Development, the Department of Economic De Development has the mandate of creating a conducive environment for the people of Houting to get jobs and provide for their families. The failure and success criteria for this department must be the number of people who have find jobs. All projects that the department undertakes must be based on the number of, of jobs that will be created for our people. If a project will not, will not yield jobs, it should not be undertaken. We need to get the people of Houting working because currently this Houting is not working for anyone. And we need to be honest with ourselves. The good words and intentions mentioned previously have not worked. This is even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking at this department's budget, one would be mistaken for thinking that COVID-19 did not happen. The, this budget lacks fresh ideas and new thinking. The world as we know it has changed. But the thinking in the most crucial department to get our people working has remained the same. There's just no sense of agency. Everyone is just strolling along, doing the same thing they've been doing for the, for the last five years. And the result is that 3 million people in Houting are unemployed. 
It is for this reason that Kauteng does not have an economic uh, recovery blueprint to get our people working. The lives of the people of this count of this province is not a priority. We need to be honest. The, the agencies of the department are, perf are not performing optimally. For if they were, the people of Gauteng will be working. For some strange reason, this department does not like stability. One day you could be satisfied that finally Gauteng Enterprise Propeller has a permanent CEO, only to be followed the very next week by the suspension of the Gauteng Gambling Board CEO. It's like there must always be actors in the department, one way or the other. When it comes to acting appointments, I must say that the department seems to be doing much better than fundamental of generations. It was Einstein who said, we cannot solve our problems with the thinking we used when we created them, end quote. The prevailing thinking in the Houting provincial government has resulted in over 3 million people of our, of our province being unemployed and 400,000 men and women giving up hope of ever finding employment. What is true about Houting is that we cannot stand and watch a government destroy the dreams of the people of this province. The residents of Houting deserve a government that will urgently spend the 250 million that has been set, set aside to assist small businesses. These are the funds that should be renamed the Employment Linked, linked Assistance. Only those that will get our people will, will, will get assistance. We need to be rolling out uh, a red carpet to every investor that wants to invest their money in Gauteng by cutting the bureaucratic red tape. The Gauteng Growth and Development Agency will need, will, will create, and under this DA government, will create a one-stop shop that will ensure that there's assistance to investors who will create jobs for our people. And if we're in government, we will be spearheading a lobby to, to, to the Department of Labor and, and, and Employment to relax some labor laws of businesses operating in Gauteng to make it easier for them to employ South Africans. Gauteng will be declared a special economic zone under a DA government. The dreams of our people, especially young people, cannot be allowed to be deferred because of a failing government. As a generation of leaders in this house, we must work to restore their dreams and build a Gauteng that works for all the people of Gauteng. And I must say, Gauteng will work under a DA government. Nakenza Speaker. How many are unemployed in Western Cape under the DA? More people than they are in Gauteng. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Speaker of the House and the Deputy, the Honorable Premier of Gauteng, members of the Executive Council, Honorable members of the Legislature, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Madam Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this debate. It is an honor uh, for me to present my views in this debate. Let me start by honoring honoring and saluting the youth of 1976 in this important youth month. The youth of South Africa are an important asset in the building of our envisaged national democratic society. Youth are driving force for change and social transformation that we seek to achieve in this social political epoch. Honorable members, on this Youth Day, we recall that it was the ASC Youth League led by the late Peter Mukaba and Ambassador Rapo Mulikane, as well as one of our own staff member, Mr. Tulani, Tulani Manlachi, which commissioned the construction of a permanent heritage memorial to the gallant and visionary youth of 1976. We salute your vision and profound exemplary work on behalf of the Congress movement to immortalize this day in our history. And never forget that South Africa the South Africa's present is informed by its past historical injustices and remains pregnant with possibilities of a better future despite its current troubles and difficulties. 
of our struggle to attain freedom in our lifetime. Madam Speaker, Gauteng is taking a lead in, a, in reigniting economic reconstruction and recovery. This significant move confirmed by the state of, of the province address this year, despite the challenges of COVID-19, were to adjust and adapt the GDT 2020 plan to the changed environment. The SOPA also emphasized that GDT 2030 remains the plan of action of the entire Houghton City region. Has the budget vote of the department also, is also guided by this profound vision of the pro provincial government to that government has a common vision and plan of action for the immediate and long-term development of each metro or district, regardless of the changes that happen from time to time in local local and speaker, we are doing so focusing on our high growth priority sectors and infrastructure investment projects, not the transformation, modernization, and re-industrialization of the different corridors and district or uh, district of our city region. The National Youth Development Agency and, De and Department of Small Business Development provide grant funding and business support to a thousand young entrepreneurs within 100 days to establish a national pathway. The management network provides support and opportunities to young people across the country, not only in, in Gauteng. We support and salute the government initiatives to fight poverty and unemployment in all sectors of our economy to realize the objectives of Gauteng, of growing Gauteng 2030 and its impact to achieve the set dreams. Um, an amount of 1,561,762,000 is allocated to the department of, uh, to, allocated to the department for the 2021-22 financial year to serve as a center of excellence in leading radical economic transformation, modernization, and re-industrialization of the province economy. Furthermore, it facilitates equity, redress access to the economic opportunities and decent employment. The budget will, will ensure that the province economic profile reflects its demographic landscape and practice transport and as well as tra a practice trans a trans transparent participation and good governance at internal levels. Madam Speaker, to this end, the development of single multi-tier special economic zones in the, is the primary anchor of our, of our industrialization agenda. It is our goal to have at least one SEZ in each district or metro, specializing in the, dis, uh, in the distant sectors and industries in each corridor. The progress we made at the Twana Automatic Special Economic Zone is inspiring. The three spheres of government are investing 3.3 billion in infrastructure, which has unlocked 4.3 billion investment by suppliers and a further, a further 15.8 uh, billion investment announced by Ford Motor Company on the 8th of February 2021. This is the biggest foreign direct investment to resuscitate economy of the province, of particularly Gauteng. That is the red carpet that member Ghana is talking about. Definitely the department is rolling out that um, red carpet to international and in, 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 international and internal investors. Tazas will produce over 200,000 vehicles by 2022. This is regarded as a massive achievement to the people of Kauteng and great employment for that matter. The budget vote of the department, Madam Speaker, also reflected an, an the good story for the people of province regarding entrepreneurs and SMEs is, is, is a, providing non-financial and financial support to 262 SMEs gra um, grades 1 to 7. Over, over 1.7 billion, which is 47% of infrastructure spent worth of SMEs is already allocated and another 531 million of work will be allocated to township SNMEs in the coming months for the to for the building of to build a program to construct the first set of batteries. Within the next 12 months, a total of 
3,288 new permanent jobs will be created at, at, at this SEZ. 1,200 by, by four and two and 2,088 by the suppliers. In addition, 8,600 construction related jobs have, been, have already been created during phase one. Women, youth, and people with disabilities will play a significant role in the project with more opportunities expected to be created in the next two phases. The Sony Automotive Special Economic Zone is a prime example of our vision of special and economic transformation and integration of township enterprises. Let yeah. old, women owned, and youth owned business into supply chains of big corporate. Tazas is a perfect model of a social compact between different sectors. It is an example of how government can cut red tape and make quick decisions that are able to attract and safeguard investment. Red carpet member. How can provincial Department of Economic Development is working closely with the very district municipal, municipality, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and the Development of Bank, uh, uh, Development Bank of Southern Africa on the development of the Val River Special Economic Zone, develop project that is a game changer for the economy of Sidibel to benefit the surrounding people and community at large. Madam Speaker, as an ANC-led government, we are gladly uh, 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 we have, we, we are announced with confidence in the how we can gladly announce with confidence in the House um, sitting today that the Western SEZ is progressing very well. Approximately 100 hectares of land was made available by Sibanye Steel Water PTY Limited, as already indicated by the MEC. Madam Speaker, the ANC-led government believes in integrity, accountability, ethical and morality of leading transformation agenda under the auspices of the Economic Development Department as a cornerstone to change lives of vulnerable people with a demonstrator which was demonstrated on many occasions for clean governance to pursue the sixth administrative mandate by the people of how they um, effectively. As ANC as Madam Speaker, we do have confidence on our provincial government to lead the community for the better life of our, of our uh, for the better life of our poor and the working class. I therefore support this budget vote for economic development to deepen economic growth and make significant impact to address triple challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality experienced by people in our in our province. I therefore thank you, Madam Speaker, for this opportunity to address this August House. Thank you very much, Ma'am. Thank you, uh, Honorable Tau. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm sure we have choices to make. The one choice is to roll up our sleeve and work on transforming the economy and growing the economy of Gauteng. The other choice as presented by other members in this house would be to wallow in the lamentations of Jeremiah. Indeed, we choose the former. We roll up our sleeves, we focus on the target, and we implement, and we implement the Growing Gauteng Together 2030 strategy and its high impact programs. Madam Speaker, it is in this budget that we have allowed for the contribution to critical institutional partnerships with the DTIC and the Industrial Development Corporation. This includes co-funding and direct operational collaboration amongst others, the Township Economic Partnership Fund, where we are finalizing the term sheets for co-funding of wholesale lending to non-bank intermediaries. Madam Speaker, in support of this Township Economic Fund, the GDT has allocated 250 million rand to be deployed via the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller for wholesale lending into blended financing pools. We will be focusing on our efforts on working capital, stock credit, and purchase order financing, supporting the full diversity of township-based businesses targeting the taxi economy, the retail sector, and also the property sector. In this regard, we're also proudly partnering with Toyota to drive taxi rent commercialization and component supply businesses 
with equity, equity ownership by the taxi associations. We're working closely with the BBC and NAFCOC and their affiliates to ensure that these new blended financing channels will also be used to build enterprises and supply development pipelines into our 10 high growth sectors. Madam Speaker and Honorable Members, we cannot enable this innovation, innovative financing mechanism to work its magic without a paradigm shift in how we cut red tape for township-based businesses and reform regulations to support the full diversification and massification of the township economy. It is in this regard that we have presented to the House the Draft Township Economic Development Bill, which has a number of far-reaching objectives, including amongst others, focusing on regulation and ensuring that we focus on transforming specific zones into job-creating commercial activities, setting up procurement rules and pragmatic support to township-based enterprises, and to ensuring through these initiatives that the legal framework is established to ensure support for small enterprises through, amongst others, the financing mechanisms that I spoke to earlier. The township economic revitalization is resourced through our integrated economic development services under which allocation to GEP decreases from 219. Honorable Tau, we have lost you. Honorable Tawu, we have lost you. Honorable MEC, we have lost you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I lost connectivity due to a power outage. Okay. If you can also switch the video, I think I will accept that because at times it, it also affects the connectivity. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Yeah, I'm not sure how much time I'm left with uh, in the responses. Madam Speaker, as yes, Speaker. It, Madam Speaker, one of the critical initiatives we are undertaking is, is the identification of infrastructure as a catalyst for development. We see infrastructure as a platform from which we can drive a counter-cyclical counter -cyclical economic investment program, program at the back of infrastructure investment. It is equally critical to ensure through infrastructure investment that we can enable and facilitate those areas that require development, such as Lanseria, the Val, the N12, and other areas that require infrastructure to find innovative financing mechanisms, as exampled in Lanseria. Through the establishment of a special purpose vehicle and leveraging resource bases and revenue bases in municipalities and other spheres of government, we can upscale our investment in infrastructure and expand the areas of industrialization and commercialization in the province of Gauteng. Madam Speaker, the Gauteng Tourism Authority is at the center of our development agenda. To demonstrate our efforts, we are spearheading the Working for Tourism program, which is a community-based, youth-driven initiative aimed at refurbishing key tourism attractions in our province starting with government-owned facilities and those in our townships. Working together with the Innovation Hub, 
we will introduce digital and virtual tourism technologies to keep the destination top of mind, driven by the tourism recovery plan as we prepare for future visitations in our province. We will incorporate the objectives of, tourism equity, of the Tourism Equity Fund into our bigger picture approach and through partnerships with the GEP and other TFIs seek to broaden the reach and impact of this transformation initiative to support, to support black industrialists in the visitor economy. Madam Speaker, allow me to reflect as I conclude on other areas. Indeed, there is hope in action in our province as we focus on crafting and implementing policies and programs, working closely with business and civil society to expand markets and value chains in the sectors that have the best potential for growth. We are turning the corner to engender a genuinely empowered and high capacity pipelines of supplier suppliers in the sectors mentioned previously. There is indeed hope in action to engender broad-based development and opening up opportunities across value chains for consumers, contractors, and businesses that throng the streets of our townships and rural areas. With the colleagues who are working closely with the provincial government and all our colleagues in government, we are turning the corner to confront and transcend these extraordinary times precipitated by COVID-19. These are challenging times filled with opportunities to do things differently. Allow me to reflect on, a, on statements by the Premier in his 2021 State of the Province address when he says, we need to stop thinking that we'll return to the old ways of doing things. We have to build pandemic-proof and disaster-ready institutions as we embrace the new normal. Indeed, the GDD and its agencies are maximizing economic outputs from present policy prescripts. We are striking a balance between individual sector and institutional partnerships. We are on a right path in implementing pragmatic programs and programs that seek to, and projects that seek to deliver shared prosperity for the citizens of this province and the community of the Gauteng city region. Let me reflect on a discussion we had with the chairperson of the DBSA, uh, Mr. Enoch Kotongwan, who reminded us that we are learning, that learning is a two-way process, that we're in an exciting experiment on the ground with the DBSA, and we are learning from each other, and that we are here to change lives, and let us all continue to be the part, to be a part of the change that we want to see, and not wallow in the lamentations of Jeremy. Thank you very much. Please check for me which order we're at. Okay. Maybe uh, before, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, before you take over, can I announce that we just received the sad news? Honorable Lasindwa has lost her son in hospital, and as a result, uh, Honorable Fasiha will take over the reports. And I hope the family will be consoled by the God Almighty. And Honorable Lasinda will expect us to give the support that, that she needs during this particular period. Thank you very much. Over to you, Deputy Speaker. I think what we're going to deal with now is the next order, which is order number seven. And Honorable Fasera will take over after the announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Secretary, read the next order. Consideration of the Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture, and Rural Development Portfolio Committee's Oversight Report on the Detail of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development Budget Vote 11 of the Gauteng Provincial Appropriation Bill G001 of 2021 for the 2021 and 2022 financial year. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Let me start by sending our deepest condolences to the chairperson um, during a very difficult time. Um, I'm sure that uh, we are all going to pray that uh, God give you all the strength to get through it. 
Um, uh, through you, Deputy Speaker, I'm going to uh, take certain parts of the report as having been read and therefore only cover the executive summary and the important bits. Um, the department's total allocation for the 21-22 financial year revenue is set at 1.02 billion, which marks a 2.2% increment from the previous financial year's adjusted budget, which was at 909. I'm just going to read the number, 994.71 million. The department's budget dropped slightly from 0.72% of the previous year's total provincial budget to 0.71% of the current financial year. The administration's program was allocated 262 million during the 2021 financial year, which had to, which had to be revised downwards by 4.4%, amounting to 11.59 million rand. The Agriculture and Rural Development Program was allocated 461 million during the 2021 financial year, which also had to be revised downward by 8%, amounting to 36.84 million. The Environmental Affairs Program has been allocated 303 million in the current financial year, which denotes a decrease of 5% compared to the um, compared to the 2021 financial year of 319 million. The committee noted that the allocation on the programs were revised in line with the response to the reprioritization of funds to help in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The 21-22 financial year budget follows a year where budget cuts were made as a result of having to reprioritize funds in order to help in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic that was ravaging in the country. The presentation of the budget coincides with a period where economic growth has been suppressed by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has put a strain on economic activities across the world. This budget is meant to help in reversing the effects of COVID-19 on the provincial economy so that the economic activity is taken to as close as where it had been prior to the occurrence of that pandemic. The department will continue supporting economic drivers from an agricultural perspective, which, include the, which includes the continued revamping of the Freyenachung fresh produce market, the ecological management of the province's nature reserves so that they can attract tourists and become income generating, as well as the continued maintenance of the existing hydroponics project in various agri parks. The department continues to prioritize the creation of agro-processing hubs and township processing facilities. Moreover, there is a commitment to commercialize 68 smallholder farmers and improve market access, as well as establish the West Strand fresh produce market. The committee acknowledges that the performance of the agricultural sector in the previous financial year was encouraging and giving, gives an impression that there is room for even better performance by the sector in the year under review. It will be important for the sector to contribute towards the lifting of the economy with absorbing people and jobs created especially um, as it is a workforce intensive sector. The committee acknowledges the budget allocation for the 21-22 financial year and will continue to monitor the performance of the department on a quarterly basis over the MTF period on funded programs. Uh, Deputy Speaker, just give me a moment. It's the first time I'm, I'm reading this document, so I'm just getting to the committee concerns. The committee is concerned about the continuous number one inability to eradicate the backlog faced with the establishment of infrastructure projects brought about by the IDMS policy. Uh, number two, the inadequate support given to smallholder farmers and agricultural cooperatives. Number three, the lack of reporting on issues related to environmental affairs in the province. Number four, the depicted projects for both the agriculture and rural development and environmental affairs programs are getting lower increments over the fi next financial year of 3.1% and 13, I'm sure that's 3.3% respectively, uh, compared to the previous financial year. In terms of recommendations, the Portfolio Committee recommends the following. The reports should be submitted to the committee by the 30th of September 2021. Uh, number one, provide the committee with a detailed and remedial plan in terms of how the various infrastructure projects will be supported in the current financial year through the IDMS policy. Further provide progress reports on the implementation of the projects by the DBSA. Provide the committee with a detailed plan um, on enhancing the functionality of subsistence, smallholder, women and youth farmers. That plan must include how the department plans to provide smallholder farmers with sufficient support to enhance the marketing of their produce. Number three, the department should form a, a strong collaborative relationship with municipalities that are affected and further ensure that waste management and greening efforts are maintained and adhered to, adhered to by communities. Provide the committee with a detailed plan on how they will assist and support those affected communities to ensure that there is environmental compliance in those areas. Number four, provide the committee with a quarterly report on how the non-achieved targets for programs two and three will be achieved and how the insufficient spending of their finances will be aligned to the budget cycle. Moreover, provide a plan on how their planned targets will be achieved in the year under review. Uh, the Portfolio Committee wishes to thank the MEC 
um, the HOD and their teams of officials. Uh, the, on behalf of the chairperson, Ms. Alla Sindwa, we also wish to acknowledge and express uh, all the our gratitude to all the honorable members of the portfolio committee. I won't mention everyone because of time. Um, and of course, to the team behind us um, that always ensures that the reports and the work is done from the committee. Thank you very much. In terms of the adoption of the report, after due consideration, the Economic Development Portfolio Committee unanimously adopted the Gauteng Department of Agriculture and Rural Development Budget Vote 11 report uh, for the 2021 financial year. In terms of uh, rule 1172C, read together with rules 164, the committee presents to this house and recommends the adoption of the committee's oversight report on the Gauteng Department uh, Budget Vote 11 report for the 21-22 financial year. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Hassan. I now put the question. Uh, is there a seconder? Sorry, is there a seconder? I rise to second, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Now I put the question. All the those in favor say aye. 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 Those who are not aye. in favor say no. Aye. Those who are not in favor say no. The eyes have it. Thank you very much. The report is adopted. Secretary, can you move to the next report? Sorry, next uh, order. Budget speech and debate on the detail of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development Budget Vote 11 of the Gauteng Provincial Appropriation Bill G001 of 2021 for the 2021 and 2022 financial year. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable MEC Tau. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Let me join my colleague, Honorable Hassan, in sending, sending condolences to the Honorable Chairperson of our committee, the Honorable Lasindo. It is indeed sad news. Madam Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier of the Province of Gauteng, the Chairperson and members of the Portfolio Committee, fellow members of the House, members of the media, and citizens of our province. The Gauteng Department of Agriculture and Rural Development is our platform for implementing the Gauteng Growth and Development Initiatives under the auspices of Growing Gauteng Together 2030 and its commitments to transform Gauteng into an agro-processing mecca. The GDAT is our platform to transform our peri-urban regions into a conducive ecosystem which drives both food security and a massive expansion of the food economy scaling towards the export market. The GDAT is our platform to take our challenges with respect to energy security, waste management and water availability to partner across government and with the private sector to build green economy solutions. Of course, GDAT cannot meet these challenges through isolated and narrow projects. Like its sister department, the DED, GDAT is being configured as an aggregator of efforts, a nerve center for public and private partnerships, and a di direct contributor to the apex economic initiatives that underpin GGT 2030. To enable this, we are integrating the efforts of of GDAT into the war room that I've outlined earlier. Allow me to, out, to outline how we're leveraging the resources entrusted upon by this legislature and which our war room will be, will be bringing to life in the current financial year. As part of our focus on reindustrializing Gauteng for the 21st century through multi-tier SEZs and high growth sector program, we are deliberately focusing on agro-processing agro and industrial cannabis. Though we are by far the most urbanized province with the most limited land available for cultivation, we sit at the nerve center of the industrial value chains of the Republic and connected to all available export pathways. We can and must become the agro-processing platform for emerging farmers of all sizes both here and across the Republic, connecting them to the emerging African single market. This is important since it is estimated that intracontinental exports are projected to increase by over 80% from current, from current levels 
by 2035. And processed foods will form a major component of that. Gauteng is well placed to lead on the next phase of industrialization in this sector. After all, food and beverages already account for 20% of manufacturing jobs in our country, and that percentage is rising. Building a genuine agro-processing ecosystem with an export focus here in Gauteng can allow us to meaningfully contribute to, towards the NTP target of 646,000 additional direct jobs and 326,000 additional indirect jobs in agriculture, food processing, and related sectors by 2030. Honorable members, to do this, we have to raise our game and build capacity in opportunity areas such as the processing and preserving of meat, processing and preserving, and preserving of fruit and vegetables, manufacture of grain mill products, starches and starch products, and supply into frozen food value chains. We, we must do this while confronting the paradox that we live in a nation deemed food secure at a national level, but nonetheless demonstrates acute food insecurity at the household level. This is because, this is because food security, particularly in Gauteng, is driven by not, is driven by not by how much food is available, but by how much food people can afford. Even before COVID, 16% of households in Gauteng could not afford enough food. This hunger crisis provoked, the hunger crisis provoked by the COVID-2019 lockdowns demonstrated how rapidly that number can escalate even further into a widespread social crisis and the food price shocks that are being unleashed by the global climate change emergency are likely to exacerbate these circumstances. Therefore, we need to upscale up individual sector and institutional partnerships to build an ecosystem that empowers food insecure communities to grow, process food, and them in making food cheaper locally. This ecosystem must deliver production capacity so that production is geared towards surplus and must aggregate the production of smallholder farms so that they are agro-processing value chain and must be able to expand as a platform for emerging farmers from across the province and the Republic. Honorable Speaker, that is the ecosystem that we are building in partnership with the Agricultural Development Agency of OAGDA, which is a cluster of agribusiness interests that has been set up to partner with government through the Public-Private Growth Initiative. This partnership builds on initiatives we are currently focusing on as a department that will be included as part of this ecosystem. As honorable members would know, in the 2021 financial year, GDAT supported the commercialization program of farmers and agro-processors as beneficiaries with production inputs, infrastructure support, and mechanization. GDAT also rolled out eight movable poultry and two mobile red meat abattoirs to 10 agribusinesses across the province. The department also procured and delivered 16 additional refrigerated trucks to agribusinesses as part of the agro-logistics program to ensure the movement of agricultural produce from farm level to the market. The department has equipped the Isikayo milling plant in Rangfontein and will continue to work with them to ensure that this project becomes a success and aggregates access to the market through the milling process. We are on course to stabilizing the working capital of the operating co-op through supporting them with 300 tons of maize input. And this is with regard to Isikai. GDOT provided primary animal health care to farmers through vaccination and assistance to poultry and piggery farmers where there were disease outbreaks with biosecurity measures being adhered to. It implemented key ecosystem management projects including amongst others, 
fire management, alien plant control, revenue collection in the reserves. These are a useful start, but are only the beginning of building the ecosystem we envision. Our partnership with ACTA to be run from our war room will focus on building the full value chain spectrum across the N12 corridor in the West End, linking smallholder production through agri logistic networks and agri hubs into new agro processing scale initiatives, such as the Bukamu Sovaruna partnerships with Sibanye Stillwater. It would also tie into the Land Care Program grant, which aims to secure high value agricultural land for previously disadvantaged farming communities, which will exp expand at least 1,800 hectares of land under production in Gauteng. This would also be directly linked and supported through the AgriParks program, which commits to ongoing maintenance of the six established AgriParks and a new AgriPark named Obed Mtombeni AgriPark, which will be built in this financial year. While the ACTA partnership will focus on the peri-urban and rural communities in the West Rand and the Val, it will be complemented by the Urban Agriculture Program, through which a total of 10 urban farms will be established in this financial year to address urban food security challenges and stimulate an urban economy that centers on agri-food value chain. A further component of this emerging ecosystem we continue to work on community services and primary animal health, especially focused on the provision of animal health services to previously disadvantaged communities who cannot afford private veterinary services. Clinics, both built and mobile, disease prevention and secondary care is being provided throughout the province. Honorable Speaker, this partnership focused on the L12 corridor covers both Soweto and the West End, links up to the West End SEZ, and through the deployment of bioenergy and would be part of what we deploy as part of our overall program in these areas. As the recently released, I, released IHS market study has demonstrated, South Africa has the opportunity to play a globally significant role in the energy markets of the future as a producer and user and user of green hydrogen as a source of energy. To produce liquid hydrogen as a fuel as a green fuel, we need both large volumes of renewable energy and a significant supply of water. We have the potential for of this both in the West End with vast renewable energy potential as part of the Bokamu Sobaruna program through the repurposing of old mining land to host large solar and wind grids, plus through the reprocessing of acid mine drainage water for both hydro hydrogen production and agricultural use. We'll be working with the DBSA in the implementation of these programs to, together with our global partners the World Resources Institute. This will unlock the deployment of large scale embedded generation behind the meter power system. It would ensure that counting becomes an active role player in the green economy and in implementing the vision of a, a new energy grid that looks at alternative energy sources and is deployed both by the public and private sectors for both local consumption and for export and utilizing our industrial base as a means through which we industrialize um, through green energy and become internationally competitive in the new era of climate, of climate change that we're focusing on. Honorable Deputy Speaker, just as turning AMD into an opportunity to monetize reprocessed water as feedstock for hydrogen production and agriculture, we are turning the critical challenge represented by the waste economy. We are also focused on ensuring that we are addressing climate change through our overarching climate change strategy, which identifies 10 key sectors 
for mitigation and adaptation action. In this regard, we're focusing on energy, transport, industry, health, biodiversity, agriculture, mining, water and the waste sectors with clear actions. And this is be being developed through a consultative process for approval by EXCO. In order to reduce carbon intensity of the housing economy, the department is implementing an industrial symbiosis program. The Gauteng Industrial Symbiosis Program is a resource efficiency approach where unused or residual resources such as energy, waste assets, logistics expertise, etc., of one company are used by another. This results in mutual economic, social, and environmental benefits that can be measured. Regarding the Bulletin to campaign, this program supports municipalities through various cleanup operations. An added benefit is that, is that of employment creation, where longer than 12 months of continuous employment gets created through these environmental programs. For this financial year, we're targeting the creation of 3,480 jobs. Therefore, the Bundekibu to campaigns account for a number of jobs and participants are able to earn a living through environmental programs that make a material difference, such as waste collection and environmental rehabilitation. The rehabilitation of illegal dump programs aims to convert the illegal dump sites to recreational community facilities. The department undertakes quarterly monitoring of illegal dump hotspots in the province and reports these to the municipalities for eradication and in order to prevent negative health effects of illegal dumping on our communities. Honorable Speaker, revenue projections for the department are projected, will con is that the department will continue to collect 14,124,000 revenue through, among other sources, veterinary services and nature reserves entrance fees collection of fines and penalties from Section 24G payments received. To build a food and cannabis economy ecosystem and drive the green revolution in Gauteng alongside its regulatory mandates, for this financial year, the department has, has been allocated with an estimated 1.6 billion rand. The department's total 2021 MTF budget increases by 2% during the current financial year, and 1% and 4% and for the outer year. Honorable Deputy Speaker, there is no gain saying the fact that COVID-19 impacted significantly the mandate and commitments of GDAT well, to substantially advance. Time is up. Oh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I request in the next sitting or next session, virtual sitting, MEC, uh, please use the the GPL background in the next yes in the next city. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Chitangado. Uh, our deepest uh, condolences to Honourable Lafindwa and the family. Deputy uh, Speaker. As EFF, we can only assess uh, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development on how it fulfills its uh, core responsibilities, such as agricultural development, food security, and rural development by meeting its print target. This could be done if we look at the Department's expenditure during 2021 financial year. We once again uh, disappointed at the Department performance because it failed to spend its allocated budget by over 40 million. This money had to be returned to the provincial treasury. We therefore reject budget vote 11. Program 2 remains critical as it is intended to mitigate food insecurity, but the department's expenditure in this regard stood at 88.92% of the annual budget allocation for 2021 financial year. For quarter four alone, 
the department spent only 56.41% of the allocated budget for the quarter. This is really concerning. We noted in the 2019-20 financial year that fewer smallholder farmers were trained and supported with agricultural uh, advice. The departments then came with the lame excuse that fewer farmers applied for assistance. This department is not taking the emerging black farmers seriously. The department continues to fail to complete capital funded projects, which has run for long periods now. We have for many years maintained that tenders must be abolished and the state must build its own internal capacity through the establishment of state-owned construction companies to work on construction of infrastructure projects. But because there are kickbacks through corruption, this end government has refused. The second post-run nature reserve have not been completed for many years now. This has resulted uh, and affected the service delivery. There is still no adequate operational plan to ensure there is a proper maintenance and upgrading of the six nature reserves in the province, a concern we raised in the past years. The department has not embarked on any end audit in preparation of land expropriation without compensation, which exposes the non commitment of the NC government to the process of restoring land to its rightful owner. If a guy or a milling plant, uh, uh, for example, in Redfontein, was supposed to be fully operational by 2017, to date, the project that intended to improve agro processing and benefit the total local traders is not just yet fully operational. An amount of over 5 million, which was meant for this. A, a project was returned to the treasure. We have on countless occasions advocated that land reform programs to be aimed at transferring land to the state, which will administer and use land for sustainable development purposes. The EFF has maintained that the state support to prioritize small scale farmer so that small scale farming becomes a sustainable economic activity for our people. Mm -hmm. In the previous financial year, the department once again failed to achieve its procurement target for the youth and people living with disabilities. We made it clear in our body manifesto that a structured state support and agricultural protection will in itself create sustainable economic activity and will also inspire young people to go into food production because there will be income and financial benefit to boost other economic activities. Young people and people living with the disability remain neglected. With the department failure to intervene and tamper with land disposition and capitalist patterns of land ownership, agriculture will never become a sustainable economic activity for the majority of black African people. Even young people will never be inspired to go into food production because there's no income and financial rewards for them. There's no doubt that the land reform programs have hopelessly failed the indigenous people and dismally failed to restore the dignity and humanity of the oppressed African masses of the province. This department is dysfunctional, poor resource, and ill equipped to deal with land reform and agrarian revolution. This department had been underperforming before COVID-19 and as a result, we reject budget uh, vote 11. I salute. Thank you, Honorable Stanganu. Honorable Adams? I, I'm fine, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. I'm good, thanks. Okay, Honorable Silias? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I just want to first express my condolences to Chairperson Lassindwa and her family in this difficult time. Deputy Speaker, the men and women who grow crops and tend to livestock in this province are a national treasure. They carry a burden of responsibility that go far beyond raising food. When COVID-19 emerged as a zoonotic disease, Dr. Jane Goodall charged humanity to think our entire relationship with the natural world. Farmers are at the wild frontier. 
In Gauteng, they are faced with an unstable power supply, water shortages, acid mine drainage, eroding soil, rampant stock theft, and violent crime. They are also being threatened with exposure without compensation and being potentially disarmed by the new gun bill that will leave rural communities more vulnerable than ever. This is no way to treat a national treasure. Last year, I started my contribution to this debate by saying that the world was a different place when the budget was first drafted. In fact, these budgets were drafted for a future that no longer exists. Today, we are debating the second pandemic budget. If we look at what the folks over at Springwise are saying, they're saying that the ICT disruption that have happened just in the last nine months would ordinarily have taken 10 years to develop. So through you, Deputy Speaker, MEC Tau, every year I call on GDOT to redesign their entire extension services offering and to bring it into the 21st century. If you see the agricultural entrepreneur as your client, think about the user experience you are offering. This budget is not delivering the tools and resources that your clients need. Agriculture has the capacity to become a climate solution. The world's soils contain 2,500 gigatons of carbon, more than three times more carbon than is currently in the atmosphere. And soil has the capacity to hold much more. The department could be offering tools and technology to preserve soil biodiversity and save water. While conventional farming practices disturb the soil and release carbon into the atmosphere, contributing to climate change, some relatively simple changes to the way we grow food have shown promise in turning some of the world's farmlands into carbon sinks. Studies have projected that better land management practices could increase the amount of carbon stored in croplands by 1.89 billion tonnes annually, which may be conservative, and that farmland and grazing fields could sequester over 600 billion tons from the atmosphere. So simple practices such as no-till farming, crop, crop, rotation, crop diversity and rotational grazing, which are relatively easy to put in place, even for a smallholder, have added benefit. They lead to more nutritious and abundant food and a more resilient ecosystem. Our extension offering must teach these principles to the farmers and Conditional grants must be contingent upon them implementing conservation practice. Deputy Speaker, the department often repeat their desire to commercialize smallholder and emerging farmers. I see that the department is hosting a cannabis webinar on the 23rd. This is a step in the right direction, MEC. The small scale growers will tell you on Wednesday that it's simply impossible for them to be part of the cannabis value chain because the cost of regulatory compliance is exorbitant and the response rate of the Medicines Control Council is shockingly poor. MEC, you need to rethink market access. Fresh produce markets in the province are dirty, dangerous, and dysfunctional, and producers are beholden to a market agent system that is unfair and often corrupt. Livestock auctions also take place where many people come together in close proximity to one another, with very little or no COVID safety being practiced. All these trade processes are currently moving online. But the department is putting money towards the Vienna fresh produce market. There are better alternatives everywhere. For example, in Southeast Asia, there is an app called Grab. They have partnered with the, uh, the government. Um, they've launched a raft of initiatives amid more small and medium-sized merchants into its ecosystem, including farmers and agri-food vendors amid supply chain disruption and other knock-on effects from the pandemic. They have partnered with Indonesia's Ministry of Agriculture. Their app allows users to order directly from grocery stores and the grocery stores source directly from farmers. And they have their purchases delivered to the doorstep. If Gauteng farmers had this kind of access, we would not need to pay market agents, com market, uh, agents commission or market commission. It would be nice if one can evolve along these lines to stay relevant. We cannot support a budget that is business as usual, buying production inputs and teaching farming methods that harm the environment. I would advocate that the only thing this department must offer to the people of Gauteng is resilience. While the agriculture sector grew even, even during the pandemic, every third person in this province experienced hunger at a household level, as you said, MEC. This disconnect should keep the HOD and staff awake at night. While a third of our food end up as food waste in landfills, our children go to school hungry. Luckily, we can fix this and there are many exciting developments out there. 
the department should develop a strategic interest around scaling tech companies that solve real challenges between the farm gate and the consumer facing service provider. According to AgFunder, the global market for food supply chain tech is sized at $150 billion and growing. When you start to unpack subsectors like artificial intelligence, spend in food and beverage, which is expected to reach a market size of 30 billion by 2026 and a compound annual growth rate of over 45, the potential to transform this part of our aging critical infrastructure is hard to overlook. The food ecosystem represents about 15% of GDP globally. This transformation will create entirely new value chains, but none of this is happening in Africa yet. To give you an idea of what we are missing out on, in 2020, US-based venture capital investing activity was at $124 billion and tech private equity investment at $134 billion. For comparison, the agri-food tech companies raised about 6% of that. Given the scale, urgency, and near-term catalysts, the food supply chain is a goldmine of opportunity for building a tech-driven advantage. The next generation of agriculturalists will need to be bold and committed to future-proof our supply chain. The journey ahead is exciting, and the department should embrace the disruption we will face, or else they will be left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you. Honorable Makubele. Makubela. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Premier of Houting, Comrade David Malemule Makura, the MEC, uh, Comrade Pax Mpotau, the, the Honorable Members of the Legislature, Members of the Executive Council. Uh, the former president of the Northern Rhodesian African National Congress, which later became the Zambian African National Congress, and was later renamed in the 80s as, U as UNIP, President Kenneth Kaunda carried in his heart the wishes expressed in the song Africa Tiende Pamuze. Tiende Pamuze Ndimdima Umo, Tiende Pamuze Ndimdima Umo, Africa Tiende. Ayuti Tiende Limbopo Tiende Africa Tiende, which means, Honorable Deputy Speaker, that as Africans we must work together with one heart. And I wish to express on behalf of the African National Congress our sincere condolences to the to the family of the of the president, the former president of, of UNIP, Zang, uh, Comrade President uh, Kenneth. Kaunda and the people of Zambia. This is a country that housed many of our revolutionaries, both that of the Umkondo Wesizwe, the Spear of the Nation, and the, and, the, and the African People's Liberation Army. It's very important that we make this tribute. We also stand here with heavy hearts after we have just learned of the passing of Comrade Lasindwa's son, and we, we, we convey our condolences to the Lasindwa family and the entire ANC family. Honorable Speaker, as I listen to the debaters that came on the debate, I am reminded of a poem written over a hundred years ago by a brilliant Irish mind, William Butler Yeats, who wrote the poem, The Rose Tree. I'm reminded mostly by this poem when Honorable Chitangano spoke. To summarize what Chitangano says, William Butler Yeats says in his poem, The Rose Tree, all words are lightly spoken, said Pierce to Connolly. Maybe these words are a breath of toxic political words. And these are the words that has withered our rose tree, or maybe by the wind that blows across the bitter sea. Close quote. So when I listen to Honorable Chitanga, I just heard words that are lightly spoken, words of bitterness that has withered the rose tree. I'm also, I was also reminded of another poem that he wrote 100 years ago, William Butler Yeats, when Honorable Silas was speaking here in this August house. He writes the poem, he wishes for the thoughts of heaven, and in the last, in the last line of the poem, Butler Yeats says that, I have spread my dreams under your feet, and when you walk, Walk carefully because 
you are stepping on the dream. I'm saying so because and citing these two powerful incisive points by, by a very brilliant mind to say I'm reminded of, of, of those who are debating but then are just saying words lightly and the dreams of our people who are not even debating the reports and the content of, uh, of the budget vote. Madam, Madam, Debu Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the ANC in its 54th conference placed the need for the organization to truly embrace its role as a strategic center of power for transformation within the country. This accession is premised on an organization which is capable of to manage its policy implementation. It is an organization characterized by the ability to evaluate how it continues to serve the mandate of the people of Houghton. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I'm humbled to say to, de to, to, to debate the budget vote for the provincial agriculture and rural development for the 2020-2021 financial year. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is one of the most and critical department which carries with it the hopes and aspirations of the people of Houghton for economic emancipation as well as to attain economic freedom and salvage from the bondage of from the bondage of poverty and hunger across the boundaries of Houghton. Honorable members, our goal has always been to provide a decent agricultural food security and to thrive to transform agricultural sector for all the people of our province to have dignified and sustainable livelihoods to the most vulnerable by providing them with agricultural opportunities. Madam Speaker, the sixth administration, as capably led by Honorable uh, Premier David Malemulema Makura, after the ex extended Executive Council Lakota this year, 2021, emerged with the pay of line, growing Houghton together. This translated into the development of a 2030 Houghton Growth Plan, popularly known as the GGT 2030, which set the strategic agenda for the Houghton Provincial Government and informed the development of the department's five-year strategic plan. This plan is anchored on five strategic pillars, namely, to provide access and inclusive participation in commercial agri-food value chain and agro-processing. Uh, the, the MEC has elaborated on that, as well as to stimulate sustainable and integrated rural and urban development, to maximize food security, to promote animal public health and ensuring food safety, and furthermore, to ensure an environment which is sustainable and promoting sustainable development. The output reflected in the department budget plan contributes towards the achievements of the priorities ex as expressed in the GG GGT 2030 plan. Madam Deputy Speaker, the 2020-2021 the financial year was marked with the COVID-19 outbreaks. The outbreak and the related lockdown alert levels and regulations had a general negative impact on the department's ability to deliver optimally on its commitments. Sectors led and supported by the department were negatively affected by this pandemic, especially the food production, meat regulation, export certification, environment public employment program, and ecotourism. Madam, De Madam Deputy Speaker, the department had to adapt and innovate, and adapt and innovate it did. To that food production and meat regulation services were undertaken during the various levels of lockdown in order to support the agricultural sector. And as a result, the agriculture, se the agriculture sector showed resilience to the negative effects of the pandemic according to statistics of Africa. Agriculture, forestry, and fisheries was the only sector that positively contributed to the, to the national, uh, <clears throat> to, 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 to the GDP of our country, with an increase of 28.6% in the first quarter and 15.1% in the second quarter, and was one of the sectors 
significantly and positively contributed to GDP in quarter one of the 2020-2021 financial year. To this end, Madam Deputy Speaker, the department continues to ensure that through the implementation of the comprehensive agricultural support and the Ili Malitema program, small and emerging farmers are given a kickstart in their farming enterprises and are unable to leverage more funding from other financial institutions. Madam Deputy Speaker, according to the budget vote of agriculture and rural development, the department will continue with the implementation of agro, agro listed chain pro program aimed at assisting farmers in meeting the market access requirements while currently pursuing the development of agri parks and agro processing infrastructural projects. The department coordinates the implementation of the comprehensive rural development plan in the targeted rural areas in the West Rand, the Sidibeng area, and as well as Tswane, and other rural nodes of Devon, Egport, Bantubong, and Sokulumi in, in the Borongo Sprite area. The updated Houghton City region over arcing climate change response strategy is being implemented, is being implemented in the areas of waste management, natural resources, water, agriculture, and agro-processing commercial buildings, energy and disaster management. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Houghton Environmental Sustain Sustainability Framework has been approved for implementation and it articulates the environmental legislation, cooperative governance mechanisms, regulatory tools that are used in the province, the extent of, the extent of work undertaken, including the strategic outlook of the intervention programs that will achieve environmental sustainability in the province. There is no doubt in my heart or in anyone's mind that the quality of the environment in Houghton is deteriorating and that the impacts of climate change are already felt by many sectors of the, the economy. To this effect, Madam Deputy Speaker, we will continue to implement the environmental cleanup and conservation programs ac across the city region while also enhancing our enforcement and compliance efforts to ensure that those who contravene environmental laws are brought to book. Madam Deputy Speaker, the NDP 2030 states that young people and women are denied the opportunities to lead the lives that they desire due to historical inequalities created by apartheid. The department is intent on addressing these inequalities and has given priority to women when developing agricultural transformation programs, exceeding the target for women at, at sector, which now stands at 56%. The target for people with disabilities has also been exceeded and is sitting at 2.67%. The vacancy rate of the department continues to be below the set target of 10% and is currently at 8.8%. To advance and implement the ANC Lakota resolutions on equality in all, at all material times. The NDP also strives for a capable and developmental state, able to correct historical inequalities and strong leadership working to solve problems. To this end, Madam Deputy Speaker, the department allocates funds in line with the Six Development Levies Act and the DPSA directives for continuous development of employees to keep abreast of development in the sector and to improve service delivery at all levels. Youth development programs such as bursaries, internships, and learnerships to address critical and skills areas are implemented on an annual basis according to the annual performance report of the department as, as presented by the acting chair of the committee. There is a concerted effort to enhance leadership capabilities as, as this remains the foundation of a successful and important sector to the society in general. Madam Deputy Speaker, the initiative for agricultural producer support and development program is very profound and paramount to expand access for agri-food value chain opportunities to promote agricultural development within land and agrarian reform initiatives in the province and to maximize food security through the provision 
of sustainable agricultural development support to subsist so to subsistence smallholder and commercial farmers. The provision of agricultural infrastructure support coordination, rendering of extension and advisory services, training and capacity building of farmers to advance economic empowerment. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the ANC-led government acknowledges the challenges encountered by the department because we are Cabral, who teaches us we must tell no lies and claim no easy victories. And hence, we acknowledge these challenges. And through oversight, we will ensure that the department implements accountability measures and consequence man man management to avoid poor performance of the department during the year under review. The department is continuously supporting and capacitating the affected entities for them to comply with the PFMA and other funding requirement models which related to minimum norms and standards for different fields of services. Despite the challenges, Madam Deputy Speaker, Houghton Department of Agriculture and Rural Development remained committed in the service delivery objectives to advance the struggle of human emancipation for economic empowerment to alleviate poverty and improve socioeconomic conditions of the people of Houghton city regions to advance social welfare services and service delivery in general. I therefore stand to support the budget for agriculture and rural development with the, with the intention to move South Africa forward. We repeat the words of former, the former president of, of, of the Zambian African National Congress, Kenneth Kaunda, his prayer, when he said, Tiende pamoze, dimtima umo, tiende pamoze, dimtima umo, Africa tiende. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Thank you very much once again, uh, Deputy Speaker. President Ramaphosa described the land issue in South Africa as the original sin. And unless we address the original sin, we will not have addressed the fundamental challenges that confront us as a people in addressing our history of sin and discrimination. Now, there are various ways in which this has to be addressed, and there are propositions that have been made in this house. So one member says, well, the state must own all the land. And another, and another member says, well, actually, expropriation without compensation is not a viable solution. And we say as the ANC that it is important that we ensure that we address the original sin by ensuring that those historically disadvantaged and dispossessed of their land gain access to land and are able to utilize this land for productive purposes, including agricultural, industrial, commercial, and other developments. And that indeed, we have to address this land issue as part of an empowerment program for if we transfer the land to the state, we are transferring the wealth into the state. Yet if we transfer the land to the beneficiaries, what addressing the fundamental issue of creating access to land for the people where they need it most. I raise this honorable deputy speaker because in fact, there is also a contention that the land should not be expropriated in a manner that uh, that does not address matters of compensation. And this matter is being addressed adequately by Parliament. I would not want to waste the House's time in dealing with it, except to refer to the points that, that I made a bit earlier. Now, there is also a contention that we do not take black farmers seriously. And I suppose this speech was prepared before our input, so there might have been lack of clarity as to the programs we are implementing. But let me state some of the programs that we are implementing to ensure over and above our, our overall agriculture development strategy, a deliberate and focused effort to assist black farmers and small, small farmers and emerging farmers in our province. 
The ESCO has adopted a proposal that we have made to ensure that we create a database of all small black farmers and aggregate a number of initiatives to support these farmers. The first is to ensure that we procure directly from these farmers as the provincial government. The second is to ensure that we provide the necessary technical serv services that ensure that they are able to, to produce and farm efficiently and that we are able to procure goods at the right and required standard, standard in terms of our needs as the province of Gauteng. So this is a direct program that will be implementing this financial year that would ensure that we become a, a market for black farmers and that we utilize our procurement muscle to support black farmers in our province. We're also currently working with the Department of Infrastructure Development to audit all agricultural land parcels in the province with the intention to release this to black farmers. And this is a conscious and deliberate way in which we can ensure access to land, but also access to the necessary support so that they are able to participate in this sector actively. I indicated earlier our partnership with AGDA, which is a deliberate program identified jointly between ourselves and the private sector through the PPGI to ensure that we can support black farmers, including uh, areas such as extension officer support, so that in fact we create access to market in the private sector, technical support by experienced farmers, and other support initiatives to address the plight of black farmers. Now I'm saying this to make the point that the assertion that we do not care and are not doing enough is an assertion probably made because we have not clarified it earlier when the speech was prepared. Now, Honorable Silius, indeed the matter of energy, water and sustainable agriculture is crucial to our agenda. And similarly, I would indicate, as Member Makubela indicated, that our focus on sustainability includes in areas of agriculture and agro-processing. We are acutely aware of the environmental and sustainability challenges in our province. We are conscious of the reality that in the medium term, we will have challenges with regards to water availability, potable water availability to the province of Gauti. We are conscious and aware that over the medium term, we would have challenges with regards to airspace in our landfill sites. And that unless we address this and, and ensure that we facilitate sustainable development in an overall development program, but also in, rela in relation to agriculture, we will run into problems. It is in this regard that we pronounce today on our partnership with the WRI, the World Resources Institute, on a program to address sustainable water management in our province in partnership with our municipalities and the Department of COCTA. Because indeed, unless we address this, we will, we will face significant challenges. As we are acutely aware of the reality of the landfill airspace and its availability or lack of availability in the medium term, we're working with national government, the presidency, and the Department of Environment to address the overall waste, man waste management challenges in the province of Gauteng. We are taking the view that we should not just sit as a regulatory authority and simply demand compliance, that we should regulate in a manner that ensures development. We've presented in our APP the agenda of developing an integrated waste management site to relieve some of the pressures of our municipalities and are currently engaged in discussions with our, member, with our municipalities around how this can be done and how we complement the work that they do. We've also identified the reality that, in fact, our pricing model for waste management encourages waste to landfill. And that unless we find ourselves in a situation where waste is done in a manner that acknowledges the need to recycle, to renew, and to find sustainable use of waste, that we will land this province in trouble. So equally, we are not just working on landfilling, but are saying our agenda is to ensure that those products that are recyclable do not reach landfill 
and that we will do this through our regulatory mechanisms, but also in working with our municipalities in developing programs for recycling, reuse, and renew of products. And as indicated, we're working very closely in this regard with the presidency, the infrastructure office, and indeed with the Department of Environment at the national level. Yes, we agree that we need to revise our extension of officer program and the support that they provide. And that's the partnerships that we've entered into to also increase the capacity of our extension officers to provide the support that would be required. I welcome the comments that have been made with regards to cannabis, but I thought it would be important that one reflects on the current environment. Of course, currently all the cannabis initiatives are focused on medicinal cannabis and governed through SAPRA. But we have identified as a province the industrialization of cannabis as a key program that we need to implement. In this regard, we have gone to the National Department of Agriculture and said, the regulatory processes to ensure the facilitation of, of cannabis, but also the industrialization of cannabis is a matter of urgency in our province and indeed in the nation. I can assure this house and the province and the people of the province of Gauteng that the minister has said to us that by the end of this year, the regulatory framework for the growing of cannabis and the, and, and the industrialization of cannabis would be ready. It is in this regard that we have prepared the webinar, which webinar is intended to ensure that we work with the sector and participants, but also those who are involved in research and other agencies as we prepare for the boom that cannabis is likely to provide in our province. We have visited sites in Sirian, and in the West End where cannabis is currently being uh, planted and are partnering with them in areas such as training, access to market, uh, and aggregation that would need to happen in the province of Gauteng. So we are gearing ourselves to take full advantage of the opportunities that the cannabis sector provides to us as a province. I did make the point earlier that in fact for us agriculture, and agro-processing are two sides of the same coin. That yes, we are known and accept that as the province of Gauteng, we have limited land availability to have a massive agri primary agriculture program. Yet we will continue to support a primary agriculture program, including expanding this to urban agriculture. However, we're also beginning to place greater emphasis on the opportunities in relation to agro-processing both for local consumption and for the export market. In this regard, we would be ensuring that our farmers in the province of Gauteng and farmers throughout the country are able to take advantage of the agglomeration benefits that are created by a province such as Gauteng and the opportunity for this to facilitate and enable economic growth and the aggregation of efforts in the province of Gauteng. So we are seeing ourselves as an active participant in facilitating access to local market, but also facilitating and enabling access to uh, the African continent and to international markets as we expand our export capacity. We cannot just look at agricultural produce for commercial purposes. It is important that we look at it as part of our food security program. Food security remains a critical challenge with more than 3 million people in the province considered to be food insecure or not having access to food at one point or the other in their lives. So it is important that we create direct support mechanisms that would ensure backyard food production initiatives and access to food at prices that are not inflated by the current market. It is in this. It, it, it is part of our initiat initiatives, rather, to support backyard agricultural produce, urban farming, and other initiatives that address food insecurity in our province. And lastly, I think it is important to indicate that the initiative of creating an additional market in the West Rand, in the province of Gauteng, 
is critical to ensuring that we can disrupt current areas, areas of uncompetitive access to markets in the traditional markets that have existed. It is an opportunity for us to suggest that disrupt and disrupt in a deliberate way the extent to which market agents have in fact not transformed, but also in certain instances have kept to historical market practices that do not create access to market for those who are new entrants into the markets, but also ensure equitable pricing and competitive pricing for goods in our markets. We see this as an opportunity to disrupt, but to disrupt in a positive way as we aggregate our agricultural efforts in the province of Gauteng. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Honorable MC. Time is up. You done? Thank you. Yes, I'm done, Madam Speaker. Okay, thank you. I thought I lost you there. Thank you, Honorable MC. Secretary, please take us to the next order. Thank you. Consideration of the Infrastructure Development Portfolio Committee's oversight report on the detail of the Department of Infrastructure Development. Budget Vote 15 of the Gauteng Provincial Appropriation Bill, G001 of 2021 for the 2021 and 2022 financial year. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Pons. Our uh, sincere condolences to Member Lassin family. Madam Speaker, a request is made that part of the report not read be this read, and therefore the report will concentrate on the following. One, introduction. The committee's assessment of the budget vote 15 seeks to verify whether the proposed in inputs translate into outputs to realize the required outcomes, thus ensuring that the funds appropriate to the Houting Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management are used cost effectively. We'll now move straight to findings, recommendation, and implications on lawmaking. One committee findings and concern. The committee is concerned that over the reduction of the overall budget allocation over of the department, that there has been an increase in the budget allocation, yet targets were decreased mainly on targets that pertain to spending on procurement budget towards black youth and black women owned companies. That there was no clear indication on the budget in terms of strengthening property management personnel, that targets related to revenue collection were never met in the pre the committees of the view that not much has been done in ensuring that these targets are achieved. A committee recommendation as follows. The department to consider rev revising its entire budget during the adjustment period to be able to discharge its mandate as per its uh, annual performance plans for the current financial year and report to the committee on their progress. The department to apply measures in ensuring that the budget is spent accordingly since targets to spending, spending procurement budget towards black youth and black owned uh, women companies were decreased. Department to put measures in ensuring that the strengthening of property management personnel happens. The department to put considerable effort in ensuring that targets related to revenue collection are achieved going forward. After assessing the Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management Budget Vote 15 for the 2021-2022 financial year, the Portfolio Committee recommends that the department should re submit responses to the above by Friday, 30th July 2021. In acknowledgement, the Chairperson of Portfolio Committee on Infrastructure Development and Property Management would like to thank MEC Motara head of the department and the entire department's executive for their efforts in the consideration of this report. The chairperson further appreciates the diligent deliberation from honorable members. The committee chair also like to thank committee staff for their dedication and assistance. In accordance with rule 1172C, read, uh, with rule 164, the portfolio committee on infrastructure development and property management presents before the House the oversight report on the Department of Infrastructure Development budget for the 2021-2022 financial year for consideration and adoption. I thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, so Honourable Modisa, thank you. I call for, I, I want to check if there's a seconder. 
Chair, I rise to second. Uh, who, oh, an Honourable Fuchs. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now put a question. All those in favour say aye. 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 I love you. I I don't want to be left. <laughs> those who <laughs> those, who, <laughs> those, those who are not in favour say no. Thank you. The eyes have it. The report is adopted. Secretary, please take us to the next um, order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Budget speech and debate on the details of the Department of Infrastructure Development Budget Vote Number 15 of the Houghton Provincial Appropriation Bill G001 of 2021 for the year 2021-2022 financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Emi Mutara. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Premier and members of the Executive Council, Chief Whip of the Majority Party, leaders of political uh, parties represented in, the, represented in the legislature, honorable members, MMCs and councillors, senior officials of the department led by the HOD, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly a year ago, the world and indeed life as we knew it changed in ways we never imagined. Our normal way of life has since been disrupted. This has also impacted on the delivery of services. It is also 45 years since the youth of 1976 took to the streets in open defiance against an oppressive regime. The gains of that generation cannot and should never go uncelebrated. Honorable Speaker, a youth activist of 1976 is a pensioner today. This means he or she has graduated, gra has grandchildren. We are now in service to change the status quo and create a better their descendants. The youth of today are facing a different set of challenges. We continue to encourage them to stand firm against social injustices, that they be unrelenting in their pursuit of equality, economic, as well as their constitutional rights. Honorable members, the unexpected conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to rethink and urgently review how we do things. While devastating, on the positive side, it has injected the urgency to speed up delivery of our health infrastructure in particular. As a result, we had to reimagine the best solutions to deliver services while ensuring that health and safety regulations are complied with. The pandemic also slowed down the rate of delivery on our non-COVID related infrastructure, but we now are in a recovery mode. In his 2021 State of the Province address delivered in February, Premier David Makura outlined how the province is already leading in the implementation of the Economic Reconstruction Recovery Plan announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the Premier's marching orders are clear when he commented that infrastructure investment, quote, unlock the transformation, modernization, and reindustrialization of the different corridors and districts of our city region, close quote. The new growing Gauteng Together vision it elevates the economy, jobs, and infrastructure as key priorities in line with the National Development Plan. Infrastructure development is enabling us to restore the past injustices and achieve economic and social transformation. Infrastructure delivery is a key driver to reigniting the, econ e the Gauteng economy. It is not an exaggeration to boldly state that infrastructure development is a source of hope and realization of the aspirations of millions of citizens in the province affected by spatial planning, as well as exclusion. The department is committed to the provincial attainment of the creation of 100,000 jobs bringing local suppliers into the construction, maintenance, and property management value chains to enable greater participation of emerging black enterprises. This includes a program to empower 50 emerging black firms, including women and youth. The department is now tasked with leading in the development of the five-year Gauteng Provincial Government Infrastructure Pipeline for the 2019-2024 period, and the publication of the groundbreaking GPG Infrastructure Investment Book, showcasing 1,086 projects with an anticipated investment value of 55.7 billion rand. The book is in the process of being published later this year and will be ready for launch at a date to be communicated soon. Of course, with the advent of COVID and the various budget cuts, we had to delay the publishing of the investment book, rework all the projects that we had initially anticipated to be, to, to be implemented, rework also the investments as well as the state of readiness in terms of what we would publish, and now we are now ready post-COVID to be able to publish that. 
we are known as a landlord for state properties in the province, and our plans to optimize our entire property portfolio to continue serving the development needs of the province, as well as to generate inclusive economic growth. The functions of the department are carried out through three main programs, namely administration, public works infrastructure, and the expanded public works program. The department has been allocated a budget of 3.261 billion rand, of which 79%, which totals 2.573 billion rand, is allocated to public works infrastructure. Included in this allocation is an amount of 171.3 million rand for infrastructure rehabilitation and maintenance of public properties. A total of 446.3 million rand is allocated to administration and 241.8 million rand will fund our expanded public works program. The departmental seven cost drivers contributing to the delivery of it constitutes approximately 93% of the budget allocation, leaving just 7% for the operating costs. The seven cost drivers include rates and taxes, compensation of employees, property leases, infrastructure projects, EPWP, security, as well as soft services. The remaining budget is allocated to other operating costs, which include the provision of tools of trade, ICT systems, G fleet cards, amongst others. An amount of 1.25 billion rand is allocated for payment of rates and taxes to municipality, which we are proud to announce that we do make those transfers timelessly and are therefore one of, one of the paying customers to municipalities. A total of 407 million rand has been set aside for leases, 120.7 million rand for security service and utility payments. Budget is now sitting at 50 million rand. During the next financial year, the department will invest 60 million rand to finalize registration and conveyancing of properties and updating of the provincial asset register. A total of 241.8 million rand is allocated towards poverty relief through our short-term employment program carried out through the NYS. The impact of the COVID crisis on construction companies, in particular SMMEs, has been extremely drastic. The construction sector is vulnerable to economic circles, to economic cycles, and the eruption of the pandemic, as stated, has affected our non-COVID construction program. The increased health risks related to the pandemic resulted in the shutting down of all construction sites during the lockdown periods. A number of construction companies, subcontractors, general and contract workers, material suppliers were faced with harsh economic hardships. Many companies faced bankruptcies. Equally, our department, our departmental construction program was extremely affected. Some of our live construction sites, which were at various stages of completion, experienced shortages in building materials as factories were non-operational. Others experienced supply delays, increasing costs of raw materials, cash flow challenges, additional costs for security, safekeeping of material and equipment on non-operational sites. Data for the second quarter of 2020 from StatsSA showed the construction sector also experienced a decline. Furthermore, the quarterly labor force survey reported that the construction sector shed 305,000 workers during the second quarter. The dire situation of 2020 compelled Mr. Ronnie Sipika, the chief executive of the Construction Management Foundation, to make the following declaration. The construction sector is in ICU. Closer to home, one of our women contractors, Chwene Matlala of Chwene Matlala Construction from Kharankwa and Tswani, describes the lockdown as the worst period for emerging black construction companies. She is building the Riara Bilwe Child Care Center, and her site was shut down for almost four months during the lockdown. With no income, cash flow challenges, and huge bills to pay, she was stuck in a mountain of debt. She finally returned to site in July 2020. At least she survived. Others, unfortunately, did not. Indeed, Madam Speaker, the state of our sector over the past few months has not been easy. As a result, we had no option but to support some of these construction companies, especially those who had cash flow challenges resulting in non-payment of subcontractors. Some of our sites were turned into conflict zones. Our officials spent many hours resolving conflicts and enabling most sites to resume work successfully after the lockdown. Furthermore, the lockdown, coupled with existing challenges such as delays in approvals of compensation events, poor contractor performance, late payments, budget readjustments, and community unrest, drastically impacted on our completion dates. Faced with these unprecedented challenges, we had no option but to revise the 2020-2021 annual performance plan to align with the revised budget adjustments. Despite these challenges, the performance of many contractors started improving towards the end of the second quarter, of the, of the year due to the relaxation of the lockdown regulations. 
As we speak, we are still not yet out of the woods. The COVID-19 regulations may have been relaxed, but our construction sites are still facing many COVID risks and remain vulnerable to the pandemic. We urge all our contractors to maintain stringent occupational health and safety measures in order for our construction sites not to be turned into COVID-19 super spreaders. Madam Deputy Speaker, despite all these challenges, it is not all doom and gloom. Most of our delayed project projects are now stages of completion and are now being handed over once completion certificates have been granted. We are proud that when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, the department also joined thousands of frontline workers in expanding the health infrastructure. We contributed immensely in saving many lives, with a total of 3,922 bed capacity being planned and to date 3,280 beds being completed 2,572 have been handed over to the client. We have completed 500 bed spaces at the Chris Honey Paraguanath Hospital. And these are in addition to those that we refurbished within the hospital. Dr. George Mukari Academic Hospital has 300 beds. The Anglo Ashanti Hospital has over just over 180 beds. These have been completed and handed over to the Department, Department of Health for operationalization. And discussions for the, the and, and we are now concluding the donation process of the hospital to the province. At the Jubilee Hospital, we have delivered 300 bed spaces, and in Kopanong Hospital, we will complete the building of the 300 ICU bed capacity at the, at the Kopanong Hospital. The department had to also decommission the Nazrek Field Hospital owing to the additional in, in house capacity we created. Deputy Speaker, what informs the new mandate and strategy of the department are the six priorities focused on the following key programs, namely optimize public owned fixed property portfolio, efficient and effective, efficient and effective smart infrastructure, infrastructure, increase contribution of infrastructure, infrastructure spend, infrastructure spend social spend, economic spend. development, poverty relief and improved employability of EPWP participants, capable, ethical and, deve and a developmental organization. A snapshot of our priorities are as follows. In terms of the outcome one, which was around the optimized public owned fixed property portfolio, the development of a provincial property optimization strategy has long been overdue. We are pleased to report that the strategy will now become a reality. We have begun the process to engage external support to assist in crafting clear outcomes on the optimization of Gauteng provincial government's fixed property portfolio before the end of the second quarter. The revised political mandate at the start of this term positions the department as the landlord of many of the public buildings in the province. Our custodianship role place, uh, places a responsibility on us to ensure that all immovable assets in the asset register are complete, recorded accurately, and disclosed in correct values. For the current financial year, a total of 7,030 properties has been verified, and the department plans to verify an additional 8,279 immovable properties. This property portfolio represents an asset class with many potential, with a lot of potential for economic transformation. It is for that reason that we plan to realize a total of 19 properties for socioeconomic purposes during this process. The department will actively seek to develop partnerships and to contract with property development and management companies that are women, youth, or people with disability owned, thus contributing to the transformation of the property sector. A total of 300 non-core properties are planned to be disposed in the sixth administration through public auctions. The Kopanong Precinct Project is a major Gauteng Provincial Government office portfolio within the central corridor of the province and consists of 17 existing buildings and one greenfield site, which is the old location for the Bank of Lisbon building. The precinct is currently at completion phase of procurement and work for phase A will commence during the fourth quarter while phase B in 2024. The department is currently engaging stakeholders, including the inner city property owners and the community who, who will be affected. In terms of outcome, in terms of outcome three, on functional, reliable, reliable and compliant infrastructure, we took a decision to use condition assessments as a management tool to ensure that our buildings are compliant. The condition assessment also enables us to implement a consistent maintenance program. The departmental comprehensive maintenance strategy and operating model is focused on ensuring 80% of maintenance work is preventative, while 20% remains reactive. We have thus taken a decision to undertake condition-based assessments, as well as occupational health and safety, and safety work in 10 prioritized hospitals. We are finalizing a revised comprehensive maintenance strategy and operating model, which will focus on ensuring that the that 
the remaining hospitals are also OHS compliant. Oh, nice. I wish to announce that we are working towards ensuring that new buildings are designed and constructed to achieve four star green star four star green star SA rating in order to comply with the Gauteng green building policy. The policy sets guidelines to ensure that all GPG building new and existing are designed or retrofitted to be energy, water and waste efficient. We are planning to conduct Green Star audits on our buildings and register products for auditing with the Green Building Council of South Africa. In terms of poverty, relief and improved employability of EPWP participants, we have we recruit we have recruited 2500 EPWP and NYS participants this year. We'll train and skill them both internally and externally in identified opportunities through what we call the incub contractor incubation program. And in terms of the capable ethical and developmental organization, we are encouraging participation by all relevant stakeholders in improving the audit outcomes, governance and accountability. No, internally. No, see, thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Honorable Speaker of the House and the Deputy Speaker, Honorable Leader of Government Business, Members of the Executive Council, Chief Whip of the Majority Party, 72 Honorable Members of the Legislature, People of Gauteng. Madam Deputy Speaker, we debate Budget 15, I mean Budget Vote 15 of the Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management today. Less than 48 hours of commemorating 29 years of the Bipato massacre. If this August House, I had in my speech said, and I quote, as I travel back home, I still drive on the street in which people of Bipato were maimed at the crack of dawn. Close quote. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is against this quote that I dedicate budget debate to survivors and victims of the Bipato massacre. The budget vote we're debating has set out clear programs that needs to be achieved. We agree that there are some challenges with the department. However, the feedback we receive both formally and informally gives an indication that the MEC and the HOD are moving in the right direction in ensuring that there's a sense of agency in the department in regards to the three programs of the department. Madam Deputy Speaker, during the sitting yesterday, Member Mabala of the EFF had apologized for not being in the house because she was under the weather. Well, I suppose her claim was not true, as we all witnessed her unbecoming behavior during the vote for a uh, budget debate. It has since emerged, Deputy Speaker, that she did not have a clean red overalls. Hence, she opted to lie that she was under the weather. 10th of June 2021, MEC Mamabolo jokingly said that he has never of the Democratic Alliance quoting any revolutionaries when they make speech in the House. Well, MEC Mamabolo, I have since thought about it and I have come to realize that members take beautiful and intelligent lady of integrity will never quote HFR vote in this city. I do not see member Ramulifo preparing his speech and quoting Magnus Malan. My being can't believe that member Chabalala can ever quote that racist called PW board. House can never imagine member Anna the poet quoting John Foster. Let alone bring a smart and independent thinker like member More quoting DF Malan. Oh. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm willing to bet pound of my flesh and assure this house that the golden ball with the 1.4 million can definitely be here quote JG Strado. Madam Deputy Speaker, during the budget vote for debate. On Wednesday, Member Bloom boastfully told us that he has been in the legislature since 1994. If my math is correct, this makes him, Member Bloom, to have 27 years' experience of how legislature functions. What is disappointing is that in the 27 years that Member Bloom has, he has nothing to show. If Member Bloom was a professional boxer, he would have been the worst in the history of the sport. 
He did not only end there, Madam Deputy Speaker. He arrogantly and in his myopic character told the people of Gauteng, some of them being uh, voters of the DA and others being members of the DA, that the ANC government wasted money by refurbishing the hospital in the West End. In his own words, he says the money that was spent by the ANC led government uh, in the West End was spent in the wrong end of Gauteng. It is not surprising that he thinks of the people of restaurant being in the wrong part of the province. This is the man who likes to tell his own stories and imaginations about calls that he gets from citizens of Gauteng looking for to, to help when he disregard them as the human beings. The people of Westrand, you have heard it from Member Bloom himself, that you don't deserve anything good from the ANC government because of your geographic and that the Democratic Alliance in Gauteng believes that any development in the West End is a waste of money. Well, Member Bloom, President Mandela says, and I quote, one of the most difficult things in order, is, one of the most difficult things is not to change society, but to change yourself. Member Bloom, the time has come to change. Leave the legislature and allow young, black and gifted people to come into the legislature. We're extremely tired. Madam Deputy Speaker, infrastructure is not only directly contributing factor to any in the standard of living for communities. It also reduces or reduces poverty levels and address inequalities, but it also a key driver in creating an environment that is conducive to economic development, growth and job creation. Over and above the allocated infrastructure budget from provincial treasury, the department will continue to consider projects that will be ready for delivery on the ground post the tabling of the budget. This is ensure that the greater efficiency on spending is sustained and that more and better outputs and outcomes are achieved with fewer resources. Madam Deputy Speaker, one of the ANC Lekhota resolutions which took place in February 2021 is to further make a clarion call to enhance access for infrastructure development to encourage and attract the communities on massive poverty allevi alleviation projects within our province for the benefit and the poor of the working class. I therefore thank the opportunity, Madam Speaker, to address this house during this difficult time of COVID-19 pandemic. We support the budget, the of infrastructure development and property Thank management you. without any hesitation. Thank, Thank you. you. Stop abusing the procedure. <laughs> uh, Honorable Fuchs. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as the Democratic Alliance, we are extremely sensitive to the fact that the inability of DI. Mm -hmm. With budget, seriously impacts on service delivery, job creation, and opportunities in life. There are many politicians who have accurately identified the lack of skill and expertise in the public sector as the major cause of poor infrastructure outcomes. Allow me to quote one such politician, and it'd be interesting to see if you can guess who it is. This person said, and I quote, 25 years into our democracy, we still face major challenges in ensuring that infrastructure projects are implemented in such a manner that provides value for money and achieves the best results from the money spent. Carry on with the quote. Too many of our projects are characterized by numerous cost and scope changes due to poor planning as well as poor contract management. Consequence management is necessary when service providers fail to perform and the contracting and local employment is managed, contributes to further delays and poor performance, unquote. Anybody know who said that? Well, let me tell you, this is a speech from our MEC for Finance, who candidly evaluated the quality of infrastructure implementation without resorting to the whitewash and propaganda we have become accustomed to from DID. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is evident, but the reality not performing even before the pandemic hit us. And we have statistics to show that. There are numerous projects that could not be completed in the last financial year. So the budget for this year should respond to certain imperatives. It should provide sufficient raw resources to complete the uh, projects, to progressively contribute towards plugging the gap left by personnel vacancy rates of almost 25%, to provide additional resources to manage our fixed assets and tackle any new projects that are planned. In addition, 
chair in this time of unprecedented unemployment. The budget should be responding to the need to create additional temporary jobs via EPWP. So how does it respond? What is absolutely galling and counterintuitive is a reduction in the budget of EPWP of 21%. And this in the face of the fact that the department is not able to meet its empowerment targets for youth and people with disabilities, while the procurement budget for these vulnerable groups has also decreased. And there is the increase in the MEC of, wait for it, 67%. The failure to provide a proper explanation for this huge increase could even conclude that the additional budget is provided as an inducement for certain voters to put their crosses in a certain position on the ballot paper. This is something we often see in pre-election ANC budgets. The maintenance budget chair has been decreased by 12%. And this in an environment where the occupational health and safety projects in our hospitals did not get off the ground last year, and the quality of maintenance provided by DID is roundly criticized by departments. Then there is the negligible increase in the budget for immovable asset management, insufficient to create any discernible difference in the ability to manage assets under the custodianship of the department. I'm amazed that the Premier and the MEC swan around as if they are doing a great job, when in reality, the situation on the ground depicts wastage, inefficiency, and misery as a result of a loss of hope and increasing lack of trust in government. We in the DA would supplement the expertise in the department, appointing competent people, irrespective of their race, and driving value for money. It is unconscionable that the taxpayers of Gauteng continue to pick up the bill for this government's lack of expertise and poor policy choices. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do this. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do this. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do this. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do this. I'm not sure if Nitaulo lo ba balla miralo ya mitawo ya sechaba e ho tswenke ya bopetho e mali ya moruo ya sejwale jalo lo ntshafatsa industry Department of Infrastructure Development and many other government departments are renting buildings but the mandate is to build manage and maintain public infrastructure Petho ho petho e maka ya moruo e ka ba ha e ba le fapha le ka ikemela le u phisa ho yetsa mosebetsi wa lona ka ho qala khampani ya ka ho ya mo dira ba sebetsi le ba ka medi ka ho ka ho sa feeling em pa muso wa ANC o rata di tender ka hona sena fiketse sa yetsa ha Charlotte Mantag Academic Hospital remain closed because this department has failed its in responsibilities to ensure the engaging infrastructure is fixed on time there are shortage of school in the province because department and is in its mandate. They even went to build a school on a wet land as an indication of how pathetic they are. The over-reliance of service providers to perform what should be a primary function of infrastructure development leaves it vulnerable to loss with irregular expenditure and corruption. As it's speaker, this department is eventually defended of losses. It are far back as 2009 and not yet been finalized. This is because of their reliance on outsiders through the tendering system, which comes back to bite them. As such as the EFF reject budget vote 50 because they are not a plan target for 2021-2022 financially, nor why does the department mention its intention to occur only building for the client departments. This main department will continue to rent from the greedy capitalist whose aim is to make profit. No way does the department make mention of established owned construction companies to build and maintain state properties. The first mine will continue to empower those capitalists through the leasing of properties to accommodate government departments. Program two remains the core mandate of this department and decrease of 1% budget allocation will not make us to dance and celebrate because we have decreased the payment of properties that have been leased as well as decrease in rates and taxes. The fact remains and still buildings, what stops 
or stop you from own, owning your own properties and generate own revenue. Speak. The tendering system are corruption and synonymous. Your ranks can attest to that. The system is corruptible. Our free advice as a EFF is to abolish the use of tenders and build state capacity and establish state owned companies to do perfect government work. Government under the NC has become a cash cow for greedy politicians and private individuals alike. With a budget allocation of 3.26 billion in this financial year, which we are expected to support today, the departments must tell. Department must tell the people of Gauteng how many of the government buildings are there in the province, which are not being put to good use. Yet, money is used for the security. Some of it can be used in quarantine site during this period of the pandemic, as you see, good in South Africa. Number 12, not so long ago, the three fighters perished while trying to extinguish a fire in one of their buildings. That was declared unsafe. A case was opened with the subs against the MC. As the EFF, we reject this budget. Nyabonga speak. Thank you, Honorable Mufama. Honorable uh, Adams, sorry. Honorable, yeah, yeah, yeah. Honorable Tilange. Okay, uh, let's move on to Honorable Adams. I am all right, Deputy. You're right, Thank okay. Much, Honorable Diaga. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Department of Infrastructure Development is the implementing agent for health, social development, and educational projects, and can make a difference in the lives of so many people to access opportunities. Sadly, 27 years later, and for many people living without running water, without electricity, or where students study for exams or do their homework by candlelight, not much has changed at all. When ECD centers and libraries are not completed on time or runs over budget, it means that there are young children deprived of the right to be to study in a conducive environment. When Ristafal Secondary or Nansville Primary Schools are battening to get off the starting blocks, completed on time or run over bu uh, budget, we hear the same excuses while thousands of learners still walk for miles to the nearest school, too tired to stay focused because there is no political will in this department to ensure a better life for those learners it was meant to benefit. When a clinic or rehab facility is not completed in time, or within budget, it is the community members of that area that will have to walk miles to the nearest uh, clinic because processes were not followed and projects are being delayed. Kutsong Clinic in Extension 2 is an example. Now in a state of disrepair because the project was abandoned by the co uh, contractor. Failure to complete or upgrade hospitals like Anglo Shanti or Kopenang on time means that there are communities that will hospital meant to provide and care for the services that people deserve. Deputy Speaker, it is a disgrace that this department cannot pay service providers within 30 days. Failure to pay on time only means that there are businesses at risk of closing as more people become jobless and the department does not care about our people. Failure to, be, to meet EPWP targets means that families go hungry and much needed upskilling does not happen because you don't care. Recently received a call from Tinsualo Merleng, a owner of an SMME and subcontractor at George Mukare Hospital. She has not been paid since March 21 for work she has done, but the contractor unilaterally changed the rates. The partner knows about this, and while they have held a public meeting last Friday on SMMEs, women, youth, etc., they still have not done anything to assist this young black female entrepreneur. Failure for DID to maintain infrastructure in terms of Guillermo means that market-related rent cannot be collected, or worse, as with the Bank of Lisbon, but, uh, results in loss of lives. Rest assured that change is coming on 27 October. The voters, voters will punish your irresponsible behavior. Deputy Speaker, the Democratic Alliance is the only political party that openly fights for equality for all the people, galvanized in our values of freedom, Enough for all the people. While you continue to enrich yourself, we will continue to fight for to fight for projects to be continuously and within budget, even though you don't care. Thank you, honourable member. Honourable Makakula.
Emasan, Deputy Speaker. Mamchogo, please unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh. All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier of Gang, members of the Executive Council, Chief Whip of the Majority Party, Honorable Members of the Legislature, and the people of Gauteng at large. Madam Deputy Speaker and members of the Legislature, infrastructure is a critical economic catalyst in Gauteng. Hence, the importance of this debate based on the efficiency of infrastructure for development. This, Madam Deputy Speaker, is an indication to our commitment for the GGT 2030, when we stated that infrastructure would be central in us delivering a modernized, re-industrialized, and integrated <laughs> economy of housing. So, Honorable members, the Department of Infrastructure Development is in line with the strategic priorities of the national and provincial government plan. Hence, the performance of the department, even though... There's some, excuse me, Mamtoko, second. There's some interruption. Please, somebody, please mute. The British of Chess, I mean, Chief of Chess. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 the project implemented by the department. It is a cause for concern that a number of projects have been delayed due to, to the problems from the side of the contractors in some instances. Madam Deputy Speaker, the department on its budget vote for 2020-21 financial year make a commitment to improve drastically to achieve the target targeted goal for the service delivery, despite the challenges animated from the contractors' difficulties to complete the projects on time. We also like to call upon the department to interfere strategically with the security closer to manage the disruption of projects by community extortionist groups. Our commitment to empowering the Africans cannot be held hostage by the so-called subcontractors who have stopped a number of projects in respective regions and where the project taking place because of their selfishness and demonstrate arrogancy towards the purpose of the ANC government initiative for sustainability. The ANC has taken a dim view of lack of spending of allocated funds to the envisage projects. We welcome the strengthening of the human resource capacity within the department by appointing a relevant personnel during this financial year 2020-21. We hope this will help in managing the projects such that no more underspending will be realized for the intended projects. The department's focus on building local economic capacity in in commendable is commendable. Hence, we have noted that pro poverty alleviation, fighting inequality, and unemployment remain at the center of the strategic priorities of the department. The DIT has focused on implementation of job creation initiatives for the previously disadvantaged vulnerable groups, youth, women, people with disability, and military veterans which means it, it dedicated its focus on addressing reality within our communities. The allocation of budget for procurement of goods and services to women-owned companies is in line with the SOPA 2020-21 financial year imperative that focuses on revitalization of township economy and empowerment of SMMEs through mainstreaming of women and other previously disadvantaged sectors in the department's procurement processes. 
During the quarter under review, the cumulative analysis of procurement spent to contribute towards the triple BEE program resulted in the achievement of cumulative targets on SMMEs, Black people and Black women. The, the procurement channeled towards military veterans class remains a challenge. However, the department continues to make appointments to these firms through maintenance panel. It was also a challenge during this period to monitor and collect information regarding the subcontracting since projects could not resume because of the pandemic, which affected us all badly. Honorable members, we are also pleased to announce that the DID obtained an unqualified audit opinion. The department reported that it has established an audit war room to strengthen accountability by management, ensure that audit actions and plans are adequate and effective, increase the reliability of information reported on, F, on AFS and performance information and finalization of audits without delays. The department further reported that the internal control will in future review the process of preparing the financial statements and review them before a submission to the Auditor General. Departments are therefore really encouraged to place a dedicated focus on undertaking all the required planning processes and provide the portfolio of evidence to enable Gauteng Provincial Treasurer to allocate more funding for infrastructure. This requires that departments undertake due to delinquents during planning phases, apply credible prioritization criteria, develop business cases that adequately address all the planning issues, and that the capacity and capability to implement efficiently and effectively exist. The ANC-led government reaffirms its commitment to working with and supporting persons with disability by improving the accessibility of, of public facilities to persons with disabilities, including extending the campaign for accessibility to the private sector, as they are also benefiting from the government, but without plowing back anything. In conclusion, I therefore support this budget uh, a vote uh, 15 of the Department of D D Infrastructure Development with the intention to move South Africa forward. I thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Honorable Makakula. Honorable MC Mutara. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to honorable members who have um, supported the budget, as well as um, those who have um, have debated on the, the budget vote debate for the Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management. Deputy Speaker, I think um, it's imperative to, to state that I would have been one of the first to raise some of the shortcomings and challenges that the department faces. Part of them is internal capacity. Part of them is our um, inability or, or, or our shortages, shortcomings in terms of the planning processes. We have also addressed our capacity challenges and begun to address our capacity challenges. And I'm not sure when Honorable Fuf says that we sugarcoat them or we, prop we have problems. Uh, um, we raise propaganda to be able to cover up all our problems. I'm not sure that I've done that. I've also said that part of the big challenges that we face as the in, as infrastructure as a whole, not just Department of Infrastructure Development, but all our infrastructure, public infrastructure in the province and even nationally, is that over a long period of time, we have minimized spending on maintenance and even shifted budgets from maintenance to deal with either CAPEX or um, to do to deal with other competing priorities. As a result, we have buildings and assets that are beyond um, maintaining, and they actually need to be disposed of. 
and that creates a huge problem. We've also uh, begun discussions with at a national tre with national treasury to look at the funding regime of all our projects because the capital um, projects are not funded in the same way as capital projects are funded in municipalities. So there must be a funding regime that reinforces amount for maintenance um, when you have funded um, capex projects and the implementation thereof safe to say chair at, um, sorry um, deputy speaker if i could please ask for the details of um, the the svme who states that they have not been paid i am not familiar with it if i can receive it we can follow up and get um, the client department who is responsible those that we pay ourselves, we are able to meet the 30-day 30, 30 payment um, deadlines and we've improved and showed considerable amount of improvement over various quarters and ultimately the financial year. But we do understand, and I think honorable members, especially of the department, do understand that DID um, pays after client departments have also paid. And this payment regime in the province does lend itself to a number of delays. It's not ideal, but it's the situation that we are currently working with. As a result, we've shifted many of our projects, especially CAPEX projects, onto the, um, the e-invoicing system, and that has seen a reduction in time, as well as um, payments being made on time where, where a contractor is able to load the invoices. But where we still have challenges is where we have a, number, a huge number of contractors doing maintenance work on health infrastructure projects, and they are unable um, to load those onto the EIS or the um, e-invoicing system. But we have cons made considerable improvements. Of course, our priorities still remain to black companies, to women-owned companies and youth-owned companies. Especially in the women-owned companies, we've made considerable amount of improvements um, and we've demonstrated those to the department. I think um, without repeating, we have also explained the expenditure um, the cost drivers and the, the inaccurate reporting that has led to what was deemed an increase in the office of the MEC, um, and that was owed to correct um, reporting lines. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you to um, the, the Portfolio Committee and the members of the Legislature who support the, the Infrastructure Department's budget for today. Thank you. Thank you, MEC. Uh, Secretary, please take us to the next order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Consideration of the Road and Transport Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the Department of Road and Transport Vote Number 9 of Houting Appropriation Bill G001 of 2021 for the year 2021-2022. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Schneeman. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I would request that the sections of the report that I do not read uh, be taken as read. Uh, in the current financial year, the committee noted that the department has been allocated a budget of 8 billion rand financed through the equitable share amounting to 5 billion rand or 59% and conditional grants of 3 billion rand uh, or 41%. The committee noted that the budget allocation increased by an amount of 302 million rand or 3.61 percent compared to the previous financial year. The committee further noted that the budget allocation for administration, transport infrastructure, transport regulation and transport operations programs were increased in the current financial year, whilst the allocated budget for the car train was decreased by 269 million rand or 10 percent. The committee is concerned over the decrease of the allocated budget for the agency, noting the downward trend in rail and bus passenger trips, which result in higher than projected patronage guarantee costs having to be paid. The committee is of the view that the agency needs to pay more attention to interventions which may assist in increasing rail and bus passenger trips as the continuous downward trend may result in delays in the implementation of planned infrastructure and maintenance projects in the current and next financial years. On the implementation of infrastructure mm -hmm. projects, the committee noted that the department has planned to implement several projects in line with the Integrated Transport Management Plan 2024 and the growing Gauteng 
sorry, and the growing uh, GGT 2030, consisting of projects carried over from the previous financial year and multi-year projects to be completed within the MTF period. The projects include the projects include the design, construction, and maintenance of provincial roads, integration of public transport modes such as road and rail through integrated fare management systems and the strengthening of freight and logistics mm -hmm. hubs. The committee further noted that the construction of King driver testing centers and the transport operating license administrative bodies for Enneking Taxi Rank and the K46 William Nickel Road have not been allocated a budget in the current financial year. According to the department, budget allocations will be requested from Treasury during the adjustment budget in line with the state of business. The committee is concerned over the continuous delays in the above mentioned as construction thereof has been halted for more than two financial years. And this may result in higher than expected budget requirements due to the deteriorating state of the work performed so far in all of these projects. On the subsidized bus contracts, the committee noted that the department has planned to advertise three subsidized bus contracts and appoint operators in the finan current financial year in Soweto, Amund's Kroll, Tembisa, Sakani, and Force du Risk, whilst the other five contracts are planned for 2022-2023 uh, financial years. According to the department, all these contracts will be monitored by super supervisory monitoring firms through the installation and opera operationalization of electronic monitoring systems. On the Gauteng Management Agency, the, co the committee noted that due to the downward trend in rail and bus passengers, which grave rise to increase in the passenger patronage costs, the agency has decided to hold the acquisition of pre-owned rolling stock from the United Kingdom. The committee welcomes the decision by the agency uh, noting the current conditions which have an impact on the plans and operations of the system, both to the agency and the operating company. However, the committee would urge the agency to ensure that planned infrastructure and maintenance projects are not compromised as the delay, the, as the delayed implementation thereof may result in increased future budget requirements. With regards to the G Fleet management, the committee noted that the approved budget for the entity amounts to 794 million rand for the current financial year, marking an increase of 141 million rand or 18% compared to the previous financial year. In terms of the approved budget per program, the committee noted that the entity realizes its mandate through two programs, named administration with an allocated budget of 125 million and operations with an allocated budget of 668 million. In conclusion, the, co the committee urges the commit the department and its entities to exercise proper project and contract management and maintain a high level of efficiency and effectiveness in delivering on key infrastructure projects so as to avoid so as to avoid irregular expenditure and delays in infrastructure projects due to lack of, lack of internal controls. I then turn to the concerns and recommendations of the portfolio committee. The, the committee is concerned about the continuous delays in the implementation of the Sebo King DLTC, the Ferenachung Tax Rank, and the K46 William Nickel Road, as they have been delayed for more than two financial years, and the province had to seek additional budgets due to the already deteriorated state of these projects on the work that had been previously com completed. The, the committee is also concerned about the decrease in the allocated budget of the Gaar Train Management Agency, noting the rising patronage guarantee costs due to lower rail and bus passengers in the previous and current financial year due to the COVID-19 lockdown. In terms of recommendations, the committee recommends that the department should provide a detailed report by the 30th of July on the following one, on the progress made in finalizing, in finalizing intervention plans and commencement of construction of the Sebo King DLTC, the Ferenachung Taxi Rank, and the K46 William Nicol Road. The report shall also include the proposed budget requirements that will be requested from Treasury in the adjusted budget period for the 2021-2022 financial year for the above mentioned projects. Further, in terms of recommendations that on the proposed sources of funding, 
for the increasing patronage guarantee costs, noting the downward trend in rail and, passenger and bus passenger trips. The report should also indicate the financial impact the proposed sources of funding may have on the implementation of planned infrastructure and maintenance projects within the car train system. I would like to then, as I finally conclude, acknowledge the support and the uh, participation of MEC Mamabolo, his HOD and the team from the department in this particular process, as well as the car train management agency and the G fleet, fleet management. Uh, thanks and appreciation also goes to honorable members, members Kikana, R. Kikana, member Dili Dwaba, member A. Ndlobana, member P. Mabunda, member F. Nell, member E. Dupusi, member M. Ludwaba, and member N. Khadebe for their deliberations and commitment during the budget process. At this stage, I would also like to uh, wish member Dupusi and his family a speedy recovery as they uh, recover and res are restored to full health after having uh, contracted COVID-19. Uh, and also on behalf of the committee, we would also want to express our appreciation to the committee support team for their help and assistance during this particular process. In terms of Rule 1172C, read together with Rule 164, the Portfolio Committee on Roads and Transport recommends that the report on Budget Vote 9 of the Appropriation Bill for 2021-2022 be adopted, taking into account the concerns and recommendations tabled in this report. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Greg. Is there a seconder? I second, uh, Deputy Speaker. Is that Member Nelly? Who's seconding? Yes, Deputy okay. Speaker, it's Member Nelly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now put a question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, the ayes have it. The report is adopted. Thank you. Secretary, please take us to the next order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Budget speech and debate on the details of the Department of Roads and Transport vote number nine of the Houting Appropriation Bill G001 of 2021 for the year 2021-2022. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable M. Ms. Mamabulo, yes, come in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Let me greet uh, the Honorable Premier all the MECs, the chief whip of the majority party, the only chief whip in the house, members of the portfolio committee, honorable members, uh, all our transport stakeholders, uh, the residents of Gauteng province. And let me join the House in conveying our sincere condolences to Honorable Lasindra and the family. Honorable members, I am deeply honored to present to this August House the 8.6 billion budget outlining our priorities for this financial year and of course laying the basis for the period ahead. Premier David Makura has outlined a clear way forward for the Houting Provincial Government when he tabled the State of the Province address that is SOPA. In his address, Honorable Premier focused the Houting Provincial Government on the priorities stated in the strategic perspective and roadmap of the province that is known as Growing Houting Together 2030. As a department, we presented and unveiled our strategic vision of Growing Houting Together through Smart Mobility 2030. 
This is our decisive contribution to the provincial blueprint of Growing Houghton Together 2030. I am therefore pleased to present this budget speech to demonstrate how the priorities of Growing Houghton through smart mobility advances and take forward the implementation and realization of the strategic goals embedded in Growing Houghton Together 2030. Simply put, we seek to demonstrate strategic alignment and cohesion. Let me remind honorable members, the strategic significance of transport in the economy and society in general, and this is well captured and articulated by that world renowned revolutionary scholar, Karl Marx. When he wrote in Capital Volume 2, open quote, the transport of products from one place of production to another is part of the finished products from the sphere of production to the sphere of consumption. The product is ready for consumption only when it has completed this movement, close quote. I would like to draw, to draw the attention of members to the movement from the sphere of production to consumption, including the transportation of the labor required in the two spheres. Honorable members, I would like to dedicate this budget speech to the youth of 1976 and to recommit to meet the ideals and aspirations of the youth of today. We dare not fail them. In our commitment to grow out and through smart mobility, we are aligned the following five core pillars of the roadmap, and this are building strong institutions, transport as a catalyst for economic growth, counting as a freight and logistic hub, and the data-centric mobility. Honorable members, as we present this budget, we take into account the fact that we are in the third wave of COVID-19, with the numbers in our process very fast. Just like the people of the world, we are faced with the challenge of the pandemic, threatening human life on the one hand. Whilst on the other, we face the threat of economies functioning far below their capacity. That is economic depression that may lead to a full-blown economic recession. We therefore need to survive these two equally important threats to human life. Economic depression, the pandemic. As you may be aware, we have conducted a detailed and comprehensive transport household survey that clearly indicates that the cost of travel in our province is high and is hard hitting on the working class and the victims of the legacy of apartheid spatial planning. This is without doubt worsened by the cost imposed on housing households by the e tolling system. We remain the highly tolled province and also carrying the cost and burden of national roads that serve the economy and linking it to global markets. I would therefore like to reaffirm the call of the provincial government of the people of our province, of revolutionary forces in this province led by the Alliance, calling for the scrapping of it tolls. We are firm in our call because we believe that the e tolls are a very big burden on the fiscals because they have not met their targets to generate the required revenue to fund and maintain new and, of course, existing roads. The e tolls in their current form violate the user pay principle because we see people coming from uh, neighboring states coming from provinces all over the country, driving on the same road, not paying. And therefore, this is not consistent with user pay principle. We also believe that um, the e-tolls constitute a serious punishment on those people that have already suffered the legacy of apartheid spatial planning. And it is for that reason that without fear, favor, or doubt, we are very clear and reaffirm the position that the e-tolls are not part of the way forward in this province 
and should be scrapped. Honorable members, in line with Smart Mobility Vision, we have made a commitment to build strong institutions. I am pleased to announce that we have appointed three Deputy Director Generals in the positions of Chief Financial Officer, Deputy Director General Roads, and Deputy Director General Transport Services. It is for the first time since 2016 that these positions were all filled. In other words, the top layer of the department stable since 2016. This team is joining the HOD Makuku Mampuru, whose appointment I announced during the tabling of the annual report. Honorable members, our top layer of leadership is now stable, and this is with effect from this month of June. To that extent, honorable members, I'm pleased to say, promise made, promise kept, as we did say we will do so before the end of the, third, of the first quarter in this financial year. Honorable members, as part of building institutions, we committed ourselves to appoint the Transport Authority of Gauteng to lead integrated transport planning in full cooperation with municipalities. I'm therefore pleased to announce that we have appointed the board. It has held its induction and handover processes. It is planning its first strategic vision in September this year. Let me say, honorable members, promise made, promise kept, as we said. I'm also pleased to confirm and reaffirm that how train management agency, GMA, remains one of the best run, most stable, and offering state-of-the-art best practices on governance, leadership, and ethical management. We are pleased that G Fleet, that manages the GPG fleet, is showing great signs of improvement and organizational stability. We are now able to announce our internal turnaround and repositioning of the department as correctly articulated in the slogan, constructing today, tomorrow. In other words, we are building the internal capacity of the department to drive and propel smart mobility to grow the routing economy and enhance the quality of life of the people as our outcome and most critical area of impact. We are working hard with the Office of the Premier to conclude the organizational structure before the end of this financial year. Honorable members, we are on track to build the Department of Tomorrow today. As part of building smart institutions, we have committed to improve our driver learning testing centers. In the short term, we identified alleged acts of corruption as manipulating and interfering with the online booking system. We committed to appoint a forensic investigation team to crack this corrupt practice to improve the availability of slots. I am pleased to announce that we have now appointed uh, Le Qua Forensic Company as a decisive intervention in this regard. They just started their work this week on Monday. Promise made, promise kept. In the medium term, we are rolling out smart queue management solution to all our DLTCs to track real life performance of personnel at every given moment, the performance of the equipment and machinery on a real life platform. Members of mayoral committees responsible for DLTCs have agreed that we roll out this technology across the length and breadth of our province. Honorable members in the long term, we have appointed the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research CSIR, working with Girotech, a commercial arm of AMSCO, to help us with better solutions to resolve this crisis moving forward. They will be presenting us with a project plan that will see us leveraging smart technologies to resolve this matter. We are working with national government, in particular, the Road Traffic Management Cooperation, RTMC, and we have brought on board how train um, to resolve this matter. As we said, we want to uh, create driver license renewal kiosk in how train uh, train stations. Honorable members, in the smart mobility vision, we committed ourselves to reposition Houting as a catalyst for economic growth. 
Premier David Makura announced a number of special economic zones as a strategic intervention to grow the Gauteng economy. We have placed roads infrastructure at the core of the special economic development zones. I am pleased to announce that we have identified 18 high capacity arterial roads as a lever to support special economic zones. We have introduced and unveiled just last year the Transport Infrastructure House as the virtual in-house capacity to ensure effective and efficient delivery of road infrastructure. We are leveraging smart technologies, including the use of drones to monitor construction sites. We will be unveiling our drone program formally and demonstrating its results and capacity in July. The drones are already on the ground, honorable members, constructing a baseline of our construction, and we will get a report and unveil it to the people of the province. Honorable members, I'm pleased to announce that we are working with 12 private property developers to support their multi-billion projects to support the economy. In two weeks, we'll commence with visits and roadshows to all these 12 pri private property developer sites to showcase the roads we'll be building, but also these 18 high capacity roads. And of course, we will be indicating the status of these projects and giving real information on the arteria and high capacity roads. We are pleased to announce that by the end of July this year, we'll be rolling out the single integrated automated smart project templates that seeks to transform and turn around the project management environment. We seek to ensure that our service, uh, service providers and stakeholders and officials move in one step, sing and read from the same M book on project management discipline. We seek to have a single source of the truth on project management. This will help us to improve the project procurement environment and in car manufacturing, ensure that we build a proper linear pipeline of our transport projects, moving on a single forward moving production. This is a benchmark with the automotive sector. We shouldn't have projects going back and forth in the production of cars on their production bed line. That does not happen. We want to make sure that we don't have projects going back and forth. Transport infrastructure house remains assist with this matter, and as I've said, we have already unveiled this. Honorable members, we announced that we will soon finalize the procurement process for the appointment of the K46 contractor to improve and enhance smart mobility along the Deep Dot and Stain City area. I am pleased to announce that just in the last two weeks, the contractor has been appointed. The contractors assured us that they will establish and take site in mid July. This is a major development for us. Promise made, promise kept. Honorable members, we committed ourselves to deliver state of the art. And I can take the rank. I'm deeply pleased to announce that this game changing project has now been handed over to the How Train Management Agent in the prescription of the How Train Transport Infrastructure Act. I already stated GMA is one of the best institutions when it comes to the state of the art project. And we are confident that come Transport Month, October this year, we will commence with the construction of this very important facility by the see. GMA. Time is up. Thank you. Those I didn't read, I'll treat them as read. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Honorable Nell. It doesn't apply, MEC. You are wrong. It doesn't apply. Deputy Speaker, the people of Gauteng. Yeah, Deputy Speaker, thank you. The people of Gauteng are suffering at the hand of an economy that is not growing to create jobs. So that they and they cannot put food tables as a result. Poverty in our province is deepening, leading to squalor and despair amongst our residents. This is confirmed by the Gauteng Socioeconomic Review Outlook that paints a bleak picture. 
forecasting that a significant proportion of our middle class are on the doorstep of poverty. Although COVID-19 is blamed for this economic regression and bleak outlook, we know that the fundamentals of our economy was already broken before the pandemic. The pandemic highlighted the lack of resilience in our economy and exposed its, finan uh, its fundamental deficiencies. The growth in our province's population is proof that millions of South Africans believe that this is where they can get jobs. The most populous province in South Africa, its population growth rate of about 2.4% is well above the national average. If one looks at our pop, uh, province's population pyramid, the province is in an ideal position to capitalize on a demographic dividend. Transport plays a role in stimulating economic growth. The movement of people and goods enables the velocity of money that grows economies. Considering a growing population and increases in vehicle registrations, Hutting requires a proper integrated approach when it comes to roads and transport. People are generally moved by private vehicles and public transport. However, due to congestion, it affects productivity, the environment and quality of life of hunting citizens. Therefore, one would have expected that this budget would reflect the priorities of an integrated transport plan and movement to a future hunting where transport stimulates the economy instead of throttling it as it does now. Unfortunately, this department has been a victim of its own success. I say that tongue-in-cheek as a success that I'm referring to is the inability of the department in the past to successfully design and build roads, execute crucial maintenance. Because of these successes and resultant underspending, the department's budget was significantly cut in the new financial year, causing further delays in the expansion of transport infrastructure in Gauteng. The lack of prioritization in the roads and transport budget is not going to solve the transport problems of a growing province. By its own projections, and as I have predicted before, this province faces gridlock within the next 15 years. However, it seems that if economic growth returns to pre-pandemic levels, we may achieve gridlock sooner than the projected date of 2037. The transport crunch in Gauteng has already become worse over the past years. Prasa allowed its infrastructure to be pillaged, reducing its network. This pushed more people onto buses, taxis, and private vehicles. ITP of the province recommends rail as a preferred mode of public transport in the province, yet rail expansion receives no budget from the province. Worst of all is that there has been significant decline in rail ridership due to COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the pillaging of our rail infrastructure, and this won't be repaired anytime soon. This budget must reflect provincial pro transport priorities. This budget does not do that. It reduces investment in transport infrastructure, and that cannot be supported from both a, a transport as well as the economic point of view. A DA government would use roads and transport to drive economic growth in the province by providing a tra transport for the fast, safe, reliable, reliable movement of people and goods in the province that is environmentally friendly and promotes human quality of life. Unfortunately, this budget does not do that. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nell. Honorable Litaba. Litaba. Honorable Litaba. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The EFF. As the EFF, we reject this budget. The MEC continues to fail to execute its department's mandate of providing safe transport infrastructure for the people of this province. And yet each year, the budget allocation continues to increase. And this year, the department being allocated a budget of 880 million, 8680 billion, with the budget allocation increasing by 3.61 percent compared to previous financial year. The department has recorded a total of 1.2 billion rand in under expenditure for the 2020-2021 financial year, and yet the budget is yet is set to increase over the next coming years, with all departmental projects contributing towards the under expenditure. The department not only underspends this budget by more than 8%, by its G Fleet agency, also underspends its budget by 10%, clearly exposing the under expenditure. Ooh. 
exposing the under expenditure. What are the of the department under the previous financial this trend in underspend is likely to persist into the following financial year, resulting in the department getting unqualified audit opinions with findings disregarding the Auditor General's recommendation. Honorable Speaker, the Department of Goods and Transport, just like the country, has a serious leadership crisis, which is the reason why the department continues to not deliver services and why entities continue to underperform on their targets. A approved organizational structure in the department, many major vacancies still continue not filled for years, meaning the department is in the ICU. The department continuously makes promises of filling these vacancies, and today there is no moratorium on the recruitment process. Moreover, problems such as the transport operations are lacking senior management roles as the deputy director general. Chief Director and Director further plunges the department into a management crisis. With regard to the transport infrastructure, the department has been failing to allocate budgets for major road infrastructure projects for over two financial years. The construction of Sibuken GLTC, Tolep, Ferenekeng Intermodal Facility, and K46 William Nicol have not been allocated a budget in the current financial year, meaning the projects are going to be delayed once again and deferred to the next financial year. The MEC also promised to deal with the incomplete projects, and yet K46 and K54 remain incomplete. The Ferenikeng intermodal facility is also incomplete. So we can deal is dilapidated, continues to be the appointment of the same PSPs who failed to deliver. The result of this is the paging of senior managers who are overworked by the ANC government. All this points to the fact that the department is failing to miss its targets and obligations and should be brought to its needs. Furthermore, the departments once again failed to secure subsidized bus contracts for the previous financial year, despite having ample time to do so, revealing the level of seriousness that the government of the day awards the committers of this province. The process of appointing new bus contractors has been lagging behind with no noticeable progress since the inception of the revised bus subsidy program. The MEC has lagged on its own deadlines while it has a new bus contract, shopping and changing days as and when it pleases him. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Adams? You're good? Good busy? I'm good, uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm good, thanks. Okay. Uh, Honorable Tupizi? Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Almost each and every road in our province is riddled with potholes, which are increasing by the day, placing a taxing burden on residents who own their own vehicles, as well as those who rely on public transport every single day to get to and from work. This department, which is supposed to oversee the maintenance of our province, province's roads, is doing a dismal job as it's failing to regularly maintain our roads. How, you ask? You see, Madam Deputy Speaker, Honorable MEC Mamabolo, Every time a vehicle hits a pothole in one of our province's roads and their vehicle is damaged, they have to claim from the insurance who pushes up their premiums because they've claimed for damage from one too many a pothole. So the income, which is already stretched too thin, has to be stretched even more because of this government's incompetence. The taxi driver insurance, or if he's working for someone else, is now forced to work overtime, possibly even speed and break the law in order to cover the costs of replacing a tire or fixing the damage done to his vehicle because of the poor state of our roads. You see, the problem is not that there is no money in the budget of this department to fix potholes and maintain our roads. The problem is that tenders are cancelled due to insufficient interest shown, or as the department puts it at times, a lack of transformation in the construction industry. This happens year upon year. The latest reason for not meeting certain targets set by the department, COVID-19. This is an unacceptable excuse as the pandemic and the subsequent lockdown should have been used as an opportunity by the department to start doing the urgent maintenance that is needed to keep our roads in tip-top condition as there was little to no movement during the hard lockdown and there was more than enough time to put adequate social distancing measures in place to ensure everyone's safety. Instead, residents, particularly those living on the Westland, are taking matters into their own hands as they can no longer wait for government to come along and maintain their roads. 
I myself assisted residents in my constituency to fix potholes that had become a danger not only to motorists but also to residents in the area. This is something that needs to be addressed urgently by the department as it is unacceptable that residents are forced to do the job of government when they are paying rates and taxes to government on a monthly basis. Madam Deputy Speaker, another point of contention as we debate this budget is the lack of driver license renewal slots available in the province. While the intention was to eliminate corruption when it came to the process of a res resident obtaining a driver's license, this system is riddled with problems. We have engaged the MEC with, on numerous occasions on possible solutions to this, but these suggestions seem to have fallen on deaf ears. We have been inundated with complaints from residents who are able to renew their licenses, yet it seems that is as if the license slots that are available are being sold to brokers who then sell those slots to residents who still have to wait in long queues before they are assisted. Where we govern in the Western Cape, we do not have this problem with license renewals. You may have to wait in a queue for a while, but there's no online system that they need to use to book a slot. Residents are simply allowed to go to the nearest traffic department and renew their license or book a driver's license test. If there is a the resident is informed and will then receive an SMS as to when they are able to collect their license. Perhaps the MEC can find out how it's done in the Western Cape. Residents in Gauteng are now being turned into criminals because this province cannot sort out a simple problem of driver license testing centres. They are forced to pay more money to a middleman and even then there is no guarantee that they'll get assisted on the date that they've been allocated a date. The reality is that this department is a smaller piece of the budget in the next financial year if the budget is not spent where it's needed most. If critical tenders are not awarded, that is critical to ensuring our roads are kept in tip-top shape, giving us a problem that the most of our goods that we consume on a daily basis is transported by a road. Madam Deputy Speaker, MEC, the DA cannot in conscience support this budget as it does not prioritise key areas where money thank is needed you. most. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. Honourable Litwaba. Honorable uh, She seemed to be having a connection problem. I step in, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Who was that? Uh, Honorable Mabunda. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, 2021 marks the 150th anniversary of Struggle Icon and Human Rights Campaigner Charlotte Makeke. Had she lived, she will be 150 years this year as a way to me memorialize and remember her. Her life story also informs the 2021 theme of Human Rights Month under the theme Growing Youth Employment for an Inclusive and Transformed Society. And equally celebrating a youth month to salute the effort and ideas which the youth of 1976 stood and fought for. The ANC government places the South African people and the people of Gauteng in particular, the center of this concern, with special emphasis to our Ubuntu-based core value, which literally means I am because we are, or humanity towards others, or in Zulu, Umuntu, Umuntu, Ngabantu. In Tsonga, Umunu, Imunu, Iban, President Ramaphosa said, while the, nation, uh, while the nationwide lockdown is having a devastating effect, on our economy, it is nothing compared to the catastrophic human, social, and economic cost that will happen if we cannot depend and speed up economic recovery to resuscitate the infrastructure on roads and transport across the provinces. And in this case, our province is not an exception. The ANC acknowledges and welcomes the appointment of the CFO the DDG Transport and the DDG for Roads in the Department of Road and Transport as part of the department strategy of building institutional capacity that will be able to deliver on the departmental mandate which had, has had challenges in the past. We are confident that these appointments will add value and contribute to ensure the stability and delivery of road infrastructure project in an efficient and effective manner, from project conception to completion within the time, cost, and quality. 
We wish all the appointed officials well in their new responsibilities and their endeavors to turn around the department to achieve the desired objectives in line with the Batupili principles, especially the one of standards in which government departments have service standards which act as a guide when it comes to service delivery uh, with concern of quality. The Provincial Department of Roads and Transport also responded positive, positively to the clarion call by the Premier of Houting uh, to growing Houting together on the roadmap to 2030 as intention to address provincial growth and deve development strategy of the Houting city region to advance the socio-economic transformation agenda to improve roads infrastructure through constant and proactive maintenance and also by ensuring that G Fleet is self sustainable, efficient, and continuously improves on customer satisfaction. Since the 1994 democratic breakthrough, our mission as the ANC in Houting has consistently been to ensure the transformative legislative process in the province aimed at creating an environment that is conducive for effective service delivery, focused on the renewal of governance and the public service in order to increase the confidence of the people in the ANC. Uh, our goal has always been to provide decent roads and transport infrastructure. It is our understanding that roads make a, con con uh, make a crucial contribution to economic development, growth, and bring important social benefits. They are uh, of vital importance in order to make a nation grow and develop. In addition, providing access to employment, social health, and education services, which make road network crucial in fighting against poverty. The presented budget vote of the Roads and Transport Department outlined numerous achievements in the last financial year, despite the COVID-19 challenges, which we all know has in all respect affected the Houting Province and the Department uh, of Roads and Transport or the department was or is no ex exception to, to that effect. The roads and transport department is part of the provincial economic cluster department, which is undertaking extensive work to ensure that it forms part of the priority sectors of the economy that are going to be key drivers of the reconstruction and recovery strategy of the provincial government. The department has now established a transport infrastructure house which has dedicated technical capacity to perform the functions of planning, design, and project management, which has so been of challenge in the department. As the ANC, we are pleased that the construction of phase two of the N14 and R28 that connects the West Rand and the Sedibeng district has been completed while substantial work is underway to patch, rehabilitate, and resurface major roads uh, that were affected by the recent heavy rains in the province, but particularly in the West Rand and Sedibeng districts. The budget vote of the department will further help to ignite uh, the service excellence of the department to provide effective and efficient program to youth, women, and people with disabilities across the, the province. The department investment in public transport infrastructure, logistical hubs, intermodal facilities, rolling stock, buses, and taxi ranks remain paramount importance. Uh, honorable members, the minibus taxi industry plays a critical role in the public transport system of our province. And we have, a long, we have long expressed our intention to stem out the violence and integrate the industry into the comprehensive public transport system. The Commission of Inquiry into Taxi Violence in the Houghton Commences uh, is one of the many of those initiatives which its findings and recommendations has far-reaching consequences uh, for the tax industry in the province. That is a job well done, MEC Mamabulu. You will not know how to deal with the conflict without factual investigation of the root causes of the conflict. In relation to the infrastructure project, project for service delivery performance, the, the 2021 budget vote for the department noted that the program was able to achieve some of the planned targets 
and this including designing of customer service centers, kilometers of surfaced roads rehabilitated, kilometers of surfaced roads re resealed, kilometers of black, black top patching, gravel roads bladed, number of maintenance jobs created as well as way bridges calibrated. Madam Speaker, in relation to the entities under the department, we have noted that both entities were able to achieve most of their planned targets for the financial year. GMA experienced challenges with regard with achieving the real passenger targets for the financial year under review, and this led to the rise in projected patronage guarantee cost. And this is expected to prevail over the MTF period. G Fleet experienced challenges in relation to delays in the installation of tracking systems in service vehicles, turnaround time for vehicle repairs and the implementation of the sustainability model. It remains our view that the oversight committee must strengthen oversight to monitor the set implementation and achievement of targets in the current financial year. Uh, Madam Speaker, the ANC-led government commends the continued level of, perf of performance by the GMA in the current and previous financial years. Regarding the department, we recommend that the level of performance needs to be accelerate, accelerated and oversight by the committee in relation to implementation of infrastructure projects, introduction of new bus contracts and development of the integrated fare management system needs to continue. On the transport infrastructure program, which provides a balanced and equitable road network that is sustainable, integrated, environmental sensitive, and supportive of economic growth and social empowerment, for the program to achieve this, its objectives on the four sub-programs, which is infrastructure planning, infrastructure design, construction and maintenance, we urge the department to utilize the presence of the newly appointed executive management team to intensify the delivery of the strategic plan to implement these major programs for the development of uh, housing residents. The design and construction of the Tambo Springs logistics getaway, which involves created, creating a significantly improved intermodal capability for the movement of freight to and from Houting. This is to be achieved by operational twinning of the getaway with other seaports inland and across border locations. And it must be achieved in this sixth term of uh, your office, MEC, as it will create the opportunity for a multinational cooperation both to serve the metropolitan of Houting, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and KZN uh, markets, and those in the emerging SADC countries. Road transportation is the most frequently used means of transporting goods and people in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Furthermore, because of the region's and the province's geographic nature, where many of the countries are landlocked, imports and exports of goods happen primarily by land and in this case by road transport. In modern society, road infrastructure has become an, in an essential part of daily life. Individual road users, logistic firms and public transportation agencies expect reliable and safe road infrastructure for traveling from one location to the other and transporting goods and people. Road make a crucial contribution to economic development and growth and bring important social benefits. They are of vital importance in order to make a nation grow and develop. In addition, providing access to employment, social health and education services Roads open up more areas and stimulate economic and social development. For these reasons, road infrastructure is the most important of all public assets. Therefore, to preserve the assets, the Housing Department of Roads and Transport will need to continue with preventative maintenance and balance the long-term need to roads assets, which can be applied to the benefit road uh, stakeholders, which we think this budget will achieve. As the ANC, Madam Deputy Speaker, we support the budget vote of the roads and transport to achieve the cost of national, de national democratic revolution for the benefit uh, life of our people and the working class. I thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Mabunda. Honorable Lemisi. 
MSC. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable <coughs> Deputy Speaker. Honorable members, let me thank uh, the points made, but just to say that, um, you know, as part of a smart mobility, uh, growing the economy of Gauteng, we committed ourselves um, to deliver state-of-the-art Ferenagin takes rank, as I said, and that GMA is helping us with that. And that in October, we will go to construction. We committed ourselves, uh, honorable members, to working, of course, with all GPG departments to completely turn around the roads infrastructure in M full learning. We have just concluded and spent 173 million on the M full learning municipality roads. We will be unveiling 21 revamped and improved roads and handing them over to M full learning municipality. We will do so in this month of July, dedicated to our world high contact Nelson Mandela. During that month, we'll hand over the 21 revamped roads to M full learning. Promise made, promise kept. We will, of course, be approaching the executive council of the province uh, to help us with remaining roads. And uh, we hope we will be successful in that regard. Now, honorable members, as part of growing the economy, we have adopted uh, smart mobility weekends to make sure that um, we maintain the road network and so that we can continue to grow the economy. We have been to the city of Jobek and Fulani, Mirafong, Rentwest, and Midval. In actual fact, last weekend, we did full 10 weekends uninterrupted without a break. We have just met with the city of Ekuruleni, Mohali City, and we will be meeting with Lisedi and, of course, the city of Tswani. And to this extent, we have kept the promise we have made to embark on work to fix the roads and to uh, patch potholes, and therefore promise made, promise kept. Honorable members, I'd like to also say that um, we are working with AXA to make sure that we reposition our province as the internal hub of logistics. Premier David Makura led us to the meeting to drive aerotropolis, and we are ready with the roads uh, to make sure that we drive this. This includes promoting and building completing Tambo Springs Terminal, which Honorable Mabunda spoke about, on the N3, and of course the pyramid south intermodal freight in the city of Tswani. I also want to announce that how train, as you know, has been very successful um, in uh, protecting the economy of this province by expanding its network and crowding in investments. We are concluding the PPE transaction to make sure that we can expand how train. We will, of course, be making sure that we work with how train to promote its success of having moved people, migrated people from road to rail. That is excellent work done by how train. We are very much proud of that. I want to also say that uh, to the taxi industry, we are very much pleased with the work we have done, the work of the commission the peace that we're experiencing in the province, although taxi violence does often raise ugly head. I want to thank the leadership of the taxi industry for cooperation, for their support, for work well done. The bus subsidy contracts, we will deal with this matter before the end of the financial year. I also want to say that um, we will work with the taxi industry. You'll see us again going to taxi ranks, going to buses, to public transport, to make sure that we protect our people against COVID-19. I want to thank the leadership of the Lena Transport Industry in Gauteng. We have appointed 536 military veterans, paying them about a stipend of 5,000 to help protect our learners in schools, working with the Lena Transport um, uh, uh, Association. And uh, we are hopeful that our military veterans, 513, will be able to help us to protect the learners. Now, let me just uh, thank Honorable Mabunda, as always, as called an intellectual, a very uh, articulate 
very detailed, thorough in his work, as always. Honorable Mabunda, you have actually made my job very easy because you have delivered on the key points and commitments that we have made. Honorable Nair, thank you very much. I think for the first time, I must really thank you. Your speech, although you say you're not supporting the budget, but I think you have been very fair because um, you only worried about the past, but I think in general you support the budget. Honorable Duplessis, I know your health situation, and uh, I'm trying to be sensitive. Uh, you are still new, and uh, my let me once more convey my best regards to you and wishing you good health. But uh, I think what you have already said, don't you know, Honorable Duplessis, that in the committee we have reported about smart mobility weekends? Really, I think this is a, this is a, so sad. As I'm saying, I must be sensitive to our health situation. I've just made an announcement on the DLTCs. Um, the future is technology. Western Cape is going to migrate to online services. Uh, with COVID-19 and where we are going, this is the way forward. We must just solve the problems of the e system, which is a national technology, and um, work with them to improve that. Honorable Ledoava, uh, Honorable Ledoava of the EFF, um, uh, have, a, have a good weekend, uh, Honorable Ledoava. Um, I think that's the best I can say to you because the issues we have raised, you must just read Honorable Mabunda's speech. Because mine, you might not read Mabunda's speech. I think you will be very, very uh, assisted uh, to understand the issues that you are raising. But um, yeah, it is so sad that, um, you know, you have just regurgitated all the things that you have been saying all along. Nothing innovative and creative in what you have said. Uh, honorable members, let me take this opportunity to thank our honorable premier, thank uh, MECs, thank uh, members of the portfolio committee, very good portfolio committee, uh, except uh, that honorable uh, Duplessis and the Toaba seems to be the deviations, the two deviations, Litoaba and uh, and uh, Duplessis. But otherwise, I get it. You are unable to 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 meet and, your commitments. Uh, you keep on lying to us. Let me, uh, let let us to, to do what? Let me also you thank, keep on uh, lying, changing deadlines. You are unable to run the department, uh, and you expect us to do what? To keep quiet. No, I mean, you are failing the department. What do you expect us to say? You are failing the department. Honorable you are No, you are failing the department. What do you expect us to say? To praise you when you are underperforming? To praise you when you compete. Portfolio committee. You have been changing days. You can't even meet our own deadline. You can't even spend money. What do you expect us from us? Honorable MP. Yeah, you know, can you attend meetings of the department? is getting worse now under your leadership. What do you expect from us? Can you ask us to keep quiet? Staff, please assist us. The only person who has been speaking to you. Deputy Speaker, can we be protected from this? The department is going down under your leadership. That is the problem with this virtual meeting. The department is going down under your leadership. We expect us to face this now. One person. Can you give us the opportunity? Can you give us the order, please? Thank you. So the agency finishes and we proceed. Honorable Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Honorable Mr. Honorable Mabala, no, wait, wait. Sis. He has left the stage, allow me to proceed. He has left the stage, I'm on stage now. So there's no need to squabble. Secretary, can you move on to the next order? Next order, please. Next order, it's fine, he has left. You can write a note, you can do anything. Secretary, let's move on to the next order. Thank you. Uh, to Honourable Speaker, Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Development 
Industrial Committee focused intervention study report on the reindustrialization, transformation, and modernization of the Gauteng economy, the Tswani Automotive Special Economic Zone as an instrument for growth and development for vote three. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Vazir. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, for presenting this report on behalf of Chairperson Lasindwa. Um, I'm going to only go through the executive summary. Uh, the committee conducted oversight over the Department of Economic Development, herein referred to as the department and its entities. In conducting that oversight, the committee utilized a myriad of tools to achieve its objectives in ensuring that service delivery is rendered. In this instance, the committee undertook a focused intervention study to assess the performance of the Tswane Automotive Special Economic Zone, albeit the fact that the SEZs are still in its um, developmental state. The TASCZ was officially launched by the President of the Republic in November 2019 with the view that the establishment of the SEZ is critical for the support of reindustrialization and SMME development. In May 2020, the TASCZ company was formally created and is currently operational with board members appointed and supported by board committees. In, 20, in the 2021 State of the Nation Address, President Ramaphosa indicated that the Ford Motor Company had announced a 16 billion rand investment to expand the manufacturing facility in Tswane. The committee noted that the project is a partnership between the Gauteng Provincial Government, the Department of Economic Development, um, also playing a significant role. Other partners on the project include the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and the City of Tswane. To ensure that the project is implemented, Kuha Development Corporation was appointed as an implementing agent to drive the infrastructure development of the TASEZ. This whilst the TASEZ company manages the project and all operations on site. The committee noted that the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition approved the top structure funding to the value of 3.15 billion, whilst the city of Tswane and the Gauteng Department of Economic Development have committed 288 million and 200 million respectively for bulk infrastructure. The partnership with Ford on the development of the SEZ is crucial as it allows two models of, of Ford uh, to be produced in our country and more so in the province of Gauteng. In light of this, the committee further impresses that the department and all stakeholders involved in this development should ensure that all challenges related to the development be resolved adequately. Payment of contractors should be undertaken as the promotion of SNMEs is crucial to creating sustainable employment. The project aims to create a total number of permanent jobs estimated at 2,088 and 8,647 jobs created during construction. The inability by the city of Tswane to fulfill its obligation and commitment related to the funding of the SEZ remains a major concern for the committee. In this regard, intergovernmental relations should be strengthened and should be spearheaded by the Gauteng Provincial Government, including the MEC for Economic Development. And this should allow the city of Tswane to participate fully in the project and ensure that payments are released to the TASEZ management. In addition to this, the city of Tswane needs to work around the Municipal Finance Management Act and create a framework to channel funds to the project in order to avert current, uh, the current administrative red tape. The committee is impressed by, on the progress made by, on the SEZ, noting that actual construction of the SEZ um, only began recently and employs that all stakeholders the time frame set I adhere to for the completion of the project. The aim of the proposed FIS is to examine progress made in the development of the Tswane Automotive Economic Zone, the reindustrialization, transformation and modernization of the economy, and to drive growth and development. This will be attained through the following objectives. Number one, to examine the nature and extent of the support provided by the three stakeholders in the development of the TASEZ, assess the progress made in the development since its launch in November 2019, Assess the progress made in the sorry, assess the challenges rather faced by the project and in turn explore amicable solutions. And lastly, to determine the extent of the socioeconomic benefits derived from the development. In terms of committee concerns, number one, 60 vacancies within the staff complement of the TASEZ, non payment of subcontracted truck owners by Mabitsi Civil, who are one of the main contractors of the SEZ, the lack of punitive measures taken by Kuha Development Corporation on contractors who breach contractual obligations. We are aware of the, uh, the contractor not paying their subcontractor. A lack of commitment from one of the shareholders, namely the city of Tswane, to partake and adhere to the agreement made as part of the partnership formed with the DITC and Gauteng Provincial Government. And this also alludes to the lack of allocating um, of the agreed funding for the SCZ. Number five, 
collaboration uh, between the TASDZ, Ford Motor Company, and the institutions of higher learning in and around Tswane. In terms of committee recommendations, all responses to our recommendations highlighted below should be submitted by the 31st of August 2021, unless stated otherwise. The committee therefore recommends to the department, number one, appraise the committee on the rationale for not filling the 60 vacancies within the TASEZ, as this would optimize the effective running and management of it. In addition, all vacancies within the TASEZ should be filled by the 31st of October, um, sorry, the 31st of August rather, um, and a report on this should be submitted to the committee. Number two, ensure that all contractors and subcontractors are paid in line with government prescripts of paying service providers within 30 days. The department should on a quarterly basis provide the committee with a report on all payments made to both contractors and subcontractors. 2.1, furthermore, the committee should be furnished with a list of the 13 contractor truck owners that full payment has not been made to by the contractor. And this should be accompanied by a detailed report on the amounts owed the expected dates of payments. This is albeit the fact that some of the subcontractors were paid for on the 3rd of June 2020. A report should also be shared with the committee stating the rationale and why subcontracted truck drivers were only paid that 40%, um, also while they completed all the work on the site. Uh, important to note, this is when the contractor had in fact already been paid and lack of claim payment had been made to sub by the third party contractor. Number three, strengthen guidelines in conjunction with all other stakeholders, including the Kuka Development Corporation, to hold contractors accountable and ensure that contractors adhere to their contractual obligations, including that of payment to subcontractors. Number four, should ensure that one of the shareholders, namely the city of Tswane, works or creates a framework around the Municipal Finance Management Act to ensure that payments are made to the TASCZ. The creation of this framework should be concluded also by the 31st of August. In addition to that, the committee expects a report on the engagements that occurred between the Premier of Gauteng, MEC for Economic Development, and the Deputy Minister of DTIC, and the Mayor of Tswane to resolve the impasse that is related to the inability of the shareholder of the city of Tswane to release the funding of 288 million, as well as the non-provision of sufficient supply of electricity to the SEZ. A report on this should be submitted by the 31st of August 2021. And lastly, should ensure that there is a co collaboration between the TASEZ, Ford Motor Company, and academic institutions of higher learning within the SEZ and Tony at large. This is the aim, this is with the aim of imparting skills, knowledge, and possibly securing employment for students with the requisite skills to be employed at this SEZ. A report on the feasibility study related to this collaboration also must be submitted by 31 August 2021. In terms of acknowledgements, um, appreciation is expressed to all members of the committee as well as the MEC um, and of course to the team um, with, that is involved with the committee, particularly with the committee coordinator. Um, in terms of adoption, after due consideration, the Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee unanimously adopted the FIS um, report that was themed reindustrialization, transformation, modernization of the Gauteng economy, specifically the Swane Automotive Special Economic Zone as an instrument for growth and development. In terms of Rule 1172C, read together with Rule 165, the committee presents to this House and recommends the adoption of the committee's oversight FIS report. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Hassan. Is there a seconder? A seconder? I raise to second. I second. Thank you. I now put the question. All those who are in favor say aye. 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 Those who are not in favor say no. The yes have it. Thank you very much. The report is adopted. Secretary, please take us to the next uh, order. Deputy uh, Chair, Madam, Chair, Madam, come Madam Deputy Speaker. Yes. Madam, can I relieve you? You've been, uh, you know, sitting for more than three hours now. I'm sure you are a little bit tired. Yeah, I am. Uh, Deputy Chair will come in, don't worry. After this, after the Secretary reads the order. Thank okay. you for but your in the, in the next sitting, can we agree that you'll allow me to chair? I am gay, so the you win. We'll collapse the house. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Deputy Chair, please step in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Secretary, can you read the next order? 
Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee's Focused Intervention Study Report on Alternate Energy Source for Long-Term Energy, Security and Envisaged Benefits to the Poor Community in Gauteng Province for Vote 11. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Hassan. Take us through. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Chair. I'm going to take certain parts of the report as read and only cover executive summary concerns and recommendations. The committee embarked on a focused intervention study focusing on the alternative energy source for long-term energy security and envisioned benefits to poor communities in the province. The Gauteng government undertook to develop an integrated energy strategy and implementation plan in 2010, which sought to develop alternative energy for informal households in the province in line with the province's plan to transform to a sustainable energy future. The purpose of this project was meant to meet the energy needs of poor households in Gauteng without access to electricity and safe energy sources to impact positively on the health of households and the overall air quality of the province. Considering this, the department commissioned a feasibility study in 2015 to address issues related to safe, reliable and affordable clean energy targeted at households in unelectrified informal settlements um, in Gauteng. Gauteng's informal settlements have been driven by rapid urbanization, employment, as well as resource opportunities, and are characterized by extreme poverty and the lack of access to a range of basic services, including energy. The committee notes with concern that Gauteng has been identified Honorable Hassan, we can hear. Honorable Hassan. Honorable Hassan. Let's proceed, Deputy Chair. Let's proceed. She Deputy seems to be kicked. Her to switch off her camera. It will work. Yes, uh, Hassan, can you switch off the camera and uh, try without the camera? That but she work. likes she, she likes the camera like uh, Lesejo. They like cameras, Libo Ezra. So it's a problem. Let's check from the committee where's the report so that it can just continue and we finalize this report. Or mental, if I go on a Friday, I listening to mental. Motolo Guena is Motoko capital in Lima Mabala. Mental. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to this report. Can uh, the secretary read the next one so that we continue with the, the next motion? Secretary, read the, the next uh, order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Motion in terms of Rule 124, debate on matter of agent public importance on electricity, water, and security. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Honorable Dijakar, as the proponent, take us through the motion. Thank you, Chair. I, Honorable Dijakar, MPL, follow, uh, table the following motion in terms of Rule 124, debate on matter of urgent public importance on water and electricity security. Noting that load shedding has a negative impact on the quality of life of our residents, is destroying the economy and killing off economic growth, is drastically reducing the lifespan of electricity infrastructure that was not designed to be haphazardly switched on and off, 
and there has been a significant increase in these occurrences recently, and therefore warrants the debate in terms of Rule 124.3a. Uh, the distribution and water elation as a result of the interruption of supply of electricity. Municipalities in the province have been battling uh, to maintain acceptable water levels in reservoirs, forcing municipalities to restrict the gravitational flow of water, leaving residents in areas such as Johannesburg, Ekruleni, Twane, Rand West District, and Seripeng without water for extended periods. Both water and electricity are critical resources that are essential for dignified quality of life. Failure to secure the supply of water compromises health care facilities and other crucial institutions that render services to residents. The MEC for Corporate Governance should write to the relevant national department requesting that all substations, electrical, water reservoirs, and water towers in the province are declared as national key points, allowing municipalities to isolate electric, uh, electricity supply to water reservoirs and water towers. Uh, Chair, it's been the last six weeks, rather, were some of the worst ever experienced by Hauteng because of failing water reticulation and electricity distribution. Even before the latest round of load shedding started in the province, municipalities of Ekruleni, Impuledi, Sedipeng, Twane, and Johannesburg felt the impact of no water when pipes to the province ran dry. Several hospitals like Raima Musa, Helen Joseph, and Charlotte Keke had to cancel operations because of no water uh, as a result of poor maintenance and poor project management. In some cases, dry pipes left thousands of people and businesses and hospitals without water and electricity for more than a week. Load shedding that followed and prolonged outages was a result of years of lack of proper infrastructure maintenance, exasperating and already dire situations and frustrations being taken out on councillors when we do know who really are to blame for the lack of maintenance across the province. Water and electricity are economic enablers. As low shedding started and water levels dropped below acceptable levels, I blamed Eskom, their inability to manage the infrastructure project, but I also blame municipalities for years of poor planning, lack of political will, and I dare say, lack of innovation. The South African economy is now water, energy, and capital constrained. There needs to be a clear policy direction that will ensure the economy is not affected by load shedding affected water supply where jobs are lost and residents go home with no money and or to put food on the table. Daily interruptions in water and power supply have hit the housing economy very hard, leaving manufacturers in the province to reconsider its dependency on municipalities that can no longer guarantee delivery of critical services. This could relate, uh, uh, result in the relocation of business to other parts of the country uh, where power supply is more stable, such as DLA, City of Cape Town, or Stellenbosch Municipality. This will lead to the very serious fear that residents have that they might lose their jobs and go hungry. The DA believes that we, be, that we must become active participants in finding solutions for ongoing challenges. For this debate, I want to focus specifically on what we can do from the legislature um, for the province to become more water secure, secure and uh, power independent. As a le legislature, through MEC of Kvokokta, we must work with municipalities and push for national uh, departments to fast track their influence in fixing infrastructure that will allow for independent power producers to become active participants in electricity generation. There is an opportunity for SMEs to enter the energy space and to help create much needed jobs. There is also space where big business and property owners can change from being energy dependent on to becoming energy producers and use municipal infrastructure for uh, transporting or wheeling of energy production. This will not only provide jobs, but also make in a Gauteng energy independent from ESCOM. As an immediate uh, intervention, Gauteng government must call on the national department, uh, national government to have water reservoirs, water towers and su substations across the pro province be declared as national key points. This will ensure that reservoirs and water powers, towers are protected from ESCOM sponsored load shedding by simply reconfiguring the grid. This will result in a more stable water supply where businesses and residents will no longer have to put up 
with uh, uh, Honorable Jajar, your time is uh, it's, it's up. Uh, Honorable Ludova. Thanks, Deputy Chair of Chess. A DA motion presented to the House to debate the impact of failing electricity and water supply on the lives of Houting's residents is ill-conceived, especially considering the fact that the impact they are looking to discuss is evident through the continuous service delivery protests across all regions and municipalities of the province. Whichever way one looks at it, government is selected to predict, plan, research, and deal with crises such as this, of which the Gauteng Provincial Government has dismally failed to date. Understanding that the water and electricity crisis in the province is an issue that needs to be dealt with through the Department of Cocta, we have been awaiting a declaration of a state of national disaster in the province from the Minister of Cocta, who is empowered under Section 3 of the Disaster Management Act of 2002. Why has MEC Maile not done the work of refurbishing existing operational boreholes and digging new ones, optimizing wastewater, bulk infrastructure, and availing funds for the upgrade of water infrastructure? After doing the MEC's work for him, through the evaluation of water usage, statistics, and common sense, we are aware of the fact that the proper statistics on the three main users of waters in the province dictates that farming, industry, and business account for more than 60% of water usage. Household water usage accounts for less than 20%, yet this incompetent government will have us believe households are the only ones that can save the day. The view, the view is so typically ANC, it is nauseous. The DA and the ANC reign supreme in the protection of white capital. It is business as usual for the two main users of water, farming and industry, as seen in their approach to the water crisis in Cape Town. Yet their voting constituency who use less than 20% of the water will be asked to sacrifice so that the, world, the white elite does not suffer financial losses in farming and industry. As we speak, we have received countless complaints from the West Rand in Mughali City, where the municipality uses water tankers to supply water. Residents have been complaining about the fact that in the informal settlement, water comes late or even not at all, even after they call and complain to the municipality. As the EFF, we see water as a resource and a human right, not as a commodity to enrich the white elite. All water resources should be nationalized and corporate control over water should be abolished. The mining of water from the sources that feed our dams for bottling and sales should constitute theft of a national resource. The sale of water by the big five monopolistic retailers during a crisis is despicable. The EFF contends that all sections of the water usage needs communities to be empowered to contribute towards the resolution to the crisis. Our biggest mistake will be in believing that government has the, has the solutions and communities must just follow their lead to resolve the crisis. The AFF believes in grassroots level engagement of all the affected sections of the community and regions in this province. The three main sections, farming, industry, and households across communities must have separate water saving and generation endeavors to inculcate the necessary mindset and mind shift towards becoming empowered and water wise. The necessary expertise lies in us to cope and triumph in this crisis. The current energy crisis that started in 2007, when there were continued rolling blackouts as ESCOM struggled to meet the electricity demand, is nothing new to us and cannot be treated as though it is. Since then, we have all been aware of the fact that electricity demand would exceed supply and recommended that government take necessary steps to ensure that demand did not exceed available supply capacity. However, the ANC-led government failed to heed the call and only started intervening to ensure available supply when it was too late. Over and above the failure to build additional capacity, government also failed to maintain energy infrastructure. ESCOM is far behind on maintenance and that has been the case for many years. Power stations are ailing. ESCOM does not have pre preventative maintenance testing in place to ensure there is a clear schedule to predict when maintenance and repairs will be required. It is regular occurrence for boiler tubes to leak 
and convener best delivering coal to break using generator units to stop functioning. It is a fact that ESCOM has never fully recovered from the crippling crisis that started in 2007. And moreover, evident that there is no clear and believable, uh, believable uh, strategy uh, to... Thank you very much uh, for the time given. Uh, sir, uh, let me get to Honorable Dilange No. Uh, Honorable Tamini, can you come up? Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair of Chairs, and good afternoon, uh, colleagues. And I want to add my voice in um, sending condolences to Member Lasingwa and her family. Um, Chair of Chairs, the National Development Plan, which is the blueprint of government's planning, highlighted long ago that the lack of, of coordinated and integrated planning for the energy sector was to blame for the underinvestment in the energy infrastructure. Despite this knowledge, the government proceeded not to invest in boosting our, our spend on energy capacities. Billions in taxpayers' money have been spent on to bail out ESCOM and conservative increases in electricity prices have yielded no, had yielded no good results. Instead, the national power suppliers are admitted to the public that electricity blackouts will be part of our new normal for the at least the next five years. This is due to a frequent downturn experience at the aging fleet of coal power plants and the inability to add new power stations. Chair of Chairs, there are many woeful accounts of this impact of load shedding in the lives of ordinary citizens. For instance, two weeks ago, the citizen newspaper ran a story of a Soweto mother, Miss Toluane Sipu, whose son's life is at risk because the load shedding stops the functioning of a nebulizer, which her son needs to inhale as his asthmatic medication. Business, business, businesses, especially those small and medium-sized operators, which are still trying to get back on their feet after the slump of COVID-19 shutdowns, are feeling the brunt of the erratic electricity supply uh, interruptions as they threaten their existence. The insecurity of electricity supply brings with it an increased uncertainty of attracting investments and the ability to create jobs in our economy. Load shedding puts us at risk of reversing the momentum of economic growth that we are beginning to see in our country. Electricity and water are the life wood of our economy. Without them, not much can be done. It is with this in mind that the IFP supports the motion and we urge that the MEC and the, and, and the provincial executive considers the proposal to ensure better electricity and water supply in our country. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. you. Uh, 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 Honorable Ms. Manga. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Deputy Chair of Chairs, I was very much tempted to engage on uh, the um, um, UNITAL um, rhetoric by Member uh, Mudise earlier on, but I remembered uh, what Mark Twain had warned us about. I further wanted to engage him, but I also remembered what um, Or Tambo had said in 1977, which is something that I would ask that he goes and reads about uh, hearing and understanding what it means to listen to the opposition and that when the opposition is actually making sense, you need to read that. And I would actually go as far as to um, ask him to move away from a liquor shop and go and listen in a meeting. But I will also engage in, uh, in, in the real yeah, yeah. Core of what we are discussing here today and say that our residents have been dealt a severe injustice um, by the Houghton Provincial Government, who is unable to fulfill a simple service delivery task by providing a reliable steady flow of water. This comes at a time when hygiene is of the utmost importance, with water as a critical source to protect ourselves from COVID-19 by regularly washing our hands. Yet our taps are running dry because this provincial government has failed to put a proper plan in place to ensure that when ESCOM needs to limit the pressure on the national grid, there are contingency plans in place to ensure a stable supply of water. Deputy Chair of Chairs, ESCOM, as we know, is a national entity, and this legislature has no power over it. But what this legislature can certainly do is call on the national government to declare hospitals and reservoirs as national key points so that when low sharing hits, this area is exempt. And when uh, power is restored for residents in the area, they will still have water coming through their taps. Doing this can be life-saving. 
It will also ease the, the burden on aging infrastructure, which cannot handle the consistent interruption caused by ESCOM's rolling blackouts. These substations weren't designed or built to have power turned on and off at a flip of a switch. Deputy Chair of Chairs, we are currently experiencing the third wave of COVID-19 pandemic in the province. Wards caring for COVID-19 patients in hospitals have reached capacity. During the last week, during the last few weeks, we have read in the media and seen on TV how patients were forced to use only half a liter of water um, to drink and wash because of the impact on load sharing and how that has cut the steady supply of water in hospitals. Government was unable to resolve this problem and had to rely on an on NGO gift of the givers to build boreholes in two hospitals, the Rayama Musa and Helen Joseph, so that the patients at the height of the pandemic were able to have clean and steady flow of water. It will be prudent for this House to pass this motion, calling on the national government to declare reservoirs and hospitals as national key point, so that um, we are, they are exempted from disastrous rollout blackouts. Let us use the cooperative government as a tool to prevent further water outages and ensure that what happened in Rahima Musa and Helen Joseph hospitals never happen again. I thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Honorable uh, Adams, I skipped you. Do you want to have a bite? Yes, thank you. Okay. It's important yes, con that I have a bite. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. The impact of the water and electricity crisis on the citizens of Gauteng is severe and, I must say, very sad. When we were in the middle of this crisis, in the eye of the storm of it, I think a week ago and 10 days ago, um, I called the chairperson um, of Human Settlement and Cocta, Honorable D. Ali, early in the morning to say we have a crisis. She knows that we have a crisis. And I said, I wanted to know who is an air jurisdiction over this crisis that we're facing. And the, re the response that I got left me aghast, and I must be honest, left me quite sad and hopeless and shocked to say that a task team has been appointed, but not necessarily saying that there is which umbrella does it fall under, whether it's culture, whether it's national, whatever it is. So that leaves me very worried. I would advocate strongly for a concerted effort to make use of all the expertise that we have in Gauteng that is available to our use to mitigate this crisis. Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, the people of Gauteng is really, really going through very difficult times. And I would say that it is, I have no option as the ACDP to support this motion because this is a human right and our people need water and electricity and to, to, for their lives to be embedded. I thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Thank you very much. Let me now give uh, Honorable MEC Mutara. Thank you very much, um, Chair of Chairs, Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier and members of the Executive Council, Honorable members and leadership in our system of local government, leadership of our traditional houses and members of the media. In starting off this debate, we should acknowledge the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a crippling and devastating effect on municipal governance and the provision of basic services, with almost all municipalities in Gauteng having to deal with the dire consequences of crisis management, how, in, how to ensure basic service delivery with less resources and yet greater expectations. The point we want to emphasize from the onset is the fact that COVID-19 is an urban crisis, as cited by UN Habitat 2020. 95% of total COVID cases are in urban areas. For municipalities in the province, the provision of basic services such as water and sanitation has been a big challenge with informal settlements bearing the biggest brunt. What COVID-19 has revealed more starkly is the importance of water and energy security for the province. The significance of building a resilient and energy and water secure city region that invests in diversified and low carbon energy sources and innovative technologies that delivers reliable and affordable energy services to all citizens for an economically transformed and modernized and reindustrialized Gauteng city region. As energy security, an energy security strategy for the province was adopted by Exco in 2016. And in terms of a water security plan for the province, we have had engagement with various stakeholders, including the Minister of Water and Sanitation and are going to, convene, be, going to be convening a water summit within this current financial year in order to conclude the process of putting a plan together for the province. During the period of the crisis, 
water supply has proven to be a critical issue. This is especially within the informal settlements and the likes of Rainwater and Johannesburg Water have found themselves having to roll out mass water tank programs within our communities. They have also had to mitigate for the negative effect of power supply interruptions on water pumping systems as happened in Johannesburg recently, where they had to install generators for the pump stations in Crosby and Brixton. Power failures impact negatively on the flow rate from water reservoirs and pump stations, which then causes the water reservoirs to run at low capacity and not be able to supply water to communities within various wards around the province. Power failures also impact negatively on rainwater's purification and pumping systems. Beyond just installing generators as a short-term measure, we are going to be working closely with the farming so that we take advantage of the amendment to, to, to schedule two of the Electricity Regulation Acts to ensure consistent electricity supply for the province and resolve some of these problems that impact negatively on water security. In terms of infrastructure, we need a CAPEX program to invest in the entire water bulk supply system and modernize it. Upgrades of water pump stations and municipal water infrastructure that is damaged by the voltage fluctuation caused by the effect of load shedding requires significant CAPEX, significant CAPEX investment, which COCTA must coordinate in the province in order to ensure that we don't compromise on water security as we pursue development and inclusive growth. Investment in new booster pump stations and reservoirs for the province will require a coordinated city-region approach for our municipalities. We also need to invest in changing water consumption behavior within households and communities and invest in water conservation technologies within all our developments in the province as part of building a more water resilient city region. What is for certain though, is that the pursuit of water security will require certain behavioral changes at a household and corporate level even. On energy security, the recent announcement by the president has given municipalities discretion to approve grid connection applications in their networks based on an assessment of the impact on their grid. COCTA will be working very closely with all municipalities for the purposes of enhancing power generation and providing energy security to the province, coordinating an integrated city region approach in our quest for energy security. Five feasibility studies have already been conducted for all five regions on waste to energy. The combined feasibility study of West Rand and City Bank districts was found to be unfeasible. The three metros are at different stages with the city of Joburg feasibility having been approved by council, and the next stage is to initiate the triple P process. The city of Tswani is at council presentation stage. The metros have developed strategies on energy mix programs that include solar voltaic generation, gas generation, waste to energy generation, battery energy storage systems, liquefied petroleum gas, and electrical vehicles. The city of Johannesburg has taken the lead in this regard, having announced plans to pursue at least 3.8 billion rand in investment on solar, gas, and battery power supply to reduce reliance on energy. We are exploring the option of having a Gauteng IPP office that will assist municipalities in order to take advantage of these new opportunities that have arisen because of legislative amendments. As a provincial government, we have plans and programs in place to ensure that Gauteng city region is water and energy secure, even as we pursue an inclusive growth developmental agenda. What is of importance going forward is that we coordinate and facilitate the implementation of these plans within the various spheres of government and get the maximum possible return, not just in energy and water security terms, but also when it comes to local economic development and empower, ob empowerment objectives. I thank you. Uh, thank you, MEC. Now let me call upon the proponent uh, Honorable Dijakar, to close the debate. Honorable Dijakar. My apologies, Chair. I keep on being uh, go on to silent, but uh, silence. Let me just say that what we're trying to achieve here is for to to stop. Uh, transformers from being turned off. Transformers can run idle even during low shedding. Um, instead of being completely switched off, as my leader has already indicated, it immediately shortens the lifespan um, because of the on and off switching of these um, uh, transformers. A declaration of reservoirs and water towers as national key points will help us to take the pressure 
of these transformers and lessen the, the uh, number of unplanned outages. That's an immediate um, solution that we can look at. What the ME is talking about are long-term solutions. Now, as much as long-term solutions are required, what we need is immediate solutions. An immediate solution would be to reconfigure the grid through the a national key point uh, uh, National Key Point Act to keep reservoirs running because generators are still in the process of being bought. Um, uh, and again, the RAND water uh, reservoirs and purification plants are already national key points. So they are not subject to load shedding schedules. They are exempt from that. Um, it is really unfortunate that we cannot understand the importance of doing this immediately. What we can do immediately is call on the uh, national government to have these reservoirs and water towers declared key points, including our um, transformers. Uh, I just want to finish by saying that uh, thank you to the members, um, Member Adams, men, uh, Member Lamini, Member Latwaba, and um, of course my leader, members uh, Isimanga for your input. I realize that I rushed through my presentation, but it is important that we understand the impact of, of switching on and off, the impact of what is happening because of years and years of neglect of infrastructure in all our municipalities. So I really urge that this House motion that we look at national government to, to assist the uh, the municipalities in Gauteng and that we can deal with water outages once and for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the motion was for debate. Now let's go back to order number 14. Secretary, can you read uh, order number 14? Thank you, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Economic Development Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee's Focused Intervention Study Report on Alternate Energy Source for Long-Term Energy Security and Envisaged Benefits to Poor Communities in the Gauteng Province for Vote 11. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Hassan. Take us through. Thank you, Chairperson. Apologies for the interruption with the connection. Um, like I said, I'll take the report as read and only cover the important parts. Um, the committee embarked on a focused intervention study focusing on alternate energy sources for long-term energy security and envisioned benefits to poor communities in the province. The Gauteng government undertook to develop an integrated energy strategy and implementation plan in 2010, which sought to develop alternative energy for informal households in the province, in line with the province's plan to transform it to a sustainable energy future. The purpose of this project was meant to meet the energy needs for poor households in Gauteng without access to electricity and safe energy sources to impact positively on the health of households and the overall air quality of the province. Considering this, the department then commissioned a feasibility study in 2015 to address issues related to safe, reliable and affordable clean energy targeted at households in an unelectrified informal settlements in Gauteng. Gauteng's informal settlements have been driven by rapid urbanization, employment, as well as resource opportunities, but are also characterized by extreme poverty and a lack of access to a range of basic services, including that of energy. The committee notes with concern that Gauteng has been identified as one of the key air pollution hotspots in the country because its air pollution levels exceed national ambient air quality standards, posing a threat to human health and its environment. Domestic fuel burning to meet primary household energy needs in a densely populated low-income community um, has been identified as major sources of air pollution, impacting human health and the well-being in the province. The committee noted that the department conducted a feasibility study between 2015 and 2016 for 470,000 rand. It was reported that the study was conducted as an interim air pollution reduction measures to avail choice of alternative energy to informal settlements while they are awaiting the medium to long term energy to be provided in line with the Department of Energy's provisions. The department further reported that there was no budget allocated for alternative energy. However, the Air Quality Directorate receives an annual budget of 1.5 million rand for goods and services to implement air quality functions, including that of air quality monitoring. 
A total of 260,000 rand from goods and services was used to pilot 250 methanol stoves for a pilot project at Sharpville in the informal settlements in City Bank District in the 2017-2018 financial year. The committee was further informed that the rollout of 1,950 methanol stoves at the West Rand municipality was implemented with a total of 500,000 from the goods and services, this being a once-off as there was no indicated budget for alternative energy. The committee acknowledges that the department has initial initiated rather partnerships with big industries that can afford to fund the project as an air quality offset like Impala Limited and Bliss Spheres. Moreover, it's noted that the Air Quality Directorate has requested an additional 400,000 rand from Treasury to ro run another rollout in, 21, in the 21-22 financial year. It is the view of this committee, therefore, that the air pollution can be reduced by developing mechanisms to ensure that air quality management considerations are effectively integrated into the development of government policies, strategies and programs, as well as all spatial and economic development planning processes and all economic activities. In terms of our observations, I'm actually going to yeah, I'm going to go straight to committee findings and concerns. The committee undertook the oversight engagement, noting reports and all other engagements with the department during the in-year monitoring process. The intention of the committee was to measure the inputs against the outcomes that the department had reported on. The projects initiated by the department were in respect of a sustainable environmental management. In terms of committee concerns, Lack of human and capital resources on monitoring air quality in the province. Number two, lack of criminal enforcement actions on industries that are non-compliant with environmental legislation. Lack of proposing more solutions on alternative energy sources in the province, both informal and formal settlements. And lack of monitoring and maintaining air quality programs and projects in the province. In terms of committee recommendations, these reports should be submitted to the committee by the 30th of September, 2021. The Portfolio Committee therefore recommends, number one, to provide a compre comprehensive plan on how financial and human resources and monitoring air quality in the province will be addressed. Provide plans on how criminal enforcement actions will be improved and what measures will be undertaken on industries that are non-compliant with the environmental legislation. Provide a monitoring mechanism on how alternate energy source projects will be maintained in the province. Provide strategies on how air pollution can be reduced by developing mechanisms to ensure that air quality management considerations are effectively integrated into the development of government programs. In terms of acknowledgements, the Portfolio Committee wishes to thank the MEC, MEC Tau, the head of the department, the chairperson, Lassindua, also wishes to express their gratitude to the honorable members of the Portfolio Committee. I won't mention them. Um, furthermore, the Portfolio Committee also wishes to express their appreciation for the contribution from the following support staff members. I also will take that part of the document is being read, as well as everything else I didn't cover. After due consideration, the Economic Development, Environment, Agriculture and Rural Development Portfolio Committee unanimously adopted the FIS report, themed alternate energy source for long term energy security and envisioned benefits for poor communities in the province. In terms of Rule 1172C, read together with Rule 165, um, the committee presents to this House and recommends the adoption of the committee's oversight FIS report. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Let me get a second uh, to this report. Member Adams, Deputy Chair of Chairs, I rise to second. Thank you very much. Uh, let me pose a question. All those who are in favor say yes. 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 And uh, all those yes, who are yes. in favor say no. The yes have it. Uh, Secretary, read uh, our last order. Thank you, Deputy Chair of Chairs. A uh, motion in terms of Rule 124, debate on matter of agent public importance on reopening of Charlotte Matreke, Johannesburg Hospital. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Let me call the proponent, uh, Honorable uh, Bloom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I'm, I hereby move in terms of Rule 124, uh, the debate that this House debate the urgent necessity of reopening the Schadenkrieke Johannesburg Academic Hospital, which has been closed since the fire on 16 April this year. Now, Mr. Acting Speaker, I've called for this urgent debate because people who need public health services are suffering with the closure of a major specialist hospital in the middle of a raging epidemic. The fire that caused this closure happened two months ago. 
We've had various promises at various times that sections of the hospital that were undamaged would be reopened, but this has not happened. We all understand the need to comply with safety standards, but it is simply a matter of priorities. The technical issue should either be resolved speedily or exemption obtained using emergency powers or state of disaster legislation. I do have to agree with the chairperson of the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Health, Dr. Sibo Giseni de Glomo, who said in a statement as follows, Dr. Glomo said, it will be practically impossible for the province to manage the third wave without the more than 1,000 beds, which is inclusive of 124 intensive care unit beds at Charlotte Mkeke Hospital. Now, patients from Charlotte Mkeke are currently in hospitals around the province, crowding them even more as COVID-19 cases flood in. It's really getting to be, uh, I get reports all the time, and I'm sure the Honourable MEC is, it's getting to be very, very tight at, at our hospitals. Now, specifically, cancer patients have had their treatment disrupted, and dialysis patients have to travel to Helen Joseph Hospital. Linda Griff of the Cancer Alliance, which is a lobby group, says that, quote, the cancer crisis can be equated to life for sedimeni. This is indeed a violation of basic human rights. And she's referring to the fact that any delay in cancer treatment uh, is uh, uh, life imperiling. And, and there really has been disruption of cancer treatment. I know they've done their best to have chemotherapy at Chris Harney Baragwanath and uh, radiation therapy at Steve Biko, but uh, it's really not enough for these patients. Now, just an example, this morning I got a call from a kidney dialysis patient. She told me she spends the whole day at Helen Joseph Hospital and she only gets back home at one in the morning because they use the dialysis machines at night. And there's transport difficulties as well getting to Helen Joseph Hospital. And, and I get constant calls from patients who can't easily get their medicine from another health facility. It's just not always that easy. Now we are told that the delay is because the Johannesburg Metro Council wants the original building plans, which I don't think they ever had. They want fire evacuation routes and they want compliant fire doors. Now, a doctor, you told me that they're even quibbling about uh, the correct exit signs. You know, I I'm really puzzled as to why the Johannesburg Metro Council is now insisting on measures that it did not insist on before when they supposedly did fire safety checks. They're supposed to have done this every year. If they'd done them properly, uh, we probably would not have had the fire at this hospital. And the question is, why were the fire doors not upgraded long ago if they were so unsuitable? And, and I'm sorry to say, this is what happens with years of poor maintenance and non-compliance with basic safety standards. And unfortunately, I have to observe that the same incompetence is delaying the reopening of this hospital. And, and seriously, why can't a firm date be given even now? I'm asking the Honourable MEC, can she tell us uh, is it Tuesday next week, as she sort of said yesterday, hopefully, uh, which sections are going to be reopened? I think we need a timeline, but uh, I, I don't think we need a timeline. Actually, I think it just should be open next week. Uh, uh, whatever needs to be done needs to be done. The, the urgent need is now, uh, because unfortunately, this is definitely costing lives. Now, now finally, we've all heard in debates that this year has been proclaimed as a year of Charlotte and Kneke, and she's a truly worthy woman, Charlotte Nkneke, I truly believe so. But don't, don't you all think that it's a disgrace the hospital that bears her name is abandoned as we speak? The wards are empty, equipment is lying idle, and the staff are dispersed all over the province. Doctors are pleading for the hospital to reopen as they worry about the lives of their suffering patients. Does anybody in this legislature believe that this hospital still honours the name of Charles McCreke? It's, it's really a, a very sad question to ask. Uh, I really just plead today, surely, surely this provincial government can do better than this and please try and reopen this hospital safely as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Bloom. Uh, Honourable Mavala, you're next. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair of Chair. Uh, yesterday, we raised our concern regarding the continued closure of Charlotte Butler Academic Hospital given the surge of COVID-19 pandemic. And also, 
uh, on Tuesday, uh, I remember I asked the MEC for health regarding the, the opening of Ashanti Gold in the West Rand. Uh, Deputy Chair of Chair, it is clear that a continued closure of Charlotte McClake Academic Hospital has put a strain on the healthcare system under severe strain. The healthcare system in this province is collapsing and with an increase in COVID-19 admissions at both the public and private healthcare institution during the third wave, we cannot afford to have this hospital not operational. There are reports that some hospitals such as Helen Joseph, Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital, as well as Chris Hani Baraganath, are functioning at a capacity. These hospitals are currently not able to deliver adequate health services because they've been experiencing crippling water shortages. With Charlotte McLeaker diverting patients to these institutions, patients will not be able to get the quality of health care service expected. It must be noted that Charlotte McClurg Academic Hospital does not only provide health care services to patients. This is also an academic hospital. This means clinical training programs are also affected. Though medical students might have been allocated to other training institutions in the province, this has created unnecessary burden on clinicians. It goes without saying that medical students will not get proper clinical exposure. It has been reported that oncology patients are the most affected. This, there are reports that hospitals are struggling to get medical reports from Charlotte McClake Academic Hospital, and this result in patients having to start diagnosis from scratch. This process delays patient progress and access to healthcare. We should not be debating this issue in the first place, but, but the health and provincial government does not show any agency to reopen this healthcare facility. It is concerning that some medical procedures such as surgery are adversely ad affected. It is well known that waiting lists for these procedures are normally long. And with this hospital closed, the situation has become worse. It is reported that the parking area was the most affected by the fire. Other sections of the hospital are reported to be structurally safe. So why should the government continue to close this hospital? We are officially in the third wave at the PDG of Chess. IC units and hospital beds are needed today to avoid putting... <laughs> development and property management is very useless. They are failing to ensure that government properties are kept safe. What kind of hypocrisy In 2019, it was in Hospital in Soweto. The Bank of Israel caught fire in 2018. And in 2015, it was Tambo Memorial Hospital in Boxberg. The department is failing to make regular inspections at government properties. The provincial government must know that patients are suffering because some are required to travel long distances to get to other medical facilities to get treatment as well as their medicines. Some patients might be forced to default on their appointments for medicines because some facilities are far away. The longer Charlotte McClake Academic Hospital remains closed, people's lives are at risk and this government will have to take full responsibility. As the EFF you call on the external vessel of my client damage. It's not expensive. How do you know? How have you assessed? those sections that are still structurally safe. The delay in the issue of safety certificate from the city of Johannesburg should not be used as an excuse. We are sure some of you are seeing this as an opportunity to loot through the issue of tenders. Hence, this delay... Oh, but how does you know the extent of the damage? Is he an engineer? Are you an engineer? Well, How do you know? Yeah, you are saying it's structurally yeah. safe. What do you know about structurally yeah, let, let, let safe? Are you an engineer? What do you know about structurally safe? We will not be so this problem. I'm sure Umar and Charlotte McPherge is not resting peacefully in her grave because of this corrupt ANC government. I thank you, Deputy Chair of Chess. Uh, let's get uh, honorable Albert. Uh, yes, we have deferred. Uh, hey, Tara is speaking about structural safety. 
Let's give a, a hearing to Honorable Jamin. Thank you, Deputy Chair of Chairs and Honorable Members. The third wave of COVID-19 is here and could potentially be more deadly than the second one, the second wave. These were the words of President Ramaphosa in the past Tuesday as he announced the move to place the country into an alert level three of lockdown. Uh, it is unfortunate that Gauteng is at the epicenter in the, of the rise of these infections. The third wave could ha not have happened at a worse time when we are short of the 1,000 bed Charlotte Matlake Academic Hospital. This hospital could assist in the burden of new COVID-19 patients and other terminally ill patients. Although the vaccine rollout is underway for, for those over 60, we are, without the arsenal of all our hospital resources, the preparedness of our provincial health care against this new round of infection is at best compromised and fragile, especially since we are also know that private hospitals are also reaching their peak in, in their peak. Today marks exactly 63 days since Charlotte McClaggan Hospital was closed. We have long passed the, 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 the 3rd of May deadline, which the Department of Health initially promised that the hospital will resume its functions. The Premier and the MEC has made promises to expeditiously bring this facility back into action. This has not ha been done. Until recently, we have been given different explanations for these delays. All the explanations have failed to provide a conclusive date of when the hospital might be reopened. In the meantime, terminally ill patients are missing their life-saving treatments at home and others are cramped in other hospitals without the appropriate care they need. The Ingata Freedom Party pleads for agents in the process of reopening Child McLeod Hospital. This virus affords no time for complacency. Many excuses for in, uh, uh, making excuses for inefficiency and bureaucratic system should not stand in the line of saving lives. We challenge the government to be clear about when the Charles McLeod Academy will be, will be reopened. In, the, in this regard, the IP calls on the Premier, Honorable Makura, and the MEC for Health, Dr. Mokheti, to play their roles and ensure that efforts is made to bring this hospital back on track on the fight to save the lives of our Gauteng citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you, Honorable De Deputy Chair of Chairs. Nobody can say Charlotte Matlake like Honorable Bloom does. It's classic when he says it, and I want to congratulate him for that. To debate this motion today, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, is necessary yet unnecessary, meaning that we, we find ourselves in the third wave and the numbers are um, increasing by the day and this is a very worrying situation, um, especially here in Gauteng. This hospital must reopen ASAP. There is no debate, can't be a debate. It must be an urgent matter, top priority that uh, um, uh, the MEC and the, and, and the Premier and the government of Gauteng must make sure so that the people of Gauteng can get the health care that they deserve in this crisis at the moment. It's critical that it does. The Gauteng spokesperson uh, on television, on the television interview yesterday, said that, that they are about 4,000 beds ready and they are being made ready and already ready for the people of Gauteng. However, I want to urge, and as, as the ACDP, we want to urge that everything possible must be done uh, for this uh, hospital to be open. So the ACDP will support this motion. Thank you so much, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Uh, thank you, Honorable Adams. Uh, Honorable Fuchs. Chair, thank you very much. Um, when I heard about the fire at Charlotte Matreke, I experienced a sense of deja vu, as well as a feeling of dread, because it took me back to the fire that occurred at the Bank of Lisbon building. In that case, we saw a situation that arose from the abdication of responsibility by DID and the subsequent tap dancing in order to avoid culpability. By the way, almost three years later, we are still waiting for the investigation report into that fire. My question is, questions as to what happened at Charlotte Matreke revealed some disturbing information. I was told that response to the fire was delayed 
due to the fact that there was nobody on site to point the firefighters uh, to the fire hydrants. Secondly, there seemed to be a problem with the couplings to the hydrants, which delayed the attachment of hoses. And the 40 million rands of PPE that was destroyed was apparently stored incorrectly and served to fan the flames. Lives are negatively impacted and trust is lost because of a lack of expertise and professionalism. My colleague member Bloom has highlighted the impact of the extended closure on the prognosis of cancer and kidney patients. The Premier has spoken about the potential impact of the closure uh, on COVID. This is despite spending more than 2 billion rand on COVID infrastructure by this government, which because of poor planning and implementation is not able to specifically reduce the COVID risk that the closure of Charlotte Matreke has brought about. The Premier is quoted as being concerned by the fact that there will be a delay to the opening of the hospital as it impacts on life and death. He also indicates that this matter is giving him sleepless nights. Mr. Premier, this is the price you pay when you preside over dysfunctional departments such as health and infrastructure and you take no steps to provide oversight. How many more lives must be disrupted or lost because your administration is not up to the task? You, Mr. Premier, called for a local state of disaster in order to open the hospital in a piecemeal manner and not wait. I put it to you, sir, that the only disaster I see is your administration. It is not surprising that the people of Gauteng have difficulty in trusting your administration to engender, engender the hope that they deserve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable MEC Mukherjee. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs, Madam Speaker and Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier, members of the Executive Council, Honorable Chief Whip of the Majority Party, members of the Provincial Legislature, the people of Gauteng, Dumela. Deputy uh, Chair of Chairs, it is unfortunate um, circumstances that we are here today to debate the motion submitted by Democratic Alliance on the reopening of Charlotte Matleke Academic Hospital. As a department, we have reiterated on numerous occasions how regrettable it is that Charlotte Matleke Hospital had to close, particularly during these trying times of the third wave of COVID-19. We have made several statements to explain where we are with the process. However, it seems like some members in the House are refusing to understand the explanation we have provided on the state of the, the hospital facility. Honorable Chair of Chairs and Honorable Members, the cause of the outbreak of fire at Charlotte Matleke Academic Hospital is still under investigation. As soon as the report is concluded, we will make it available such that the matter can be closed and we proceed to focus on providing healthcare services to the people of Gauteng. Let me then provide a comprehensive background on Charlotte, on Charlotte Matleke and the events that followed after as a result of this disastrous fire incident. The hospital caught fire on the 16th of April 2021 in the special dispensary on level 2. When the fire swelled in that evening, an immediate decision was made to evacuate all patients and staff for safety purposes. A total of 821 patients were evacuated to 16 different healthcare facilities across the province while conducting the evacuation. No fatalities or injuries were noted in the process. Only a few cases of smoke inhalation were treated accordingly. As the fire swam part of the hospital, it resulted in the partial collapse of the concrete ceiling of the parking space, affecting the areas in Block 3 and Block 4 on the north side of the hospital facility. The fire destroyed elevators, hospital offices, wards, OPDs, and in the process, we lost 16 inpatient wards, 120 inpatient beds, 40% of ICU beds, and 50% of OPD services. Thereafter, the patients from Charlotte Matlake were transferred to various hospitals. At the same time, 
the staff was immediately deployed to all facilities that patients were transferred to. This was done in order to capacitate those facilities in anticipation of the increased workload and the amount of pressure those hospitals those hospitals might, might, may undergo. As members of this house and the society in general, we need to acknowledge and commend the swift ev evacuation process that it went well without any incident of loss of life and all patients were accounted for. This is the point deliberately ignored by those who have developed interest on this matter. This then puts question on their overall ulterior motives of raising this issue. Furthermore, the previous hotline was immediately activated to assist with patient inquiries, accompanied by Charlotte Matleke switchboard and quality staff to improve responses to requests. To date, more than 4,000 uh, inquiries were registered. Mostly were inquiries related to appointments of, of radiation oncology and chemotherapy. Communication right up assisted with directing patients to relevant uh, areas. Honorable members, since the closure of the hospital, there has been a number of significant healthcare operations that Charlotte Matleke and its staff has undertaken in various facilities where we have referred our patients to. At Steve Biko Hospital, we have assisted with accommodating radiation oncology and cardioforatic operation. They have also provided the ICU for patients from Charlotte Matlick. At Bethel Clover Hospital, we have been assisted to open the 120 COVID beds and operating uh, of a uh, mild trauma, your knee replacement and, and small smaller uh, operations. We are assisting with providing PPEs and other needed essential at Beta Clover. The bulk of the staff working in various wards at Beta Clover are from Charlotte Matlake. At Helen Joseph, we have opened ICU for COVID-19 patients and running the renal dialysis, and we have also transferred medical equipment. Over and above this, uh, we must also ensure um, we must also ensure uh, that we must also ensure that all facilities within this jurisdiction of the department meets the occupational health and safety standards. Plans are underway to implement three standards to ensure proper management system for occupational health and safety in our four central hospitals towards ensuring their certification by 2023. Honorable Chair of Chairs. We expect all of this work to be concluded in due course, and the department will communicate if there are any unexpected circumstances that may lead to delays. Honorable members, Charlotte Matlake Academic Hospital is an important facility for our healthcare. It provides special services, as most of the members have said, to the people of Gauteng and other provinces. It's, it's non-operational, has affected healthcare services in our province and many areas within the vicinity. In conclusion, Honorable Chair of Chess, we are confronted with the most difficult time in our modern medical history. The third wave of COVID-19 has been significant, number of infections rising daily and the mortality rate also increasing. Gauteng is leading in those statistics and we need to do everything in our power to try and cap the rapid number of infections and fatalities. We must go back to basics of practicing non-pharmaceutical interventions. We must continue to sanitize and wash our hands regularly, practice social distancing and wearing our mask in public spaces at all times. Let's avoid super spreader events and adhere to lockdown level three regulations. Honorable, honorable members, this is a behavioral uh, condition or disease. All of us need to play a role in making sure that our communities change their behavior. Lastly, let's encourage our elderly to continue to register and visit our vaccination site to get their vaccines. As Gauteng, we have also taken a conscious decision under the leadership of, uh, of Premier Makura to allow walk-ins 
Hashtag play your part, stop the spread of coronavirus, save the people of Gauteng. I, I thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chess. And please open. Oh, well, no, well, thank you very yeah. much. Open Emlo Ashanti. Uh, open okay. okay, let me give uh, Honorable Bloom to close the debate. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honourable Acting Speaker. Since this is the year of Shah and Teke, I'd like to quote uh, from her. It's the quote that's by her portrait at the hospital itself, the closed hospital. She says, this work is not for yourselves. Kill that spirit of self and do not live above your people, but live with them. And if you can rise, bring someone with you. Very beautiful words. I have to say that I brought this motion out of a deep sense of frustration because we've been told time and time again that this hospital is scheduled to be reopened. First, it will be the cancer unit, then the other units, and we don't get any timeline. Yesterday, the Honourable MEC suggested or hinted that possibly Tuesday next week. Now, the only uh, sort of time period we've given was in due course. I think that I have to say I'm disappointed. Uh, I, I do wish to to uh, to acknowledge the the support of other speakers in this debate, but I am disappointed that all the honourable Emmy can see can say is it in due course. Uh, I think we do have to commend all the the workers that did the amazing uh, feat of 800 patients transferring them on the night of the fire. I remember speaking to some doctors uh, shortly thereafter, and they told me the smoke in the corridors. There was wonderful private-public uh, cooperation with private ambulances, public ambulances. Everybody cooperated, and you're quite correct. Nobody died. But Honourable MEC, people are dying now. I'm sorry to say that. People are dying now because they're not getting uh, their cancer treatment uh, in time. There are disruptions. I know that there's uh, heroic work being done at Steve Biko and Chris Harney Baraguant Hospital and Helen Joseph Hospital fill, to fill the gap. But frankly, this hospital is irreplaceable. And I, I really think that uh, um, we must just uh, do everything we can to reopen this hospital as soon as possible. Uh, this is why I have raised the issue, and uh, God help us all, quite frankly, if this hospital isn't opened as soon as possible. I thank everybody for their contributions in this debate. Thank you. Yo, uh, Deputy uh, Chair, Democratic uh, Alliance is quoting revolutionaries today. I am definitely sure he Fervut is spinning in his grave. We are now, yeah, uh, I was cut off. No, yeah, the house, the house is adjourned. Uh, the next meeting is the 24th next week on Tuesday. Thank you very much. I mean, on Thursday. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Charlotte Matreke. Hey, yeah, no. Kota Charlotte Matreke. Oliver Yo, yo, yo. Oh, sorry. Ah, Oprawaka from today. You are my man. You are my man. Oh, sorry. Ah, you are an honorable member, Chief. Comrades, go home, please. Mm -hmm.